In war, there's only one rule, win. Well, actually, that's not true, or at least not true anymore. In the aftermath of World War II, 196 nations ratified in whole, or with some reservations, two additional treaties to the Geneva Conventions, detailing the basic rights of wartime prisoners, establishing protections for the wounded and sick, and protecting civilians caught on a war zone. The conventions also laid down the framework for the international banning of certain weapons of war, which we'll look at today in this episode of the Infographic Show, Top 10 Banned Weapons of War. War is dirty business, and in the aftermath of the First World War, the nations of the world moved to limit the scope of its destructive impact. Horrified by the mass casualties inflicted by chemical gas attacks, in 1925, at the initiative of the United States, France, and Poland, the League of Nations drafted the Protocol for the Prohibition of the Use in War of Asphyxiating, Poisonous, or Other Gases, and of Bacteriological Methods of Warfare. In essence, international law forbade the use of chemical or biological weapons in war. Since then, other weapons have been added to that list, all with the intent purpose of limiting human suffering or damage to the Earth itself. Without further ado, here are the top 10 banned weapons of war. Number 10, Mustard Gas. First synthesized in 1822, it wasn't until 1860 that the dangerous properties of mustard gas were documented. As a chemical weapon, and dubbed the king of the battle gases, mustard gas is surprisingly the least lethal of all the various chemicals that were used in World War I, and it's estimated that only about 1-5% to of the people exposed to it were killed. Mustard gas's real power lay in the terror it could sow among enemy troops, as well as the incapacitating effect exposure had on unprotected soldiers. Inhaled into the lungs, it could be fatal, but while a gas mask would protect from inhalation, there was nothing soldiers could do to protect their exposed skin. The effects of exposure were not immediate, but within hours, the skin would begin to blister, specifically in moist areas such as the armpits and genitals. As the blisters popped, they would often become infected, which is where mustard gas became one of the most lethal gas weapons ever used. Infection typically kills more soldiers in war than actual combat does. Worst of all, exposure created sensitivity, and further exposure at even lower doses would cause a reaction. Number 9. Chlorine Gas Another of the gases used extensively in World War I, it was first deployed by the Germans at Ypres on the 22nd of April 1915. Though an 1899 treaty had forbidden the use of gas in war, the Germans sidestepped the wording in the treaty by releasing the gas from canisters, not projectiles as outlined in the treaty. Planning to release the gas from their own lines, the Germans waited until the wind turned towards the French forces and then let the heavier-than-air gas drift across no man's land and sink into the French trenches. The attack was successful, and 100 French troops were killed. Chlorine gas irritates the eyes, nose, lungs, and throat, and in high enough concentrations can fill the lungs and kill by asphyxiation. Though seen as a horrific weapon of war, the Germans argued that the intent was to actually shorten the length of the war and thus limit overall suffering. Number 8. Phosgene Gas Mustard gas may have been dubbed the king of the battle gases, but when it comes to sheer lethality, no other gas used in World War I could top phosgene. Colorless and smelling like moldy hay, not an uncommon smell in the trenches of Europe, most troops did not realize they had even been exposed to phosgene until it was too late. A slow-acting gas, victims' lungs would fill with fluid and after a day or two would suffocate to death. No treatment existed at the time, and the best a medic could do is make victims comfortable. Although the Germans were the first to use phosgene, it became the weapon of choice for the Allies and would ultimately be responsible for 85% of the 1.2 million casualties of chemical warfare during World War I. Number 7. Nerve Gas In 2017, 100 people, including children, were killed in a nerve gas attack in Syria by pro-government forces, with hundreds left injured. An independent investigation later identified the culprit as Sarah gas, a highly lethal nerve agent. Banned by international treaty, nerve agents are some of the most lethal forms of chemical warfare weapons and work by disrupting the ability for nerves in the body to transmit chemical messages between each other. Colorless, tasteless, and odorless, the first sign of exposure is uncontrolled drooling from the mouth, followed by foaming. Nausea and stomach cramps follow, along with uncontrollable urination and diarrhea. Eventually, the victim's lungs become paralyzed, leaving them unable to breathe. 
Number 6. Plastic Landmines Landmines have been around for centuries, albeit in very crude fashion. Some of the first ever used were by the Chinese during the Song Dynasty against an assault by the Mongols. Filling cast iron cannonball shells with gunpowder, they had an extremely long fuse which had to be lit by hand by brave ambushers just hundreds of feet away from the enemy. Modern landmines are completely autonomous and can vary in tripping mechanisms from pressure sensitive triggers to trip wires. With the advent of the metal detector, landmines were designed using plastic in order to avoid detection. However, they were quickly banned internationally due to the difficulty in locating fragments via x-ray by treating physicians. This would cause prolonged suffering and was ultimately ultimately seen as inhumane. Number 5. Biological Weapons Though around for nearly the entire time that man has waged war against itself, biological weapons were only recently banned under international law. Most biological weapons take the form of weaponized disease agents such as bacteria and viruses, but they can also include fungi, toxins, and rickettsae, parasites that normally affect arthropods but can be deadly in humans. Modern conventions don't just protect people from biological weapons, but actually prohibit their use against plants and animals as well, preventing nations from engineering plagues that can wipe out a nation's livestock or crops and thus creating famine, which is seen as unnecessary human suffering. Number 4. Flamethrowers Made famous for their use in World War II in Vietnam, flamethrowers were the answer to combating enemies entrenched inside fortified bunkers or underground tunnels. In these confined spaces, flamethrowers can actually be more lethal by sucking the oxygen out of the atmosphere than from their actual flames. While technically not illegal, their use around civilian areas has been banned due to the incredible damage they can inflict on infrastructure and their inability to be properly aimed. Number 3. Napalm Another weapon made famous by the Vietnam War, napalm was actually developed in 1942 at Harvard University. As a mixture of a gelling agent and some kind of fuel such as gasoline, napalm was originally designed to be used as an incendiary device against buildings, but was later primarily used as an anti-personnel weapon. As the sticky substance sticks to the skin, it produces severe burns, and sharing in many of the same characteristics as a flamethrower, it can also make it impossible for individuals to breathe. Though not outlawed for military use, its use in civilian population centers is illegal, once again due to their propensity for incredible property damage and inability to fully control its effects. Number 2. Poison Bullets Early bullets weren't very accurate or powerful, so militaries around the world would spike them with small amounts of poison or fecal matter. While not adding any immediate lethality, a poisoned bullet could deliver toxic compounds deep into the body and result in serious infection that would set in long after a battle took place. In modern projectiles, the addition of poison would be largely pointless as well, as modern bullets are already devastatingly powerful. Because of the lack of immediate lethality and suffering caused long after a conflict is over, poison bullets have long been banned by international law. And finally, number one, dirty bombs. Nuclear weapons are bad enough, and the international community has been unsuccessfully trying to ban them since their inception. Nuclear weapons are primarily designed to destroy military or civilian targets, yet to achieve maximum explosive of impact, they are detonated high above their target where the pressure wave can spread. This has the side effect of causing most of the radiation released to be harmlessly blasted up into space or dispersed over a very wide area, limiting its effect. A dirty bomb, however, is a device that is designed primarily to create radiological fallout rather than kill outright, with the goal of poisoning land, sea, and air for a very long time. A regular nuclear weapon can be converted into a dirty bomb by simply programming it to detonate at ground level, thus creating massive plumes of radioactive debris and irradiating dozens of square miles. However, other devices, such as a cobalt bomb, can be detonated high up in the air and produce tremendous amounts of radioactive fallout. These dirty, or salted bombs, have long been banned due to the long-lasting and catastrophic damage they do to large swaths of the environment. Man has waged war since his inception, but it's only in the last few centuries that we've begun to try and limit the scope of the destruction that we inflict on each other. As technology progresses and makes more apocalyptic and destructive weapons available, perhaps it's a sign of hope that even the most embittered enemies, such as the Soviet Union and the USA, have abided by these international laws. Maybe one day, we can even move to outlaw war altogether. Ancient warfare, generally an old school affair where armies face off on the battlefield with weapons and armor, and occasionally something much larger, sometimes seaborne, and sometimes alive? Here are 10 of the most insane ancient super weapons you might never have heard of. Number 10. The Juga Crossbow 
In ancient times, projectiles were still an important part of warfare, but those using them were usually limited to simple weapons like slings and crossbows. While they could deliver a fatal blow, they weren't exactly efficient. The user had to wind up the weapon or align the crossbow, aim carefully, let loose, and then reload. If they were up against a single enemy or a key target, it could be effective. If they were up against an army, the weapon holder would likely be overrun sooner than later. And that was high on the minds of military strategists during the Warring States era of Chinese history more than 2,000 years ago, so they created what might be the first semi-automatic weapon in history, the repeating crossbow, which could fire several shots in quick succession. Did it pack the power of its traditional counterparts? Not quite. While traditional crossbows rely heavily on tension to draw the arrow back and propel it forward, these weapons pack much less force. Their strength is that the action of spanning the bow, placing the bolt, and shooting is combined into one movement, making it easier to fire in quick succession. All that's needed is to move the sliding lever back and forth while holding the pistol grip. It fires from the hip as the lever is pumped forward and back. Its main strength was speed, but the early examples found in Chinese archaeological digs were lacking in precision or strength. They were likely only able to deliver puncture wounds rather than fatal arrow blows. This led many to believe it was more of a minor defense weapon than a true tool of war. But these weapons might have had a sinister secret. The key to this weapon was found in the Kuchin Tushu Ji Cheng, an encyclopedia of Chinese history written during the 1700s. It was described as a handy little weapon often used by elderly scholars or women who worked in the palace as a defensive weapon. But they weren't just shooting tacks. The arrows they shot were tipped with poison, called tiger-killing poison, which was said to kill a person or even a horse if it successfully drew blood. While the weapon evolved since and was revised several times through Chinese history, the core model remained largely the same, meaning this fast-firing weapon has lasted several thousand years, mostly unchanged. It was such an effective tool it was last used in warfare around the 19th century. This next weapon also made its debut in China, but it packs a bigger punch. Number 9. The Trebuchet the catapult is the ultimate weapon for delivering a large projectile, right? You load it up, you cut the rope, and it's flung hard enough to break down a rock wall. But that's nothing compared to the trebuchet, which was the most powerful projectile weapon before the invention of gunpowder. Designed to use a counterweight and a long arm, it can fire heavier projectiles much further than a traditional catapult. It all started with the traction trebuchet in ancient China around 2,500 years ago. 17 feet high with a throwing arm of at least 30 feet, it relied on manpower, lots of manpower. A large group of men would pull ropes attached to the end of the trebuchet beam, and when released this created a massive rotational force that would propel the projectile further than would be possible with any other machine. But soon a much better model would emerge. The biggest negative of the original traction trebuchet was how much manpower it took to fire each shot and how long it took to set it up. The model was used for over a thousand years, with the counterweight trebuchet only being created around the 12th century in the Mediterranean and later being adopted by China after they encountered it in battle with the Mongols. The counterweight trebuchet uses a powerful weight, a heavy box usually filled with rocks or sand. When attached to the shorter end of the beam and released on command, it does the work of several men and pulls the beam that creates the force needed to propel the projectile. This trebuchet is usually larger, stronger, and requires a lot more manpower to build and set up, but once it's ready, there were few weapons in ancient warfare who could match its power. And there's a reason it stood the test of time. The trebuchet is useful because its basket can carry just about anything. Sure, the most popular ammo was rocks or other hard objects that could be used to knock down enemy defenses, but as weapons evolved, incendiary weapons that could set a city afire could also be loaded into the basket and fired. For those willing to fight dirty, they could even load up human waste or corpses of soldiers felled in battle and seek to contaminate the enemy city with a deadly disease. While the weapon declined in use once gunpowder was invented, who needs a giant machine to fling things when you can just light a fuse, right? It's one of the only weapons on this list that's still recreated frequently today. Recreations have been built around the world, and even in today's world of modern weapons, it packs a punch. But sometimes you need to have something a little more lively. Number 8. War Elephants for steeds in combat, you can't do much better than the horse. They can carry a lot, they can move fast, and they're easy to train. But they're not going to be knocking down any walls, and sometimes you need a bit more muscle. Enter the largest land mammal alive, the elephant. Massive, incredibly strong, and with a bonus limb and tough tusks, it's not hard to see how they'd make an amazing weapon. There's just one problem. They're strong enough to kill a human in seconds if they get mad, and before you can ride them into battle, you have to train them. That's why it took a special talent to train them. The elephant trainer, or the mahout, would slowly get the elephant used to being led by using chains and hooks, then guide them in how to avoid obstacles and follow formation patterns. And once they were trained, they were nearly unstoppable. 
Although the first elephants were trained for agricultural work in Asia, it's believed that elephant warfare started in ancient India. They show up repeatedly in ancient Indian epics like Ramayana, where kings are frequently depicted riding them into battle. After all, what more impressive way to indicate who's in charge than having them atop the king of beasts? But soon they were used in much larger numbers, being used to provide high ground for archers or to carry heavy equipment. Elephants are so strong it was common for small towers to be built on their backs for multiple soldiers to shoot from. And for those well-trained elephants who could be led into combat, some armies even attached specialized blades to the tusks to give them an even nastier edge in combat. But working with the giant beasts had its downside. Elephants were the first tanks, but most tanks don't get spooked easily. One elephant getting startled could easily cause a stampede, leading to a derailed charge or a trampled army. But they were effective for long-distance military marches, most famously Hannibal's crossing of the Alps in his war against the Roman Empire. Between the difficulty of training elephants and the increased rarity of the animals, many of whom are now hunted for their tusks and highly endangered, military elephants became increasingly rare as modern technology advanced. By the 20th century, they were a rarity, but they hadn't been retired completely. In the Second World War, elephants were used to tow airplanes and do other heavy-duty tasks in Asia, and they saw limited use as late as the Vietnam War. This next fiery weapon was way ahead of its time. Number 7. Greek Fire You're aboard a ship carrying soldiers and you're about to run into your dreaded enemy, the ships of the Eastern Roman Empire. They've got superior forces, but your men are well trained and you're ready to take on their conventional weapons. But this time they're not packing conventional weapons, they're packing Greek fire. And suddenly they pull out a cannon that fires what looks like a massive plume of flame at you, igniting the ship and sending you and your men leaping off the boat before it sinks to the bottom of the sea. Was this a strange case of time travel where someone from the future made sure they had a flamethrower to keep them from losing a key battle? Nope, it's just good old fashioned chemistry. What actually is Greek fire? That's one of the biggest mysteries of the warfare around 672 CE. It was primarily used by the Byzantine Empire against Arab enemies, and it had two key parts. An incendiary compound, usually a powder, would be ignited, but it wouldn't be allowed to burn out of control. Instead, it would be fed through a nozzle and pointed outward at the enemy ship, creating a concentrated burst of flame that would spew straight forward. With the necessary closeness and good aim, it could catch an enemy ship on fire and wipe out an entire army, or at least ignite its sails and leave them stranded. Of course, the bigger challenge was making sure it didn't catch your own ship on fire in the process. But there's one mystery remaining. Exactly what were the ingredients of this weapon? Greek fire was written about extensively in the books of the era, but they left one major detail out the chemical compounds. This controlled fire not only worked as a flamethrower, but there were rumors it could stay a fire even on water, making it impossible to steer away easily. This led to modern speculation that it could have been made of components including naphtha, quicklime, and pine resin. While it was typically deployed through large carried projectors, there were also drawings of small handheld projectors. What could go wrong with giving each soldier on a boat their own personal flamethrower? It was also placed into flasks and thrown, just like an ancient grenade. While it's faded into antiquity now, Greek fire was no doubt an early forerunner of today's incendiary weapons. But one country did them one better in explosive weapons. Number 6. Holong Chushwe Ah, fireworks. There's nothing like watching them blow up in midair. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you'll get to watch a multi-stage one go off as it dazzles with one release of color after another. It's all fun and games until that rocket's coming straight for you. When packed with more gunpowder, a firework becomes a powerful weapon, as well as going down in history as the first form of ballistic missile. And they started in the world capital of ahead of their time weapons, China. It was the 14th century when the Huolong Chu Shui was first recorded, and it's well known that they had fireworks and gunpowder by then. What wasn't expected was sophisticated rockets that could deliver more than one stage. And they didn't just deliver a blow, they delivered some great aesthetics too. The Huolong Chushui looked a lot like modern rockets, about 5 feet long. It was made of a bamboo tube, but they wanted to send a message, so the rocket was given an ornately carved dragon head and tail. Pour one out for the poor artist who had to design those features only to have them blow up after one use. And inside the body would be four rockets filled with gunpowder that could give the tube a powerful launch. Four fuses would be lit, and as they ignited the rocket would launch far faster than any other rocket of the era. After all, four rockets are better than one, and anyone seeing the rocket coming would run for cover. But you can run, but you can't hide. Because the Huolong Shushui had a big secret, inside the mouth were three smaller arrow rockets, and just as the fuses of the first rockets were about to burn out, they would light the smaller rockets, which would burst out of the main rocket and hit four different locations instead of just one. It was the most advanced rocket of its era, and the idea of a multi-stage rocket caught on. 
It's still used in warfare today, with such controversial munitions like cluster bombs dropping mini bombs when they explode. While this rocket has faded into obscurity, it made an appearance in the Disney version of Mulan, and we're betting that if it was sold on the fireworks black market, it would be making a return to your neighborhood. Now let's get into a weapon that could serve more than one purpose. Number 5. Scythed Chariot The chariot was a game changer in combat. Unlike traditional horseback troops, you weren't fully at the mercy of a temperamental animal. You could carry more than one person per horse, and the speed boost was giving the armies that could afford them a massive advantage. Not only did the Romans make chariot warfare a staple of their military, but they had enough that they could make chariot races one of their many high-stakes sports. But eventually, the appeal of a horse-drawn chariot started to wear thin, and armies started to wonder, what if I could improve this? You know, what would make a horse-drawn chariot even better if it had lots of sharp blades attached to it? So, the scythe chariot entered the fray, and everyone nearby ran. Weaponized chariots were nothing new. Those riding in the chariots usually had swords and crossbows at the ready. What was different here was that the chariot itself was weaponized. Every wheel had horizontal blades around one meter long sticking out from the sides, as well as under the driver's seat. These would tear any enemy soldier who was unfortunate enough to encounter the chariot to shreds, and more importantly, it would cut the legs of enemy horses and bring them to the ground along with the enemy forces riding them. They were an effective way to cut through large infantry groups. A fast-moving scythe chariot could bring hundreds of men to the ground if it took them by surprise. So, why did it die out? The scythe chariot appeared to make its debut in the Persian military, reportedly in the mid-400s BC. It saw heavy use in the Persian Wars, cutting holes in the famous phalanx formations of the Greek and Macedonian armies. Armies would learn to avoid the scythe chariot, but that meant breaking formation and letting the Persians gain ground. However, they weren't much use on uneven ground or even against more loosely distributed troops, and they also stood the risk of injuring their own men or horses if they moved in the wrong direction. The scythe chariot saw more use in the era, but eventually faded from the battlefield, although it was briefly reinvented by Leonardo da Vinci who sketched it as one of his many, many inventions. And as warfare evolved, the need for new weapons increased. Number 4. The Corvus The First Punic War was one of the most critical wars of the Roman Empire's heyday, pitting them against the powerful Carthaginian army. They had powerful ships, and while the Roman army was no slouch, they were lacking in the naval warfare department. The biggest challenge was getting to the enemy and fighting them before they made landfall. Fortunately, the Romans had no shortage of engineers, and one device they created would have been lost to history if it wasn't for the writings of Polybius, a Greek historian responsible for much of the writings of the era. He made sure the Corvus survived its era, and even today many historians talk about this impressive and surprisingly controversial naval device, because in one move, it undid the Carthaginians' naval superiority. The Corvus was a bridge attached to a Roman ship with a small parapet on each side. The bridge was around 4 feet wide and 36 feet long, but what made it stand out was that it was attached to the boat by a system of pulleys. When the ship was on the move, it would be pulled up and out of the way. When an enemy ship approached, it would be lowered, and a spike at the base of the bridge would puncture the deck of the other ship. With the bridge fixed in place, suddenly dozens of Roman soldiers would board the ship and ambush them, ending the Carthaginian attack without a costly naval battle, and leaving the Roman ship intact and free to pull up the Corvus for their next attack. It was an ingenious invention. Or was it? While this could be challenging in rough seas, it was still easier than trying to place a boarding bridge manually. The only thing remaining of the Corvus are descriptions from Polybius' writings, so not too much is known about its actual construction. This has led to the spirited debates about how much it weighed, whether it was dangerous to use because it could unbalance both ships, and whether it was actually responsible for several major Roman naval disasters during the era. Modern architects have created their own designs for the Corvus, trying to recreate it and see just how Rome pulled off this impressive feat. Other architects, though, still insist the entire thing might have been an elaborate embellishment, might have never existed at all. But it's not out of the realm of possibility, considering they were up against some powerful enemies. Number 3. Hellenistic Warships The Carthaginian naval fleet put the Romans to the test, and they also taught them a thing or two. Once the Romans emerged victorious, they started developing their own powerful naval fleets. By the 4th century, these powerful wooden ships were among the largest ever to set sail, and must have looked more like massive cruise ships rather than standard warships. Without modern engines to power them, these warships used old-fashioned methods, oars, and lots of them. There were five levels, and each level had three very long oars sticking out of the side of the ship, with one oarsman breaking their back for each oar. These ships could carry large numbers of soldiers, 
but they were often hard to navigate and were subject to going off course easily. They looked impressive, but they weren't the most effective warships of the era. That honor went to the smaller warships that would come later. Often known as the Lembos, they required fewer oars and fewer soldiers to drive them and were more effective for stealth-based activities like espionage and piracy. While the massive earlier ships could be effective for storming a port, these smaller ships could sneak up behind their biggest counterparts, send agents on board, and sabotage the ship from within. And that might be the only way to get through some of those massive warships which were designed for ramming other ships. Backed by rows of rowers pushing themselves to the limit, they could simply crash into an inferior navy, crush the ships beneath their hulls, and train all their fire on the heart of the enemy fleet. But perhaps the most impressive innovations of ancient warfare were on the ground. Number 2. Siege Towers In ancient times, city-states had figured the best way to prevent attacks simply don't let anyone in. It was common for cities to have massive walls around them and the only way in being through a drawn gate. Sure, the city of Troy tried that and fell the subterfuge, but giant wooden gift horse plans only work once. So usually the only way in was through combat, but the people behind the walled city usually had a major advantage over those out in the open, shooting at them from the outside. The main strategy was usually climbing the walls, but those who tried often got hot oil poured on them. So around the 11th century BCE, the Babylonians and Assyrians came up with a new strategy, build a fortress of your own. Enter the Siege Tower. Sometimes as high as 40 meters, siege towers were massive wooden formations built on site. At battles outside walled cities, they would be built as high as the walls of the fortress, with several levels each manned by soldiers. Sometimes the tower would even have catapults or trebuchets built into it, and the concealed nature of the tower made it difficult for the city's defenders to know where to aim to take it down. The only option was overwhelming force, and then it became a one-on-one -on -one battle between the fortress and the tower. If the tower was brought close enough to the wall, moved by hundreds of soldiers, the team on top could then easily leap over the wall into the city and take the fight inside the fortress. But these massive weapons had their drawbacks. For one thing, they were massive. Not only did it take especially designed systems to move them as well as a lot of manpower, but one wrong move on the ground could crush people underneath. Then there was the fact that they were mostly made of wood and one flaming arrow could undo them in a way that the walled cities weren't vulnerable to. They also took a long time to construct, during which the army might be vulnerable to attack, and building them off-site and then transporting them usually wasn't feasible. Not only were they extremely heavy, but they could easily get stuck in muddy ground. Despite these drawbacks, they were incredibly powerful and kept on being used by attackers well into the Middle Ages. But to find the most insane ancient weapons of all, we have to go back to one of the most iconic ancient empires. Number 1. The Mad Weapons of Archimedes Across ancient Greece, there were few names more renowned than Archimedes. A mathematician, physicist, engineer, and inventor, he was the da Vinci of his era, responsible for inventing many of the core concepts of advanced math, much to the dismay of many school children. He came up with countless bold concepts. Some of his inventions, like astronomical instruments, are still used today. Others were just crazy experiments that never really panned out. But amid his many inventions were two of the craziest weapons ever designed. But did they actually work? The first was the Claw of Archimedes. Looks like something out of science fiction. It was designed to defend the city wall of Syracuse against warships. While only descriptions remain, most historians believe it was a crane equipped with a grappling hook that would attach to the front of the ship. It would then be raised, raising the ship with it, and sending the crew and their weapons toppling into the ocean below. The Claw of Archimedes may have been key during the Second Punic War, when Rome sent powerful naval fleets against Syracuse only to be routed, courtesy of the weapon known as the Iron Hand. But was another invention even more deadly? The Mirror of Archimedes was not a vanity device the famous scientist used in his private quarters. Rather, his sketches and notes indicated that it was a massive glass that would be mounted to a ship. By absorbing the sun's rays, it would then focus them and reflect them back in the direction the mirror was pointed, right at the enemy ship. The wooden ship would then catch on fire and sink to the bottom of the sea, in a massive scale version of frying ants with a magnifying glass. But did either of these inventions actually work? With so little evidence of Archimedes' inventions left, it's come down to skeptical scientists and engineers to test them by recreating them to scale. MIT professor David Wallace assembled a team of students to test the mirror of Archimedes. They tried on both cloudy and sunny days, and the mirror was never able to light a model ship on fire, leading most to believe this was a colorful myth. On the other hand, the team behind the series Super Weapons of the Ancient World on the Discovery Channel built a model off of what they knew about the Claw of Archimedes and succeeded in toppling a model of a Roman ship. So at least one of Archimedes' mad inventions might have ruled the seas. It's the world's most technologically advanced military. It's also home to equipment almost 100 years old. These are some of the oldest weapons still in operation in the US military. M2 Browning 50 caliber machine gun. 
been the United States' premier heavy machine gun for a whopping 89 years, and it's not looking to retire anytime soon. Designed in 1918 and adopted by the U.S. military in 1933, the M2 packs a formidable 50 caliber bullet fired at a muzzle velocity of 890 meters per second. It has a maximum range of 7,400 meters and an effective range of 1,800 meters. This machine gun is powerful enough to punch through even some armored vehicles, and that's exactly what it was originally meant to do. At the end of World War I, more heavily armored planes were being put into the air, with the German Junkers J.I. sporting an armor that made traditional aircraft machine guns largely ineffective. General John J. Pershing, commander of the American Expeditionary Force, requested the Army Ordnance Department develop a heavier machine gun capable of punching through improved aircraft armor. His request was for a machine gun capable of firing a minimum 50 caliber round at a minimum muzzle velocity of 820 meters per second. John M. Browning began redesigning his 30-06 M 1917 machine gun to be capable of firing a heavier round requested by General Pershing. On October 15, 1918, Browning's first prototype was tested. Though it achieved a less than stellar performance with a firing rate of less than 500 rounds a minute and a muzzle velocity of only 700 meters per second. To make matters worse, the weapon was very heavy compared to lower caliber models, was difficult to control when firing fully automatic, and was too weak to punch through armor while firing too slowly to be effective against enemy infantry. Browning got unexpected aid when a shipment of German T. Gewehr 1918 anti-tank rifles and their ammunition were seized by American forces. The German rounds had an 800-grain bullet with a muzzle velocity of 820 meters a second and could penetrate one inch of armor at 230 meters. Using the German rounds as inspiration, Winchester worked on improving the 50 calibers cartridge, eventually eventually leading to an effective round that achieved most of what the Army had requested of it. From 1921 to 1937, American aircraft were equipped with an experimental water-cooled version of the machine gun. These trials helped to refine the various versions of what would become the M2, formerly adopted by the United States before World War II. By the time the war broke out, the machine gun was standard on nearly every American aircraft and was used in everything from anti-material to infantry support and even air defense roles. Today, the 50 caliber enjoys service alongside American troops in every theater of operations and has been involved in every American conflict since World War II. Modern 50 calibers can be equipped with several different types of ammunition, including M33 ball rounds for personal and light material targets, M17 tracer, M8 armor penetrating incendiary, M20 armor penetrating incendiary tracers, and newer sabotaged light armor penetrator rounds capable of punching through 1.34 inches of steel armor at 500 meters. The M2, nicknamed the 50 or Mod Deuce, is such a good weapon it outperformed an intended replacement in the 60s, and a current modern replacement for the weapon was canceled. This means the US military will continue carrying the fearsome M2 into battle for decades more to come. Our next weapon system is not as old as the M2, but current plans are to keep it in operation for almost an entire century. CH-47 Chinook It was a helicopter born of necessity. Caught up in a war waged across inhospitable jungles with few roads, the U.S. Army desperately needed a way to quickly supply firebases spread across Vietnam. Most importantly, though, it needed to be able to supply those far-flung firebases with heavy equipment such as artillery. But cutting a road through the thick jungle would take years, and even then, the unpredictable weather and enemy ambushes could make such a journey impossible. The United States invented air assault operations during Vietnam with its extensive fleet of helicopters and quickly stopped to do the same with logistical concerns. However, current helicopters in the U.S. inventory were simply not powerful enough to carry heavy howitzers. Fortuitously, though, a twin-rotor transport helicopter had already been in development since 1957 to replace the Sikorsky CH-37 Mojave. The resulting V-107 was deemed too heavy for assault operations but too light for transport missions. Thus, work was undertaken to develop a larger, beefier helicopter capable of heavy transport duty. In 1962, the CH-47 Chinook officially joined the inventory of the U.S. Army armed forces. Despite its massive size, the Chinook has an impressive speed of 200 miles per hour and at the time was faster than any other utility or even attack helicopter. Today, the Chinook keeps that speed record, making it one of the fastest helicopters in the U.S. inventory. Throughout its lifetime, the airframe has received numerous upgrades to keep it up to date with new technology, but the core design remains largely unchanged. With two powerful rotors, the Chinook can carry up to 55 fully equipped combat troops or as much as 10 tons of cargo either inside or slung underneath it on cargo hooks. The helicopter would prove its worth through every U.S. conflict since Vietnam, but really shown during the war in Afghanistan. With its difficult and mountainous terrain, Afghanistan proved to be a challenge for the U.S. Army carrying out resupply and mobility operations, but the Chinook was easily able to navigate even the extreme heights of Afghanistan's mountains with ease. The Chinook continues going strong 60 years after being adopted 
mounted into the U.S. inventory. The Army's future vertical lift program will eventually deliver a replacement for the Chinook, but will focus first on a replacement for the UH-60 Blackhawk. In the meantime, future upgrades will keep the Chinook in operation for a predicted 99 years. Our next weapon is not just old, but proved to be so good at its job that its use was even expanded within the U.S. military. Carl Gustav Recoilless Rifle In service since 1946, the Carl Gustav 8.4cm recoilless rifle is perhaps the most successful anti-tank weapon ever made, and the U.S. military plans on continuing to use it for a long time. The Carl Gustav M1 was developed in 1946 by Hugo Abramson and Harold Jeans at the Royal Swedish Arms Administration. The weapon was developed with the help of knowledge gained from the operation of American bazookas, British Piats, and German Panzerschreck during the war, building on the strengths of each while making its own innovations. The greatest of these innovations was the use of a rifle barrel to spin-stabilize an explosive round, negating the need for a projectile to be outfitted with fins and thus reducing weight and improving performance. Another improvement over the Allied and German World War II two anti-tank weapons came in the form of developing the weapon as a recoilless system. A recoilless weapon ejects countermass from the rear of the weapon to negate the effect of recoil when firing. This allows the weapon to be much more accurate and to fire a larger projectile, while making the firing unit lighter and easier to use. Today, the Carl Gustav is an extremely economical solution for the anti-tank and anti-material needs of any infantry unit, with a unit cost of just $20,000 and an ammo cost that ranges from $500 to $3,000 depending on the round. The weapon can fire up to six rounds a minute with a crew of two, though it can be operated by just one soldier at a reduced rate of fire. It's also capable of accurately hitting moving vehicles at a range of up to 400 meters, stationary targets up to 500 meters, and can use high explosive rounds with a range of 1,000 meters, or rocket-boosted laser-guided ammunition at a range of up to a whopping 2,000 meters. The U.S. military initially only issued the weapon to special operations forces, but it was so good at its job, it expanded the use of the Carl Gustav to regular forces as well, with U.S. forces being engaged by RP at ranges up to 900 meters, no light weapon in the inventory of U.S. infantry could effectively counter this threat. Thus, the M3 multi-role anti-armor anti-tank weapon system variant of the Carl Gustav quickly came into wide adoption. Along with wider adoption came an increased variety in ammunition, which quickly made the M3 a favorite of U.S. infantry. Today, the Carl Gustav can fire high-explosive rounds, high-explosive anti-tank rounds, high-explosive anti-tank rocket-assisted rounds for increased range, high-explosive dual-purpose rounds for engaging enemy vehicles vehicles and structures, area defense rounds for engaging large numbers of enemy troops, anti-structure rounds for destroying enemy buildings, smoke rounds for creating a thick smoke screen, and illumination rounds for lighting up large swaths of grounds at night. The Carl Gustav is so good at its job there is no planned replacement in the pipeline, and instead it continues to be upgraded with even more modern projectiles and electronics. Our next aircraft has been the workhorse of the American Air Force for 65 years, and looks to continue that role for another 30. The C-130 Hercules During the Cold War, the United States knew it could be forced to fight in the most destructive conflict mankind could ever wage. Given the unprecedented destruction of even a non-nuclear conflict between itself and the Soviet Union, the U.S. needed to ensure it could still resupply forces across a devastated Europe. To that end, it called upon the C-130 Hercules, possibly the world's most rugged and versatile cargo aircraft. Its primary selling point was its ability to operate out of makeshift airfields, a key concern for a U.S. military facing a very real probability of having Allied airfields knocked out of commission by Soviet forces. Its requirements, however, were set in the years after the Korean War, when the U.S. realized it needed it needed dedicated military cargo aircraft and not models adapted from civilian use. The C-130 would be specifically designed to be a modern military cargo plane with a capacity of 92 passengers or 72 combat troops. Alternatively, it could fit 64 paratroopers and all of the equipment they need instead. The use of four turboprop engines gave the aircraft greater range and gas mileage than a turbojet variant and explains why it remains in use throughout the modern age. With few core design changes, the C-130 remains in service with various configurations, including the vaunted AC-130 gunship, the modern C-130J Super Hercules, featuring improved avionics, new engines, new composite propellers, and other modern updates, ski-equipped variants for ice operations, and the tactical airlift and aerial refueling variant in use by the U.S. Marine Corps. Maritime patrol versions are in service with the U.S. Coast Guard, and a ruggedized version of the Hercules is used in the deployment and retrieval of special operations forces. The C-130 remains in service not just in the U.S. military, but in militaries around the world, and looks set to continue 
serving with its home nation until the U.S. Air Force completes its CX Next Generation Airlifter program. Our next entry in this list is not just one of the oldest surfing weapons in the U.S. inventory, but is scheduled to have a lifetime in excess of 100 years. The B-52 Stratofortress Strategic Bomber. It can level a small town all on its own, and it can fly a whopping one-third of the way around the Earth without refueling to do so. It's the United States' big stick, the B-52 Stratofortress. Its origins herald back to 1945, just two months after the end of World War II. The United States was already looking ahead to the next conflict. The Air Material Command put out requests to aircraft manufacturers for what would become the heavy bomber of the future. This aircraft would need to carry out missions far from home and operate without the aid of advanced bases in other countries. In other words, this big bomber needed to have a great enough range that it could strike anywhere in the world without worrying about securing ground bases in other countries to do so. It was to have a crew of at least five turret gunners to defend the aircraft and a six-man relief crew for long-range and long-duration missions. The aircraft would need to cruise at a minimum of 300 miles per hour at a height of 40 3,000 feet and be capable of hitting targets 5,000 miles away. For defense, it would carry 20mm cannons and on the offense, it would drop 10,000 pounds high explosives. For the next several years, Boeing and the US military would go back and forth on design changes, finally landing on the B-52 we recognize today in 1952. The aircraft would go on to break many records, shockingly even speed records, setting a world speed record of 560.705 miles per hour in 1958, only to be broken that same day by another B-52 flying at 597.675 miles per hour. That speedy bomber would eventually be outrun by a smaller jet aircraft, but the big plane continued to set and break records in endurance with a whopping 12,532-mile unrefueled flight in 1962. With the support of aerial tankers, though, B-52s were able to circle the globe non-stop in just under two days. This incredible reach and endurance quickly earned the planes a nuclear mission, and to this day remains part of the US nuclear triad. However, it's the conventional firepower that makes the B-52 the undisputed kings of the sky. With the ability to drop a whopping 70,000 pounds of explosives on any target around the world, modern upgrades to the fleet include new engines and wing structure replacements, electro-optical sensors, and infrared and advanced targeting pods. B-52s are now capable of such precise strikes that they were used commonly as close air support platforms for coalition forces in Iraq and Afghanistan, delivering overwhelming firepower with pinpoint accuracy. Originally meant to saturate a target with dumb gravity bombs, modern B-52s use a suite of onboard sensors to monitor a battlefield and deliver precision fire exactly where it's needed most. Laser-guided bombs can be guided to a target by a B-52 or allied aircraft, or even by forces on the ground. GPS-guided munitions can be fired and forgotten by a loitering B-52, and the development of long-range standoff attack munitions can give the B-52 an incredible reach even in contested air environments by staying well out of the reach of enemy weapons and sensors. With even more upgrades to come, the American B-52 fleet is set to remain in operation for an estimated additional 50 years, with some estimates placing the B-52 total lifetime at 150 years. That means that by the year 2100, B-52s could still be flying as part of America's arsenal. War is always brutal. But there might have been times in history where people have looked back at the weapons we've used in past wars and said, yeah, that was pretty messed up, even by war standards. That's how we got the United Nations Convention on Prohibitions or Restrictions on the use of certain conventional weapons which may be deemed to be excessively injurious or have indiscriminate effects, or Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons for short, or CCW for even shorter. The CCW serves to restrict the use of weapons seen as too brutal and too cruel for modern warfare, and anyone caught using these weapons is guilty of war crimes. But considering some of the horrifying weapons militaries have developed and used on one another throughout the thousands of years of human warfare, which weapons did the UN consider a bridge too far? Thankfully, it won't be that hard to find out, as all the banned weapons have been separated into five protocols. We'll break down some of these protocols and discuss some of the horrifying reasons each of these rules needed to be made in the first place. Protocol 1 applies to non-detectable fragments. It isn't against the law of war to use some fragmentation weapons. For example, the fragmentation or frag grenade has been a military staple for decades, and it's still common in use among soldiers today. Frag grenades have a very simple core principle. They're made of a metal casing designed to split into smaller pieces of shrapnel, with the explosive force from within the grenade superheating that shrapnel and firing it out in all directions at incredible speed. With some miraculous exceptions, the result of a frag grenade going off next to a human is pretty much always the same. If the explosion doesn't kill them, the massive bodily trauma of being shredded by the shrapnel will lead to a pretty quick death. 
In the cases of those lucky, or depending on the situation, unlucky enough to survive the blasts, x-rays can be used to detect the fragments so that field medics or surgeons can remove them if possible. In the eyes of the UN, this is all good sport. But Protocol 1 of the CCW forbids explosives or ammunition designed to harm its victims through fragments that are impossible to be detected with magnets or x-rays. Some bombs have historically used plastic or glass as their fragmentation element, rather than metal. When superheated and fired into the body at great speeds, glass and plastic are just as painful and deadly as metal fragments, but are impossible to detect with an x-ray, and thus are impossible to operate out of a surviving victim. This sets a precedent for the kind of things the CCW forbids. Weapons of war should be designed to kill, not maim and mutilate. Weapons that seem excessively cruel, such as ones that leave survivors in an extended or permanent state of pain and suffering, should not be used. There's another qualifier that sends a weapon into war crime territory, but we'll get into that later. Another weapon banned from warfare by Protocol 1 of the CCW is frangible bullets. These special bullets are designed in some cases to prevent the danger of a ricochet occurring. These bullets are subject to brittle failure, where they disintegrate on impact, becoming countless tiny projectiles rather than one large one. But these bullets have a secondary effect, beyond preventing a ricochet occurring, as outlined in the study, effects of a fragmenting handgun bullet, considerations for trauma care providers by Lynn Hockey, Allison Smith, Jonathan Babin, John Hunt, Juan Duchenne, and Patrick Griefenstein. The study states, expanding or fragmenting bullets are designed to inflict significantly more tissue damage than non-deformable bullets. This type of ammunition is prohibited in international warfare on the basis that it does not serve a military advantage but can result in excessive wounding and unnecessary suffering. There is no such ban for handgun ammunition for domestic use in most countries, including the United States. Ammunition manufacturers have recently released a fragmenting bullet that's designed to inflict a maximum amount of tissue damage. Two horrifying facts. The bullet being described here is the Radically Invasive Projectile, also known by the sinister acronym RIP. War is brutal, but perhaps not brutal enough to use ammo with a name that would fit right in the Grim Reaper's arsenal. With non-metal shrapnel explosives and terrifying frangible bullets out of the way, we move on to Protocol 2 of the CCW, mines, booby traps, and other devices. This protocol is a little more complicated than the first with some parts regulating rather than outright banning certain weapons. Take for example landmines. These weapons are rightly infamous for the roles they played in the First and Second World Wars as well as during the Vietnam War, where they were responsible for countless cases of deaths and mutilations of unsuspecting soldiers. But soldiers dying in war is sadly part of the job description. It's the effects these weapons have on civilians caught in the crossfire that's led to the UN strictly regulating them. If countries lay landmines during a war, when the conflict ends, they are legally obligated to deactivate and collect these mines to reduce the probability of civilian casualties during peacetime. This falls under the second category we alluded to earlier. If the weapons don't discriminate and are equally likely to injure or kill civilians or combatants, their use will likely be considered criminal. Anti-personnel mines are also subject to extremely strict regulations, as these mines are specifically designed for use against human combatants rather than vehicles. The purpose must be to kill enemy combatants, thus anti-personnel mines that merely wound or disfigure enemy combatants are illegal under Protocol 2. But mines are one thing, booby traps are quite another. The details around this one are particularly horrifying, as the UN lists many specific regulations against the use of booby traps, implying there have been recorded instances of all of them. When you hear the phrase booby traps, you might envision pits full of razor-sharp punji sticks in the jungles of Vietnam or maybe Indiana Jones running away from poison darts or a giant rolling boulder in some ancient underground tomb. Sadly, the reality is often a lot more gruesome. Here are a list of ways that the UN forbids booby traps being used in warfare. It's illegal to use booby traps attached to internationally recognized protective emblems, signs, or signals. For example, you can't hide a deadly trap in what looks like a Red Cross building. It's illegal to attach booby traps to sick, wounded, or dead people whom soldiers or humanitarian groups might seek to rescue or retrieve. It's illegal to booby trap burial, grave, and cremation sites, which is an advanced level of not having respect for the dead. It's illegal to booby trap medical facilities, medical equipment, medical supplies, or medical transportation. It's illegal to booby trap children's toys or other portable objects or products specially designed for the feeding, health, hygiene, clothing, or education of children. Let's just take a second to process that, because the idea that there were militaries out there booby-trapping children's toys is about as close to objectively evil as it gets. 
Okay, moving on. It's illegal to booby trap food and drink, as well as kitchen utensils or appliances, except in military establishments, military locations, or military supply depots. It's illegal to booby trap objects clearly of a religious nature, historic monuments, works of art, or places of worship which constitute the cultural or spiritual heritage of peoples, and of course, it's illegal to booby trap animals or their carcasses. It's good that these laws are in place, given that if militaries were already doing this, we definitely needed to rein them in. We wish we could tell you things would get less depressing and horrifying from here, but that would be a bald-faced lie. Unless you find people being burned to death whimsical and fun, in which case please don't take this video as a potential checklist of things you can do once you become a dictator. This is Protocol 3, Prohibitions or Restrictions on the Use of Incendiary Weapons. That is to say, any weapon that uses fire or heat as their main offensive capability. If you felt a prickle of heat on your skin, please don't expect that to go away anytime soon as we delve a little deeper into why this protocol is so important. Discovering fire is long viewed as a seminal moment in humanity's development, and we here at the Infographic Show speculate it was probably some 20 minutes or so after this discovery that someone was wondering if it could be used to kill people. From fire arrows to fiery projectiles thrown from siege weapons like catapults and trebuchets, to the terrifying Roman incendiary weapon known as Greek fire, which was used in rudimentary flamethrowers to burn down enemy ships, fire has long been used as a tool of war. But these weapons seem positively quaint compared to the horrors of the M2 flamethrower and napalm used to burn down jungles and enemy combatants during the Vietnam War. Being burned to death is a horrible fate, far more so than being bombed or taking a bullet to the head. But that's if it kills you. You're equally likely to survive your run-in with an incendiary weapon and live the rest of your life horrifically burned, experiencing unimaginable pain and psychological stress. Another problem with incendiary weapons is that fire also tends to spread. Fire doesn't discriminate between the soldier and the civilian, between military installations and innocent homes or forests. It's the reason that the policy of completely annihilating everything that an enemy needs to wage war is known as scorched earth. Incidentally, enacting a scorched earth policy against civilians was also banned by the Geneva Convention in 1977. Strict restrictions are placed on the usage of incendiary weapons under Protocol 3. It's illegal to use incendiary weapons against civilian populations, areas, or objects including quote, any weapon or munition which is primarily designed to set fire to objects or to cause burn injury to persons through the action of flame, heat, or a combination thereof produced by a chemical reaction of a substance delivered on the target. Because of fire's nature to spread uncontrollably, it's also forbidden to air deliver incendiary weapons against military targets in the middle of highly concentrated civilian locations. Funnily enough, there are often strange and curious exceptions to some of these protocols. Take for example the UN's repeated attempts and chronic inability to meaningfully regulate thermobaric weapons or vacuum bombs. These are some of the most deadly explosives out there. They're bombs containing large amounts of incendiary fuel that's released and ignited upon detonation, creating a fiery explosion that sucks the oxygen out of the air to fuel its extremely violent chemical reaction. In other words, you get obliterated while also suffocating. What a treat! These terrifying weapons are not all regulated under the CCW. In what seems to be a perfect example of the regulatory blind spots in the UN's attempts to litigate warfare. This brings us to Protocol 4, Blinding Laser Weapons. Your reaction to that was probably, wait, the military has used blinding laser weapons? To which we say, this will not be the only existential nightmare you experience in this video. While this protocol doesn't prohibit the use of weapons against binoculars, periscopes, telescopes, and other optical equipment, nor can it penalize accidental blinding, the first article lays out, quote, it is prohibited to employ laser weapons specifically designed as their sole combat function or as one of their combat functions to cause permanent blindness to unenhanced vision, that is, to the naked eye or to the eye with corrective eyesight devices. This brings us back to the question of what kinds of weapons the UN wanted to regulate with Protocol 4. One of the most prominent and infamous ones was the Personnel Halting and Stimulation Response Rifle, or Phaser, because even the engineers tasked with creating cutting-edge weapons for the military are still huge Star Trek nerds. But while the name is fun, the weapon is decidedly less so. It's a laser rifle designed to, quote, temporarily blind the target. But if you crank the power up a bit too high, or if you put it in careless hands, temporary blindness can very quickly become permanent. I think we speak for everyone when we say that here at the Infographics Show, we're kind of relieved that the UN is keeping weapons like this out of warfare. 
but this next protocol helps to regulate an element of war that can stick around for long after the war itself has ended. Protocol 5. Explosive Remnants of War We already spoke out about the danger of unexploded landmines, but this protocol hopes to both reinforce that and reduce the harm caused by unexploded cluster bombs. If you aren't familiar with the concept of the cluster bomb, it's a rather infamous weapon that's been used in countless wars since its invention during World War II. The general principle is that a cluster bomb is full of smaller bombs known as submunitions. These fall indiscriminately over the target area, exploding and carpeting a vast swath of land with deadly fire. They're extremely inhumane weapons, capable of just as easily massacring civilians as troops, but even worse, not all the submunitions explode at once. Some remain undetonated, embedded in the land, and at the constant risk of exploding or injuring civilians. It's really no question as to why the UN would have problems with them and seek to remedy their effects with litigation. Of course, the CCW isn't the only set of international laws forbidding the use of certain weapons in warfare. Before we think about the dark potential futures of warfare, let's take a quick look at a disturbing grab bag of other banned weapons. First, poisoned bullets. First invented and pioneered by the one and only Leonardo da Vinci as ballistic shells filled with sulfur and arsenic, these were some of the first weapons ever barred by an agreement between nations, the Strasbourg Agreement of 1675 between Rome and France. Not that this stopped any other nations from trying later, as the US military experimented with lacing bullets with the deadly toxin ricin during World War I. This idea thankfully never caught on. Later, the Geneva Convention forbade the use of chemical weapons and poisoned gas under the CWC, or Chemical Weapons Convention. Three particular chemical weapons that have been restricted are the nerve agent Novichok, the previously mentioned poison ricin, and the infamous sarin gas, which Syria was sanctioned for using on its own people during the Syrian civil war, despite signing the CWC in 2013. But what about biological weapons? Bioweapons aren't just exclusive to Resident Evil villains, they've been a mainstay of hundreds of different armies across millennia. Genghis Khan and the Mongols used corpses to spread disease among their enemies. Centuries later, armies in Europe during the Middle Ages catapulted the corpses of dead animals into the fortresses they were sieging, getting the people trapped inside dangerously sick. Centuries later, Europeans colonizing North America used blankets infected with smallpox to murder scores of Native Americans. Even as recently as Vietnam, the Viet Cong coated their punji sticks with human feces, making the injuries they caused extra infectious. Naturally, with our increasing understanding of the destructive potential for viral and germ warfare, it's understandable that the 1972 Biological Weapons Convention was created to prevent movies like Contagion and 28 Days Later from becoming documentaries. And of course, there are dirty bombs, a weapon whose mere mention can cause heart rates to spike. Dirty bombs fuse the worst parts of a conventional and nuclear explosive. It's a conventional bomb laced with nuclear material, essentially making it a distribution system for radiation that will sicken and kill indiscriminately over a wide area, potentially irradiating said area for decades, centuries, or even millennia to come. It's also, incidentally, a lot easier to make than a standard nuclear weapon, which is why the world's nations are often a lot more worried about terrorists making them than whole countries with access to full-on nuclear warheads and the means to launch them. We've looked at the horrors of wars past that the international community has tried to prevent from repeating themselves, but weapons developments move a lot faster than international conflict legislation. That's why many have suggested a potential future Protocol 6 Lethal Autonomous Weapons, aka Skynet-style killer robots. Yep, that's right, the UN is fully expecting weapons companies to start investing in and manufacturing autonomous weapon systems, and they're just hoping to get ahead of the curve. Hopefully it won't take a few autonomous weapons atrocities to get those laws passed. Guns, tanks, stealth jets, and lasers? The US military has a pretty advanced army, and buried in those vaults are some of the strangest weapons ever invented. Here are the craziest military weapons the army still uses today. Number 20. Atchison Assault Shotgun Everyone knows the positives of a shotgun. They hit like a tank, complete with an earth-shattering sound. The cons? Very limited capacity. 
that makes it useful for scaring off a daughter's boyfriend or blowing the head off a zombie, but maybe not so much in combat. Military weapons require both accuracy, ease of use, and high capacity, not something shotguns are typically known for. Enter the Atchison. Also known as the Auto Assault 12, this gun is one of the only automatic combat shotguns ever created. It only needs the user to make a quick trigger pull to fire and can fire up to a whopping 300 shots a minute. While this model was designed in the 1980s and has largely fallen out of favor, future designs built on it and combat shotguns are still used today, making them even more useful. The powerful recoil that comes with a shotgun, knocking many an unexpecting user off their feet, is barely present here. It takes the power of a shotgun and combines it with the accuracy and use of a rifle, but sometimes the best way to survive combat is not to be seen. Number 19. Adaptive Camouflage It's hard to get a convoy through enemy territory, one wrong move, and you could come under attack from dozens of snipers, and staying under the radar is easier when you're not taking massive military vehicles with you. Camouflage has been used by militaries for thousands of years, often as simple as the color of clothing soldiers wear, but disguising something large like a tank is a different story. In 2011, that all changed, as BAE Systems announced an incredible new program that could protect convoys from enemy eyes. But could someone really make a tank invisible? Surprisingly, yes. The adaptive camouflage system was simply surprisingly effective. The sides of the armored vehicle would be covered with around a thousand hexagonal panels that would take thermal images of everything around the vehicle. They would then reflect what was on the other side, creating an image of an area without the vehicle in it. Alternatively, the camouflage could reflect a chosen image, like a harmless car driving through, to eliminate suspicion. The infrared stealth system remains one of the top choices for high-tech camouflage available today. Sometimes what an army needs is strength. Number 18. Hulk no, they're not dropping a green giant guy on the enemy, although that would be pretty effective. The Human Universal Load Carrier was an attempt by Berkeley Robotics starting in the year 2000 to see what a human can do when given a little assistance. Carrying equipment is one of the biggest challenges of the army, and it often makes it hard to travel from one location to another. So, the scientists asked, what if we could increase a soldier's carrying capacity? By how much? How about an inhuman 200 pounds while traveling 10 miles an hour? And all it would take was a simple exosuit skeleton. The Hulk was designed to fit around the legs and back, providing support and a powered assist while carrying a massively heavy backpack. Powered by batteries, it would run for up to 8 hours while marching and could operate for days with lighter use. While it did perform up to par for weight and none of the troops using it were injured by the weights, the army wasn't quite satisfied with the freedom of movement it offered, and it could cause strain on muscles. While it's not currently used in combat, interest in the project remains, bringing us all a little bit closer to being Iron Man. In combat, the most important factor is none other than accuracy. Number 17. Precision Guided Firearm in today's army, many of the soldiers are trained marksmen, but many only get basic training, and in the events of a draft, it's likely some would be thrown into combat with only a few weeks of training. That's why today's military is focused on how to take a little of the work off the soldier and onto the gun itself. The Precision Guided Firearm is an upgraded sniper rifle that not only has the traditional tracking scope, but comes with wireless smart technology to pick up data to make it easier to hit your target. And when we say pick up data, we mean all of the data. The most advanced of all these weapons can hack into a local and larger network to pick up data from voice and video all around. The digital scope can also provide visual assistance for locking onto the target, similar to how fighter jets often have precise targeting mechanisms. If this sounds like super spy territory, that's because it is, and many of these weapons can track targets and figure out the best possible vantage point to hit them from, without much input from the man behind the scope. But what if it wasn't just the gun that was smart? Number 16. Smart Bullets Precision guided munitions are not new. Missiles and torpedoes are often equipped with guiding mechanisms that can not only just lock onto targets but change their trajectory if the target moves. In 2008, the Exacto program at DARPA switched their strategy from focusing solely on smart guns, developing bullets that can have the same abilities. The earliest model would illuminate the target with a laser designator, and the bullet would be keyed to follow that. It would be able to track targets up to a mile away and change position 30 times a second. But modern designs might be even more advanced. The research into smart bullets is ongoing, and Dr. Roland Barrett developed a model that would have three fiber optic eyes around it for tracking. Other designed bullets would be able to be controlled by radio waves or travel around corners automatically without needing to be fired from a curved barrel. These weapons are still in development, and the biggest roadblock in their way? Money. After all, most soldiers will only use one gun but a lot of bullets, and making every one of them a smart bullet would involve a lot of technology. Maybe time to send those bullets through community college instead. Sometimes, though, you need non-lethal weapons. Number 15. 
Taser Shockwave A stun gun can be a useful way to neutralize an enemy without killing or seriously hurting them, like when you need them coherent for interrogation. But that becomes a lot harder when the person is part of a large group of enemies, and they're all coming right at you. They're probably going to overwhelm you before you get the chance to fire the taser more than once, and that's if you don't run out of charge. But what if you could fire 10 tasers at one time? That's the question the mad scientists at the Taser Corporation decided to answer, and the resulting weapon was amazing if not exactly practical. Meet the Taser Shockwave, a battery of stun guns attached to cables and loaded into a launcher. When triggered, the tasers shoot out and deliver powerful shocks to just about anyone they hit. It might look like a mini-headed dragon, but it's effective at incapacitating attackers quickly and in large numbers, if it hits the target. Accuracy isn't really its strong suit, and in a combat situation there's no guarantee it would hit its target. Taser continues to refine the weapon, and some think it might be more suited to crowd control than combat. And sometimes, you need weapons in the most unusual circumstances. Number 14. Heckler & Coke P11 You're on a submarine, and you get an alert. A saboteur is trying to sink you. You get into the water to engage, but there is just one problem. Your gun isn't equipped for firing underwater. Ordinary rounds lose range and accuracy when fired underwater. Fortunately, you're armed with the Heckler & Coke P11, one of the best underwater pistols ever developed. It's short and stubby, looking more like a checkout scanner than a gun, but it packs a punch. But the surface isn't the only thing that makes it different. The P11 only has five barrels as opposed to the usual six. It fires steel darts rather than traditional bullets, but they can still tear through the enemy. And rather than being traditionally fired, it uses a battery pack in the grip. Also, don't use it recklessly. It can't be reloaded by users and has to be returned to the factory for more ammo. This isn't a weapon that's used too often unless we wind up fighting an army from the lost city of Atlantis, but its secrets are well kept. So well, in fact, its manufacturer won't comment on it. Sometimes the military goes small, and sometimes they go big. Number 13. Electromagnetic Laboratory Railgun The U.S. Office of Naval Research is not a place you get into easily. This is where all the prototypes of the most advanced weapons in the military's stable can be found, but one of them has the potential to be one of the deadliest weapons ever created, taking an already powerful tool and supercharging it with modern technology. A railgun is a massive weapon that fires projectiles at rapid speed and would be one of the most powerful weapons in the U.S. arsenal without needing the equipment for traditional firing. So, what is the secret of this massive prototype? Instead of chemicals designed to ignite explosions, this railgun would fire projectiles entirely using magnetic fields and electricity, and they would travel faster and hit harder than any bullet currently available, up to a whopping 5,600 miles per hour. This gives the railgun power associated with cruise missiles. It's currently in testing, and the military is optimistic about mounting it on ships soon enough, but to get there, they'll have to perfect the repeated fire capability, because for this gun, it's both quantity and quality and that means a lot more tests. But what if the military didn't need to use humans at all? Number 12. The Fire Scout When troops are in a pitched firefight and they see a helicopter from up above, it usually means one thing. Backup is here. But the powerful defense contractor Northrop Grumman has given a new twist. The helicopter is here to provide support, but that doesn't mean there's anyone on board. The Fire Scout looks almost exactly like a standard military chopper, but you'll see a few differences. For one thing, it doesn't have windows, because there's no one inside to look out of them. The Fire Scout might be the most advanced drone ever created. It can take off and land independently, provide aerial fire support for ground troops, and has a top-of-the-line targeting system. While it's designed to be used in combat, it's also an effective surveillance tool. It was declared mission-capable in 2019 and took to the skies, although the Navy continues to develop and enhance it. This raises the question, if the smart machines are the wave of the future, which other heavy artillery could soon be roaming the battlefield without any soldiers on board? Naturally, we're about to find out. Number 11. The Black Knight Tanks are the workhorse of the military. These treaded vehicles provide valuable shelter for soldiers, run over enemy lines, and are equipped with powerful guns. There's just one downside. If they take a hard hit, they can be hard to escape from in a hurry, which is why the mad geniuses of BAE Systems ask, what if we had a tank without the vulnerable people inside? Enter the Black Knight, a 12-ton tank designed as an unmanned ground combat vehicle. It looks like an ordinary tank on the surface, but much like the Fire Scout, looks can be deceiving. Let's just say you don't 
want to be in the way of this drone. It's armed with both a turret-mounted large gun and a coaxial machine gun, runs on traditional Caterpillar diesel engines, and its tractor treads make it ideal for off-road operations. It's operated by remote control, but also can use its computer system to make in-combat decisions, independently of operator input. While it's ideal for missions that are too dangerous to send soldiers into the field, its technology is still a work in progress as the military tries to perfect the wireless communication system. But many people in power think this is the remote tank that might be the wave of the future. The military has developed many non-lethal weapons, some with a devastating impact. Number 10. Phaser it looks like a sci-fi laser gun, and it kind of acts like it too. The Phaser, officially titled the Personnel Halting and Stimulation Response Rifle, is a massive laser dazzler gun designed by the Air Force's research division. It doesn't fire a projectile, but can neutralize an entire field of enemies in seconds by unleashing a massive burst of light that can temporarily blind them. This is a low-intensity laser, which means that the victim should recover quickly, but it can leave an entire field of soldiers stumbling among each other and firing nowhere in particular. So why is this weapon not everywhere yet? It's not that the gun didn't work, it's that the military had to make sure it didn't work too well. Blinding weapons that can cause permanent damage are banned under a 1995 UN protocol, and using them is seen as a crime against humanity, so the military needed to make sure there were no lasting side effects. They also had to give it a really cool name, and someone in the design process was definitely a Star Trek fan. But unlike its namesake weapon, this one only has a stun setting. This next weapon might be the way out of some close quarters. Number 9. The Corner Shot In the 1940s, the Nazi army debuted a new weapon, the Krumlauf, a rifle with a curved barrel that could shoot around corners. It was an innovative solution to a major combat problem, and it was a complete failure, with the bullets getting jammed and damaging the barrel after only a few shots. But over 50 years later, the design might have been perfected, ironically by an Israel weapons designer named Amos Golan. Designed in cooperation with American investors, the corner shot has become a key tool for modern militaries. But technology has marched on since the 1940s, and it shows. Unlike the failed version, this weapon doesn't try to shoot a bullet through a curved barrel. Instead, it mounts to a small pistol on the end of a larger weapon, allowing it to be aimed at the target that can be seen through a periscope lens. And it's not a high-powered weapon, but it's one that makes shooting targets from the safety of cover much easier. And in case you're looking for a little more firepower, it can be equipped with a 40mm grenade launcher that can send rounds flying in any direction you choose, without the risk of blowing up your own barrel. Sometimes it's not about the firepower you pack, but it's about what you see. Number 8. Ivis Soldiers can be armed with the best weapons in the world, but in the fog of war, they're dependent on their own eyesight. If they're caught in smoke or in a snowstorm, their aim might be off, leading to missed targets or worse, friendly fire casualties. This gets even more dangerous when the enemy releases vision-clouding weapons, letting them get the drop on the soldiers, which is why teams in the United States Army are working on a unique new headset, one that will not just clear their vision but plunge the soldiers into a new world. Are our soldiers ready for virtual reality? The Integrated Visual Augmentation System, or IVAS, is an augmented reality headset that eliminates visual fog and provides soldiers with a unique array of image options. This includes a thermal setting, so soldiers will be able to see hidden enemies. It also can filter out interference and let soldiers focus on what's important. The headset is in final testing, and the Army plans to use it both as a field tool and a training tool, with soldiers able to engage against virtual enemies in the headset. Maybe exclusive headset video games will soon make some pro gamers sign up for the service too. It's not the only field where the military is working on what sounds like science fiction. Number 7. Quantum Stealth Guy Kramer comes from Canadian innovation royalty, being the grandson of the man who invented the first walkie-talkie, but he might be looking to outdo his granddad by cracking a concept H.G. Wells invented in fiction over a century ago. How do you turn someone invisible? The military has been working on a vehicle camouflage for a while, but options for mobile soldiers are much limited. That's where Quantum Stealth comes into play, a long-term project between Kramer's company HyperStealth and military officials in both Canada and the USA. So what's the secret to his innovation? The keys to quantum stealth are being kept close to the military's chest, but what we know is that quantum stealth uses lenticular lenses, the same technology seen in 3D movie posters. The lenses refract light according to the angle they're viewed at, and the way that they're arranged creates dead spots where the object is invisible. But the background is. While it doesn't render the subject completely invisible and can create a blurry spot, it's more than effective enough to confuse a soldier observing from a distance, so it's no surprise the government is investing heavily in the technology. But sometimes you need an earth-shattering kaboom. Number 6. XN1 Laws Unleash the Death Ray 
Laser weapons are part of science fiction lore, but the US government doesn't want to destroy any planets with them, we hope. The advantage of lasers is that they use a simple powered device and don't rely on ammunition, so they can deliver more than one hit in quick succession. The XN-1 Laws was developed by the US Navy and first deployed for field testing in 2014, and the USS Ponce was the lucky ship to get to fire it first. It uses an infrared beam launched from a laser array to hit flying and sea-based targets. So how does it work? For one thing, it's highly energy efficient, needing only an energy pulse to fire and none of the equipment. It can also be adjusted for power, being useful for temporarily blinding enemies at the lowest level. But when it's dialed up to the maximum level of 30,000 watts, it can deliver a massive punch. Not only can it target motors and fry sensors, but it can detonate explosive material on an enemy boat before it reaches its target. It might not be able to blow up enemy battleships from afar, but it's the most effective laser weapon yet. And when it comes to non-lethal attack, sometimes things get… weird. Number 5. LED Incapacitator The enemy is advancing, and the only thing that will defeat them is… a flashlight? Well, not just any flashlight. The LED Incapacitator is one of the oddest weapons designed by the Department of Homeland Security's Innovation Research Office, and it's largely designed for use at border crossings and other locations where confrontations with suspicious individuals who might be carrying contraband are likely. Rather than using a traditional weapon, this weapon unleashes a series of random pulses of multicolored light, which switch frequencies often and cause pressure on the brain, and the effects can be… messy. The first symptom is a severe headache, and subjects can experience temporary blindness because their eyes can't adjust to the flashing lights. But they also can't focus, become disoriented, and are hit with a wave of nausea, which is why this weapon has earned the nickname the Puke Ray. It's largely an effective weapon against individual targets, but some subjects have been proven largely immune. While it hasn't been deployed everywhere due to concerns over its effectiveness, the odds are it would at least be a useful distractor. But that's nothing compared to what this next non-lethal weapon does. Number 4. Active Denial System The US military and defense contractor Raytheon wanted a way to maintain perimeter security and crowd control without having to rely on live fire, and they developed an option that comes out of science fiction. Known as the ADS, it works by firing an energy beam of similar wavelength to the way a microwave oven works. But instead of heating up your frozen burrito, the ADS is going to heat up you. It activates the water and fat molecules in the skin, suddenly heating them and creating a painful effect that sends anyone hit with it running. But surely, microwaving people can't be ethical, right? While the technology is scary, the effects have been minimal. A microscopic percentage of those affected develop minor burns and blistering, while most retreat from the painful sensation without suffering any obvious injuries. While the device could seriously hurt someone if focused on them, the device is intended to protect perimeters and deter people from entering, meaning they'll have the option to run away as soon as they feel the heat. Authorities are now exploring deploying it in both theaters of war and as a way to keep prisoners from escaping over the fence. This next weapon raises the question, is James Bond becoming real? Number 3. The Armatix IP-1 This weapon doesn't look like much, it's just a standard handgun. But if the agent carrying it gets attacked and disarmed, the enemy grabs their gun, they'll be in for an unpleasant surprise. Because it doesn't matter how many bullets are in the chamber, that gun is not firing. The Armatix IP-1, developed by a famous German firearms manufacturer, is notable for being one of the most advanced smart guns in the world. Not only is it optimized to be safe and easy to fire and equip with a camera, but it can only be fired by its authorized user, and it pulls that off with an unassuming accessory. The Armatix IP-1 comes in two parts, the gun and the wristwatch it's linked to. It might look like a standard accessory, but it's actually an RFID system that communicates with a handgun and can wirelessly affect it when within 10 inches. If the gun is separated from the watch wear, it becomes a paperweight. This is one watch battery you don't want to run out, so it indicates the charge on both parts, and it comes with a targeting system that can identify and only fire toward the assigned target. It's not a surprise that this gun is not only being considered for classified missions, but many people want some of its features added to standard guns. But what's the ultimate frontier in combat? It just might be droids. Number 2. Modular Advanced Armed Robotic System What's better than armed combat vehicle drones? How about an armed robotic soldier that can head into battle instead of humans? We might be a long way from the cyborg wars, but that hasn't stopped the Defense Department from dreaming big. They've been experimenting with combat robots for a while, and the current models are more advanced than ever. Coming soon to a battlefield near you, the Mars, a nearly 400-pound robot armed with sensors, weapons, and cameras, and it's packing more firepower than any human could carry. How much? How about a machine gun? 
four grenade launchers, the capability to fire non-lethal gear like tear gas, as well as a laser dazzler and a loudspeaker for communicating safely with the enemy. For non-combat missions, the Mars can be equipped with the ability to carry up to 120 pounds. While some combat robots are designed for artificial intelligence, the Mars is more analog, controlled by an operator at base like a drone. But it doesn't need to be a smart robot, it's got enough brawn to make up for the brains. But there's one more robot in the field that might take you by surprise and make you say, what a good boy. Number 1. Robot Dogs A battlefield is stressful enough, but imagine seeing a large four-legged animal approaching you. It looks kind of like a dog, but the proportions are off and it's moving fast. This isn't some weird desert beast, it's one of the military's most popular innovations, the Big Dog. This four-legged military robot was developed by Boston Dynamics and DARPA in 2005 for equipment carrying purposes, essentially replacing the pack mules of old. Its four-legged system would let it overcome rough terrain and each one would have a complex onboard computer. Computer. But sometimes reality defeats innovation. The Big Dog project didn't work out for carrying military equipment because they were too loud for combat. Turns out all those moving parts aren't quiet. But this wasn't the end of the project. While the original shut down in 2015, a smaller all-electric model with a lower carrying capacity was soon introduced. And many current models are being equipped not just with carrying capacity, but with non-lethal defense capabilities. That means these robot dogs have a bite and they might just be coming to a city near you. Some are high-tech and cutting-edge, some are low-tech and brutal, others technically might not even be weapons at all. These are the deadly weapons that could start World War III. Just about any weapon can start a war, including a world war, but in this multipolar world a world war would spread quickly involving many countries and pitting two great powers or more against each other. All the weapons on this list have the chance of causing escalations in a hurry, so let's kick this off with a much feared weapon that's all the scarier because it could be anywhere. Number 10. The Dirty Bomb Terrorism has been a problem around the world for decades, with rogue agents of militant groups striking against their enemies by setting off bombs or opening fire in crowded locations. These are rarely fully traceable to any state actor, with rogue groups like Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Hamas, the provisional IRA, and others having enough deniability to not bring the full force of a government down on the country that they're supporting, usually. That wasn't the case when Al-Qaeda struck the United States in 2001, as the ensuing anger kicked off not one but two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that raged for two decades in one case. But what if the next terror attack was worse? Dirty bombs are one of the most feared weapons in any terror army's potential arsenal because the damage they cause can last far longer than the explosion. These radiological dispersal devices are usually standard bombs but contaminated with enough radioactive material to spread poisonous radioactive material over an area and contaminate it for a long time. In low-yield cases like this, which might be the most common type for freelance terrorists to be able to assemble, the symptoms might not be obvious at first and would only become clear when many people are contaminated and sickened after the fact. But in a higher-yield device, not only could a dirty bomb kill many people, but it could contaminate a chunk of a city for months or even years. And once that happens, all bets are off. The most likely flashpoint for a situation like this might be Iran, as the Islamic Republic has long been accused of funding terrorism around the world. If a dirty bomb goes off in a city in the US or another NATO member and the terrorist is found to have ties to Iran's militant government, that could be the final push for a hawkish government to begin strikes in Iran, especially as fears of Iran getting a nuclear weapon are ramping up again. However, while Iran is largely diplomatically isolated, it does have close allies in China and Russia, especially the latter, for whom it is a key arms supplier. Which could mean a bloody proxy war in the Middle East, and proxy wars always have the chance of turning into a full-fledged global conflict if the two proxies start shooting directly at each other. But the more pressing threat from Iran might be over the skies of Ukraine right now. Number 9. Iranian Drones Russia's war in Ukraine has not been going according to plan, to put it lightly. From Kyiv by April to still fighting over the same 20% of Ukraine Russia seized in the opening days of the war, Russia's been reduced to shelling Kyiv from afar and fighting with brutal human wave attacks that see them losing soldiers en masse. Part of the problem is economic sanctions that have cut them off from weapon supplies and their Cold War era arsenal is running out fast. Few countries are willing to sell Russia weapons for a widely condemned war and even Putin's allies in China have been hedging their bets. Xi Jinping might want to see the West take a black eye, but he's not going to jump in unless he thinks Russia can win. That leaves one country as especially key to the war effort. 
Iran hasn't historically had the closest ties to Russia, but they do have one thing in common – they both hate the United States. Putin and Raisi might also be commiserating on how to put down popular revolts when the people get angry. But whatever the reason, Iran has been very willing to supply Russia with weapons. These include Iranian-made drones, which are designed to be remote-controlled, missile-bearing merchants of death. These drones are fast but vulnerable and are aimed at overwhelming Ukraine's defenses, if not actually striking their target, then causing Ukraine to expend valuable weaponry on fighting them. But they stand a chance of backfiring in a very big way. Drones are remote controlled and that means there needs to be someone on the other side. How is Russia's drone operation program going? No one knows, but given the state of the rest of their military, we're not too optimistic. Ukraine's also bordered by other countries including NATO member Poland and EU candidate Moldova. There have already been friendly fire incidents in the war across the border, but a drone strike in Poland, be it by user error or mechanical misfire, could be the deadliest flashpoint yet in a costly war. An attack on one NATO member is an attack on all. And while NATO would likely accept a Russian apology rather than going to war, Putin's more likely to respond with belligerence, which means all bets are off. But it's not always the aggressor's weapons that could trigger a larger war. Number 8. F-16s Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has not been shy about making requests of NATO for help, and with each Ukrainian victory he's become bolder now asking for long-range weapons that will allow him to take the fight back to Russia. This will allow him to strike at Russian-occupied territories like Crimea and the Donbass, as well as potentially at arms depots and troop deployments within Russia itself. The US has been hesitant to grant these requests for fear of angering Putin, but that resistance seems to be lessening. After all, Putin has been calling every NATO move a potential nuclear escalation, so what's the worry about some planes, right? But these aren't just any planes. The F-16 Fighting Falcon might soon be heading for Ukraine, and this powerhouse fighter jet might just be a game-changer in the war. Designed as an all-weather, multi-role aircraft, it's one of the best tools in the US arsenal. Highly maneuverable and equipped with long-range surface-to-air missiles, a cannon, as well as the capability to carry heavy bombs, it's ideal for air combat, and might just plug the one hole in Ukraine's arsenal. The country's air force has been a weak point, but the F-16 has a good chance at giving Ukraine air superiority over its own territory. The question is, what comes next? Because Ukraine has become increasingly bold about striking back at Russia. According to the laws of war, this is fair game. Ukraine hasn't actively targeted civilian infrastructure the way Russia has, and it's not an escalation to retaliate with an attack on enemy military infrastructure. However, Putin may see it differently. While the most publicized attack within Russian territory was actually by a Russian militia, and the drone attacks on the Kremlin are heavily considered to be a false flag, if US F-16s begin striking Russia regularly, Putin might consider it a direct attack on him by the country that provided them. And then all bets are off. Or he might be bluffing again, but that's why many more cautious military minds are urging the US to hold off on the fighter jets for fear it might escalate the war in Ukraine to a full Russia v NATO conflict. But the most likely flashpoint for US weapons may be half a world away. Number 7. AGM-158 JASM For all of Vladimir Putin's threats of World War III, most analysts believe the potential for a larger war isn't in Europe at all, it's in the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea, where China's been increasingly aggressive. China claims the island nation of Taiwan is its territory, despite Taiwan being independent for over 70 years. It's also encroaching on the Philippines, Vietnam, and other Southeast Asian nations, which has led these countries, plus Japan and South Korea, to form an increasingly tight alliance with the US. As China ramps up war games around Taiwan, the US has unofficially vowed to defend its ally and its incredibly important semiconductor industry, and they're willing to provide the weapons needed. China's proximity to Taiwan means it likely has an early edge in the conflict, and it'll try to encircle and occupy the island before the US can provide aid. But that only works if Taiwan can't defend itself and hold out long enough to get help there. And that might be a lot harder for China to accomplish thanks to a new US-made missile. The JASM is a powerful air-launched cruise missile developed by Lockheed Martin, designed for close-range standoff combat. While it's currently being used by the US, Australia, Finland, and Poland, the US has signed a deal to provide the missile to Taiwan, which will go a long way toward ensuring Taiwan can hold out during those critical early hours. But it may also increase the odds of a global conflict. World wars don't always happen through escalations, sometimes it's a decision, and it seems like this one is the one US may be willing to make. It has repeatedly reiterated its commitment to defending Taiwan, in the face of Chinese aggression, 
And while Europe may not be as willing to follow suit, it's likely the US will have many allies in the region. After all, Japan and South Korea know they could be next if China keeps expanding its sphere of control. And that's why these countries are working together to prevent China from successfully encircling Taiwan by blowing their ships out of the water with some of the best missiles in the world, if need be. And if that first step works out for China, the next step is likely open conflict between the world's two most powerful militaries. Now let's head back to the Middle East, where the path to destruction may be deep underground. Number 6. Secret Nuclear Programs Within a short period after the Second World War, the number of nuclear nations grew rapidly. The US was joined by the Soviet Union and soon afterward by the UK, France, and China, and those countries got together and said, hey, maybe we should just keep it between us, and pass the Non-Proliferation Treaty. It didn't exactly work. Since then, India, Pakistan, North Korea, and allegedly Israel have each developed nuclear weapons, and while sanctions followed, there was no putting that genie back in the bottle. The next country to join in the club might be Iran, whose belligerent leadership has been repeatedly boasting of using those weapons against bitter enemies in nearby Israel. But hold on, because Israel might be able to answer back. It's believed that Israel got nuclear weapons as far back as the 1950s, with seismology studies showing suspicious activity that would correspond with nuclear tests. But because it would have been in violation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, it simply didn't tell anyone. Israel's been very secretive about its nuclear program for more than half a century, but leaks indicate that it has well over 100 nuclear weapons, maybe more than 300, which would put it as one of the largest nuclear powers in the world. Israel has long considered a nuclear Iran to be an existential threat to its security. While it's not believed to have any long-range delivery systems, it is likely to have the capability of responding in kind to an Iranian attack or to strike first. There have been many attempts to preempt the Iranian nuclear program, including a controversial diplomatic deal that was brokered by the Obama administration. However, it fell apart under Obama's successor, who declared the deal to be fake news. Since then, Iran has been enriching uranium again and is believed to be close to having the capability to assemble a bomb. Israel might decide to strike first and target its nuclear infrastructure, which would be a complex and dangerous operation. And with the US closely aligned with Israel, and Russia seeing Iran as a key to its weapons supply plans, any conflict between the two Middle Eastern nations could easily turn into a proxy war that would spread far beyond the region. But sometimes it's not even the weapon, it's the outcome. Number 5. Environmental Warfare A smart military knows you don't just fight in an environment, you can manipulate it to your benefit. This has been especially key in the war in Ukraine, as we saw in the opening days. As Russia was closing in on encircling Kyiv, Ukraine pulled off an extremely risky move, blowing a dam that flooded Russian pontoon bridges, allowing them to hold the city. A year later, Russia copied that move in a far more horrific way, blowing a massive dam in eastern Ukraine, complicating Ukraine's counteroffensive, but at the cost of a massive ecological and humanitarian disaster. This primarily affected the Russian-occupied parts of Ukraine, and the toll of the internationally condemned move may never be fully known. But the problem is, when you mess with nature, you don't know where the mess stops. World War I was defined by the use of chemical weapons, which scarred and killed countless soldiers. However, it also scarred the land, to the point that there are still areas of France that are essentially no-go zones. Unexploded ordnance still litters the battlefield, and the soil was so thoroughly poisoned that nothing grows in some spots. It serves as a living monument to the horror of war and a warning that it should never happen again. But an increasingly desperate Putin might not see it that way. Instead, he may see the ecological disaster of the Kokova Dam collapse as a rare victory in the war, one that he should repeat. After all, if he can't defeat Ukraine on the battlefield, he just may be able to make large swaths of the country uninhabitable. But ecological disasters don't respect borders. Much like in the case of Iranian drones, the biggest risk in this strategy is Ukraine's proximity to other countries including Poland. Poland is close both to Ukraine and Putin's puppet state in Belarus. So far, Putin has relied heavily on attacking Kyiv with missile strikes to no real strategic benefit except to cause the city a lot of pain. If he escalates this, potentially by trying to cause ecological disaster in the region by targeting Ukraine's water or food supply, it could have unintended consequences. What if the effects spill over into Poland, and Poland considers invoking Article 5 as a result? Putin would no doubt argue that he took no direct action against Poland, and as such he isn't responsible, but much like the flow of water, once the drums of war start beating, they're very hard to stop. What could cause a war the fastest? How about a power outage? Imagine you wake up one morning, turn on the lights, and nothing works. TV's out, the microwave's out, you better get on the internet to see what's going on. But that's shut down too. Now it's time to panic. 
That's what it would look like if an electromagnetic pulse went off targeting a country's power grid. The first occurrence of this event was actually natural, the Carrington Event, an intense geomagnetic storm that occurred in 1859 and devastated much of the rudimentary electric infrastructure at the time. Back then, it was an annoyance and a curiosity to be studied, but today it could be a global disaster that would take years for a country to bounce back from. Which naturally meant it was time to develop some weapons that had that power. Electromagnetic bombs were created a long time ago, but they weren't the focus of the weapon, that would be the nuclear blast. Most nuclear bombs cause a pulse that knocks out power to a large area, but that's usually just a side effect that the people would barely notice amid the destruction. However, many countries thought it would be useful to be able to neutralize a country's power grid in a sneak attack without the devastating impact of a nuclear bomb. Electromagnetic bombs, while top secret, are believed to have been designed by several countries, including the US, and could be used as a first strike by a country that wanted to attack a nearby country and wanted to make sure that a larger power couldn't immediately begin. But there are those darn unintended consequences once again. An electromagnetic pulse is a blunt weapon. It wouldn't just knock out the power like a typical power outage where you could still use all cordless devices. It would disrupt just about every major electronic device in the region. That includes emergency medical equipment, traffic lights, even airplanes, which means commercial planes could start falling out of the sky. Even if the bomb itself didn't kill anyone, the odds are the casualties of an immediate EMP blast would be in the thousands if not higher. And it could climb rapidly as the victims struggled to restore power. This would be a deadly attack that would almost definitely provoke a larger war, one that the aggressor would hope would go in their favor thanks to the time advantage. But that's why these same countries might want to go for a more subtle approach. Number 3. Cyber Warfare Could the most important warriors of the coming war not be the soldiers or the pilots or the generals, but the nerds? The vanguard of security and espionage may be housed in top-secret government research facilities, tirelessly hacking away at other countries' firewalls. Spying has been part of the war, both hot and cold, for centuries, and in the past it was a high-risk endeavor. Spies had little choice but to go behind enemy lines to get vital documents, and would often face torture and a firing squad if they were caught. It was lower risk but harder to try to turn a citizen of the country you were spying on. However, now countries are able to get information from within another country's classified files without ever leaving their borders. And these spies might be aiming to do far more than just gather intel. The US has reportedly accused China of spying on its government websites, a charge China has denied. The odds are both countries spy on each other, and on their allies as well. However, cyber warfare has gone far beyond simple intelligence gathering, and countries might be looking to scam artists for inspiration. One of the most nefarious techniques used by criminals in recent years has been ransomware, hacking websites and computer systems and locking them until an untraceable cryptocurrency payment is delivered. Many hospital networks have been forced to pay the fee to get their systems back online. A hostile government could easily apply the same tactic to key government or military systems with proper preparation. But it may just be a case of delaying the inevitable. For instance, if China was to hack the US's communication systems to cut off intelligence and keep the US from responding as they attack Taiwan, would the US get their systems back online, see that China blockaded Taiwan and then simply say, you got us, good game? Or would they be more likely to consider the cyber attack an act of war itself and be even more motivated to respond and break the blockade? The cyber warfare specialists may have escalated the hacking game to the point that they can be a force to be reckoned with in any major conflict, but they can't account for one thing. Eventually everything's going to be back online and then all bets are off. But the biggest X factor in the world's weapon stores has been hanging there for decades. Number 2. Russia's Nuclear Arsenal There are only a few constants in life. Death, taxes, and Vladimir Putin threatening the use of nuclear weapons. Ever since the war in Ukraine began, Putin's belligerence in response to any aid provided to Ukraine has been intended to scare off the West. But it hasn't worked, and with every red line that NATO breezes past with no response, more and more people consider his nuclear threats to be a whole lot of hot air. However, as the war grows closer to Russia and slips further away from his control, Putin clearly wants everyone to see him as a wild card who may decide to let slip the dogs of war. After all, Putin controls the largest nuclear arsenal in the world. Or does he? That's the rub, because Russia definitely does have the largest number of nuclear missiles in the world, a staggering total of 5,889 at last count, more than enough to destroy the world multiple times over. This is way down from the country's peak of 45,000 during the Cold War, but it's more than enough to power a nuclear triad that's capable of hitting anywhere in the world. 
Putin wants to maintain an aura of strategic ambiguity. Not only does he repeatedly threaten to use them if Russia is attacked, but Russia is also only one of a few nuclear powers to not have a no-first-strike policy. That means Russia reserves the right to use nuclear weapons to resolve a conventional war, and what that trigger is no one knows. But in reality, Putin's arsenal might be much smaller. Putin's nuclear stockpile is huge, but it's almost entirely Cold War-era weapons, and many of them spent a long time in other countries like Kazakhstan or Ukraine. No one is sure how many of them were maintained well enough to still be in working order. While Russia has boasted of developing new weapons, they haven't made much progress, and recent missile tests saw failures. No one knows which of the weapons would hit their target, with some possibly even blowing up on the launch pad, probably taking Putin with them. That makes the Russian nuclear arsenal the world's biggest game of Russian roulette. But no one's willing to take that one-sixth chance lightly. And that's exactly the sort of Damocles Putin is hoping works in his favor when he makes his threat. But no weapon is more dangerous and unpredictable than this final one, because it's alive. Number 1. Bioweapons it was 2019 when the world first saw a mysterious new virus spreading around Wuhan. It took just a few months for the virus to spread from China to the rest of the world. As COVID-19 killed millions around the world, rumors spread just as fast about where it came from. The prevailing theory was that it mutated from an animal and was spread to humans in an exotic meat market. But other theories circled around biological research labs in Wuhan, ones that might have been partially funded and co-run by the US. Conspiracy theories ran wild, with some blaming China, others blaming the US. Was COVID-19 a bioweapon? It's not likely. It hit every country equally and wasn't nearly deadly enough to be an effective targeted weapon. But future cases may not be so lucky. The prevailing theory of a lab leak now centers around what's known as gain-of-function research, where scientists genetically alter an organism in ways that make it more effective. This can boost its reproductive rate, infectiousness, or transmissibility. It can even make it able to infect different hosts, which could make an animal virus able to infect humans. This is usually done to better understand viruses and how they would interact with humans, but it's also considered very risky. After all, making a virus stronger could open Pandora's box, and once that's open, there's no closing it. And if things get bad enough, it could provoke the next great war. COVID-19 certainly seemed to drive a lot of people out of their minds, as anyone who argued over a mask or tried to get toilet paper in March 2020 found out. But the ambiguity of the situation kept things from spiraling out of control. We might never know just how it began, but what happens in the future if a virus leaks or is deliberately released from a lab and causes a far deadlier pandemic? It's unlikely cooler heads will prevail, and the outcome of that conflict may cause casualties that would dwarf the actual virus. The question now becomes, what does Ukraine need to stop Vladimir Putin and his bloodthirsty generals from massacring the Ukrainian people? The short answer is more firepower, but there is a more strategic approach that leaders of the country have in mind. Given a handful of several specific weapons, Ukraine will be able to hold the Russian war machine at bay, which would deal a massive blow to Putin. Priority number one for Ukraine is to secure more air defense systems. Throughout the war, and especially in recent weeks, Russia has been launching missiles, air raids, and drones to disrupt Ukrainian infrastructure. The horrible part is, these threats from the sky are causing civilian casualties in many regions around the country. From the beginning of this war, the Russian military made it clear they did not care how many Ukrainian citizens died as they advanced across their lands. All that mattered was that Russia captured Ukraine at all costs, and they couldn't even do that. Artillery, missiles, and kamikaze drones have all taken the lives of innocent civilians, and this pattern doesn't seem likely to stop anytime soon. The key weapon that Ukraine needs right now to prepare for the harsh winter ahead and the next phase of the war is surface-to-air defense missiles. For most of the war, Ukrainian forces have been able to hold strategic locations and deal massive amounts of damage to the Russian military. In the last few months, Russian forces have pulled back from the front lines to regroup and come up with new strategies as to how to defeat the Ukrainian military. Russia's new plan of attack now seems to be hit the targets from afar. It's probable that Russian military leaders have been harshly reprimanded by Putin and his inner circle for the loss of men and the inability of their troops to take key strategic positions. This embarrassment has led to many top military officials being replaced. Russia's current strategy is focused on air-based attacks, such as missile and drone strikes, to disrupt everyday life in Ukraine even more than this conflict has already done. Knowing this, Ukrainian officials are pleading with NATO to send them more air defense weapons. Currently, the Ukrainian government is planning to receive two national advanced surface-to-air missile systems made by Raytheon, a multinational aerospace and defense conglomerate with headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. 
It's likely these NASMs will be deployed in major cities such as Kyiv to protect them from Russian air attacks. The NASMs are capable of tracking, targeting, and destroying drones, missiles, and helicopters. This is exactly what Ukraine needs, as missiles and drones are the biggest threat they face in this next stage of the war. The NASMs use short to mid-range missiles to destroy enemy threats to the surrounding area. What this means is that these weapons are purely for defensive purposes and cannot be used by Ukraine to launch an attack against Russia. As the next stage of the war continues in the coming months, Ukraine is focused on protecting its major cities and the civilians living in them from Russian threats. But having two NASMs is not nearly enough to combat the onslaught of missiles and drones that Russia will be firing over the course of the coming winter. This is why Ukraine is asking for more surface-to-air weapons to help them protect their citizens and military assets. It'd be one thing if Russia was only targeting Ukrainian military installations, but they're not. Missiles and drones are being used to disrupt the Ukrainian power grid and energy infrastructure. This obviously hurts the army, but it also is leading to more suffering amongst the general population, which results in more civilian casualties. Rogue missiles end up demolishing buildings, and without power during the winter, entire families could freeze to death. Ukraine doesn't need surface-to-air just to win the war, they need it to save lives. As an alternative to the Raytheon National Advanced Surface-to-Air Missile System, Ukraine is taking an old-school approach to dealing with Russian air attacks. Since the beginning of the war, Ukraine has been using the S-300 missile system. The S-300 is a Soviet-era long-range surface-to-air missile system that was designed to protect military installations from enemy aircraft. Unfortunately, there are a few problems with the S-300. The first is the fact that it's from the Soviet era, meaning it's outdated, and finding replacement parts is incredibly hard. In fact, some members of NATO have been trying to find spare parts or fabricate the most needed pieces of the S-300 system to help Ukraine keep them working. Also, since they were designed and built decades ago, the S-300s are not the most attractive or effective weapons. And even though they are better than nothing, it's only a matter of time before Ukraine will need a better option for protecting its skies from incoming Russian threats. The second problem with the S-300 system is that it's mainly only effective against aircraft and helicopters. Russia is definitely using aircraft to bomb and attack Ukrainian forces, but they're not the main threat that Ukraine will face in the coming months. Russia will likely be dialing back everything except missile and drone strikes until they feel their forces can push forward and actually be somewhat successful in a fight against the Ukrainian army. The S-300 is not as effective against missiles or drones as they are against much larger targets. Therefore, even if Ukraine gets the parts they need to maintain these Soviet-era ground-to-air systems, it won't make a huge difference in the coming months. This is why Ukraine has made it clear that what they need right now are more advanced surface-to-air systems. The only problem is these weapons are in short supply, and no one's willing to give them up at the moment. Ukrainian military officials have been asking for Patriot missile defense systems for months. The MIM-104 Patriot is a surface-to-air missile system that has the capability of shooting down everything from planes to missiles. It's also made by Raytheon but has a much more sophisticated radar and tracking system than the National Advanced Surface-to-Air Missile. What this means is that the MIM-104 Patriot is more effective and versatile, which is exactly what Ukraine is looking for. The MIM-104 Patriot has proven to be a deadly air defense system in the Persian Gulf War, where it intercepted and destroyed no less than 40 Iraqi Scud missiles. It has also successfully shot down aircraft and UAVs while being used by the Israeli military. Basically, there is no weapon that Ukraine needs more right now than the MIM-104 Patriot. They know that the next phase of the war will be focused on disrupting their infrastructure and demoralizing their citizens through airstrikes. The Patriot system would offer protection for both civilians and military assets. The reason these weapons aren't being sent to Ukraine is that there are just not that many Patriot air defense systems currently available. In fact, these systems are the most deployed units in the U.S. Army. Many of these weapons are being used as protective countermeasures in other parts of the world or are just too valuable for any nation to give up, which is why Ukraine can't seem to get their hands on one, even though they desperately need them. The most horrifying aspect of the Russian air attacks comes from the kamikaze drones. Currently, Russia is using the Sahed-136 UAVs made by an Iranian company named Sahed Aviation Industries. These drones are built to be flown directly into targets to detonate on impact. This should allow for precise targeting, but even still, these kamikaze drones have led to dozens of civilian deaths. The Shahed-136 operates by launching multiple drones from Iraq all at once to overwhelm air defenses. This is precisely why Ukraine needs an advanced air defense system like the MIM-104 Patriot. Ukraine leaders have made it very clear these kamikaze drones continue to be a threat they cannot deal with, 
using their current anti-air technology. And until they can figure out a way to stop Russian drones and missiles from impacting power stations and infrastructure within towns and cities, civilians will continue to suffer. To effectively fight Russia in the next phase of the war, Ukraine needs air defense systems, but that's not all. Air defenses will definitely play a major role in the coming months, but if Ukraine's going to keep Russia from pushing further into their country, they also need more artillery and tanks. Since Russian troops fell back to territory they already had control of in the Donbass region of Ukraine, there's been a lull in ground incursions for the time being. Russia needed to regroup and replenish its losses before beginning a new offensive. However, there's no way that Putin's going to give up his sadistic dream of incorporating Ukraine into a new Russian empire, which means that ground-based fighting will resume eventually. Ukrainian officials know this, which is why they're also asking for more artillery and ammunition from NATO. The amount of artillery shells fired in the war in Ukraine is staggering. NATO reports that its forces would fire around 300 artillery rounds in a day during intense fighting in Afghanistan. Ukraine is firing thousands of rounds every single day. Think about how crazy that is. Unfortunately, the sheer magnitude of artillery shells being used means that Ukraine is quickly running out. When the fighting in the Donbass region of Ukraine was at its height, Ukraine was firing somewhere between six and 7,000 artillery rounds a day. To be fair, Russia was firing somewhere around 40 to 50,000 rounds daily, which is on a whole other level. What this means for Ukraine is that it constantly needs more artillery shells. Unfortunately, no country in the world is producing enough artillery rounds to keep up with how many are being used in the war. NATO has seriously considered purchasing old factories in the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Bulgaria to ramp up the production of artillery rounds so they can send them to Ukraine. Like with the other air defense systems, the Ukrainian artillery mostly consists of Soviet-era cannons. This means the factories and countries which were once part of the Soviet Union are perfect for meeting Ukraine's needs. However, getting these facilities up and running would take a lot of time and money, which has led many to dismiss the option. The fact remains, Ukraine will need more artillery rounds in the future. Although, if they had it their way, they'd ask for something that packs a little more punch. Along with more artillery, Ukraine also needs more tanks. Again, it seems like the strategy right now for Russia is to hang back and fire missiles and drones at Ukrainian forces, but this will not last forever. Eventually, Russia will once again try to capture the rest of Ukraine, and the key to stopping them could be tanks and armored vehicles. For this next phase of the war, Ukraine is hoping to get their hands on German Leopard tanks, or some of the 3000 M1 Abrams tanks that the United States has in reserve storage. Either one of these tanks would be able to decimate Russian armored divisions as they're far superior to anything the Russians have in large numbers. But it's not just tanks that Ukrainian forces need, they also require more vehicles to allow for armored mobility. We already know how successful Ukrainian troops have been at repelling and pushing back Russian tanks. Even without having battalions of their own tanks, Ukraine has managed to destroy over 700 Russian tanks, forcing them to bring 50-year-old T-62s out of retirement. This is not only embarrassing for Russia, but also shows just how resilient Ukrainian troops are. Now, imagine if they had armored transports like the Bradley Fighting Vehicle to rapidly move soldiers from one location to another while also having state-of-the-art tanks to provide supporting fire. It is this scenario that Ukrainian military leaders are hoping to achieve. They firmly believe that if NATO provides their forces with tanks and armored vehicles, the next stage of the war won't be a Russian advance but a Ukrainian one. Suppose Ukraine is given the right equipment to allow its troops to be protected while also being highly mobile. In that case, some military officials think their forces could push the Russian military out of occupied regions of the country and even secure their border. To be fair, even without the weapons and aid they've been asking for for months, Ukraine has still managed to force a Russian retreat. Imagine what they could do if they were properly armed and had the vehicles and defense systems to level the playing field. It may seem unbelievable, but with the way Ukraine has embarrassed the Russian army time and time again, it's not out of the realm of possibility that with a little help from the rest of the world, they could take back their country. Ukraine has a long wish list of weapons that would help them defeat the Russians, but they've made it clear that air defense systems, artillery, ammunition, and tanks, along with armored vehicles, are the key to fighting in the next stage of the war. However, given the option, there are a few other weapons Ukraine would be happy to get their hands on. The Ukrainian military has asked for long-range surface-to-surface missiles, called MGM-104 Army Tactical Missile Systems, or ATACMS. NATO is hesitant to deliver these types of missiles because it would allow Ukraine to hit targets within Russia. You might think all's fair in war, and Ukraine should have the option to strike at the heart of its enemy, but even the most staunch supporters of Ukraine are hesitant to give them this capability. The reason why has to do with retaliation by Russia. 
If Ukraine starts targeting locations within Russia, NATO is afraid it'll escalate the war to a new level. These long-range attacks could lead to Russia doing something drastic, like using nuclear weapons. If this were to happen, it could lead to a global catastrophe. Ukraine also has asked for fighter jets such as the United States F-16 or Sweden's Saab Gripen to combat Russia's current air superiority. Both of these aircraft are incredibly expensive and neither country is willing to supply the Ukrainian Air Force with them just yet. NATO has made countless excuses as to why they haven't delivered Ukraine the weapons they need, key deliveries have been delayed, and long wait times for new parts are indirectly leading to more Ukrainian deaths. Even in the face of adversity, the Ukrainian people have remained strong. NATO suggested the best thing they can do for Ukraine is help them build facilities to make their own weapons. This might have been a good idea several years ago when it was clear Russia was becoming more and more aggressive and that Ukraine would be a target of a future invasion, but now it's too late. Whether they want to admit it or not, NATO countries are afraid of Russia. They're worried that the oil and natural resources it controls will stop flowing, which it has. But they're also terrified that if they intervene, Putin will use his nuclear capabilities. These are valid concerns, but NATO should now be taking decisive action to help Ukraine and not try to brainstorm ways to hide their involvement in the conflict. Even though Russia has fallen back, it doesn't mean the war is over, not even close. This is why Ukraine is planning ahead and asking for more military support in the form of air defense and armored vehicles. However, there are other things Ukraine desperately needs, and surprisingly, they're not weapons at all. Instead, Ukraine is asking for things that'll save the lives of its people. Ukraine knows that the coming months will be incredibly difficult, as more kamikaze drones are flown into power stations and missiles destroy buildings. Ukraine needs vehicles and resources to provide aid to their people. This is why they've asked for ambulances, generators, and medical equipment. Technically, none of these things are weapons, but it should be noted that the more Ukrainian citizens make it through the harsh winter, the more angry people Russia will have to deal with when spring comes around, and the resilience of the general population will only make Ukrainian soldiers fight harder. The military needs of Ukraine should not be overlooked. However, it's the people in the country that are suffering the most. If nothing else, nations around the world should be sending support in ways that'll help save lives. The only way Ukraine can succeed in the next stage of the war is if they have people who can continue to fight. The longer the war lasts, the less faith the Russian people will have in Putin. The Russian military has lost already tens of thousands of men to the Ukrainian army. At the same time, huge numbers of Russians are either deserting or fleeing the country. With each day that passes without a victory, the people of Russia question the current leadership more and more. Sending Ukraine the equipment they need could bring Russia to its knees. It's highly unlikely that Putin will be overthrown by a coup or a popular revolt due to a number of contingencies he's put in place. However, if the protests continue and Russian soldiers become more and more frustrated and afraid, it's only a matter of time before Ukrainian forces will gain the upper hand and take back the territory that has been invaded. This is why the nations of NATO need to provide Ukraine with the weapons and resources they need to prepare for the next stage of war. Since Russia invaded Ukraine back in February, the US has sent a literal mountain of lethal aid to the Ukrainian military. While support has largely gone to the Ukrainian army, the country's air force and navy have also gotten a huge helping hand, totaling almost $20 billion as of November 2022. Let's take a look at some of the weapon systems the US has sent to Ukraine so far. The war has frequently proven that being part of a tank crew is the most dangerous job on the battlefield. And for a good reason, the US has sent tons of anti-tank weaponry to Ukraine, with thousands of armored vehicles flooding the Ukrainian countryside and little armor to face the Russians, the Ukrainian military needed a big helping hand to deal with them. One of the most famous anti-tank weapons is the Javelin. The Javelin anti-armor missile system has been a mainstay of US forces since the mid-1990s. Part of the reason it's so effective is due to its ability to be a fire-and-forget weapon while also attacking its target from the top down. Because it is fire-and-forget, the operator can quickly run away once the missile leaves the tube to avoid enemy counterfire. This is because the missile will continue tracking the target once it's locked onto it. The top-down attack feature allows the operator to attack the most vulnerable part of a tank, its top armor. Most tanks have their heaviest armor up front, followed by the sides, rear, and lastly the underbelly and top of the tank. Because the top is much weaker, a strong attack there will likely cause a catastrophic kill. A catastrophic kill is when the entire tank blows up and is completely destroyed rather than just being damaged, meaning enemy forces would be able to repair it later on. These attack platforms have proven themselves to be very effective, so the US military has sent over 8,500 of them to Ukraine. Now it's important to note that it's unclear if 8,500 means CLUs or disposable missile tubes. This is important because the brains of the Javelin is the Command Launch Unit or CLU. 
This attaches to a disposable missile tube that when combined makes the weapon system up. Regardless, Ukraine has gotten a ton of these. The US has not only been sending javelins but also 38,000 other anti-armor systems. While it's unclear what these could be, more likely these are AT-4 rockets used as the replacement to the Vietnam-era law for decades. The AT-4 is a mainstay of man-portable anti-armor firepower. Its simple use-it-and-lose-it design makes it a simple but effective weapon system for engaging light-armored vehicles, buildings, bunkers, and anything else a soldier needs to blow up from a distance. While AT-4s are not a good alternative to javelins for taking out tanks, they are a great force multiplier for the hundreds of thousands of citizen soldiers Ukraine has recruited into its National Guard. These troops were being thrown into combat, often without a lot of training, at the beginning of the war. Putting this simple but effective weapon system in their hands makes them a force multiplier and boosts their confidence on the battlefield. Another great confidence booster has been the huge amount of artillery and artillery shells the US has sent over. After Ukraine repulsed the initial invasion and the Russians pivoted to eastern Ukraine, the war became a war of artillery. Numerous observers have noted that the Russian army blasts their artillery day and night without end. On the other hand, Ukrainian artillery has been literally outgunned by both number of guns and the amount of ammunition each one could fire. With Ukrainian troops suffering almost constant bombardment, the US decided to give them some tools to help even the playing field. As part of its comprehensive aid package, the US has sent 142 155mm guns and 36 105mm guns along with over a million shells to feed them. The US sent more heavy artillery systems because the Ukrainians needed longer range artillery. Since older Soviet artillery systems did not have the range of modern Russian equipment, the Russians could move outside the effective range of those systems and blast away at them. With heavy American artillery, Russian guns can no longer shoot away with impunity, since now they risk counterfire from a donated M777 howitzer. Another artillery system that's been in the news lately has been the 38 high mobility artillery rocket systems donated to Ukraine. These systems, known as HIMARS for short, are revolutionary weapons. Link 16 is one of the most common data links that the US military uses to send and receive encrypted data over a secure pathway. It's unbreakable and allows a free flow of communication without fear of being knocked out or intercepted. While mostly a Navy system, other branches have started using it like the Marine Corps. This is important because the HIMARS was the first Link-16 capable mobile rocket system the US ever built. This matters because Ukrainian defenders on the land, sea, or air who are up link can send data to the firing units. Instead of a cumbersome patchwork of different networks and communication paths between other units or branches, Link-16 allows multiple units over a wide area to build a near instantaneous fire control solution. With that data, the HIMARS system can attack Russian troops anytime, anywhere, in real time within its range. With the huge number of troops involved, the US also sent a ton of ammunition to the Ukrainian army. Since February, the US has sent over 104 million rounds of small arms ammunition. As we've talked about before, the Ukrainians use a wide range of weapons dating back to World War II to more modern weapons we're used to seeing on a 21st century battlefield. We should be clear that most World War II weapons go to National Guard units, the bulk of their military is armed with modern equipment. The breakdown of the ammunition types is unclear. Most likely it's 7.62 by 39 and 5.45 by 39, which are the calibers for AK-47s and AK-74s respectively. These two rifles make up the bulk of the current small arms inventory of Ukraine, so these are the most likely calibers. Other Soviet ammunition types used for their machine guns have likely come from Eastern European stocks. But the US did have large inventories of arms and ammo for the Afghan army, which is where our next weapon systems come from. Among the mix of ordnance, the US sent 20 Mi-17 Hind attack helicopters to the Ukrainian Air Force. The last time we checked, this was still a Russian-made attack helicopter. It ended up in the US inventory because the US purchased a bunch of these for the Afghan military. These were being refurbished in the United States, but after the fall of Afghanistan to the Taliban government, these helicopters were no longer needed, so the US sent them back to Ukraine. This is the perfect solution for this seemingly useless surplus of helicopters, as many Ukrainian helicopter pilots trained on similar Soviet legacy platforms. This is the main reason why the US has not flooded Ukraine with F-35s and other aircraft, because it would take years to train Ukrainian pilots to fly them. Another interesting weapon the US has sent includes 45 T-72B main battle tanks. While this has been a mainstay on the Ukrainian and Russian side, the US has never fielded this legacy Soviet gear. And while you might think the US brought some home from its two invasions of Iraq, you'd be mistaken. As part of a deal with Eastern European countries to empty their Soviet stocks and receive Western equipment, the Czech Republic donated its reserve tanks to Ukraine. 
However, these tanks had not been retrofitted with modern gun sights, night vision, or fire control computers. These upgrades and many more had to be done in the Netherlands before shipping them to Ukraine. In total, the Czechs donated 90 tanks to be refurbished and the US funded half the cost, which gives the figure of 45 T-72s. Ukrainian air defenses have also gotten a laundry list of early Christmas presents. Probably the most potent air defense system the US has sent has been eight National Advanced Surface-to-Air Missile Systems. NASMs are arguably the world's most potent ballistic missile defense system. Due to their high cost, the US only has a select few of these guarding the skies over Washington, D.C., and there's a reason why they cost so much. It doesn't matter how high, low, or fast a missile is, the NASMs can shoot it down. U.S. Air Force testing proved it was the best anti-air defense system the service had ever operated. Gifting these to Ukraine has been a blessing since, during their first day in action, the NASMs fired 10 missiles and brought down 10 Russian ballistic missiles. Another equally deadly but less sexy anti-air system is the good old-fashioned Stinger missile. This weapon system has resulted in Russian service members seeing their helicopters and aircraft knocked out of the sky at an alarming rate. In fact, Russia has lost so many aircraft that the fear of losing many more has rendered the Russian Air Force combat ineffective in Ukraine. This is because the US has sent over 1,600 Stinger missiles. Because of this, any bush, building, or tree could turn one of Russia's prized fighter planes into scrap metal. The US has not forgotten about the Ukrainian Navy. Arguably, the most shocking part about this war is the fact that Ukraine is beating the world's third largest navy without a navy. After the Russians illegally annexed Crimea, they seized the bulk of the Ukrainian Navy. Once the invasion started, the remaining ships in the Mykolaiv region were scuttled by their crews to prevent their capture by the rapidly advancing Russian army. Now, totally without a navy, Ukraine has still managed to punch back through the use of long-range ballistic missiles. In March, the Ukrainians damaged or sunk three Russian amphibious ships in port. In April, they sunk the Russian flagship Moskva with Neptune anti-ship missiles. While the US provided neither of these weapons, the US has provided two Harpoon anti-ship missile batteries that could be used. The US also sent over 58 coastal patrol boats. These are likely the now-retired Mark VI patrol craft serving the waterways of Iraq and the Arabian Gulf. These potent attack craft can move fast and punch well above their weight. But what is more interesting than that are the unmanned surface vessels. In the DoD report, there's a small section that lists an undefined number of unmanned coastal defense vessels. Currently, the US Navy does not employ any unmanned surface craft in its fleet. However, the Navy has been experimenting with them for years. Perhaps wanting to test out what they could really do, the US donated what they have developed so far to Ukraine. If they have, these craft might have already been used in combat. Back in October, unmanned surface vessels attacked the Russian fleet inside its home port of Sevastopol. The new Russian flagship and a minesweeper were damaged by the suicide boats. Ukraine never admitted where they'd gotten these attack craft from, but they were likely of US origin. All the items mentioned in this video are just a tiny part of the vast amounts of weapons and equipment sent by the US to Ukraine. We've not even touched on the huge number of different UAVs, other anti-air defenses, and radar systems. We also have yet to discuss the enormous numbers of mundane but equally important equipment like mobile hospitals, generators, body armor, and light armored vehicles. So watch out for another video explaining part 2 of US aid to Ukraine. By the time you see this video, the Ukraine spring or summer offensive should have begun, but the question on everyone's lips for the last six months of the war has been, what's next? There's a tendency to think that everything hinges on the coming offensive, but the truth is, no matter what happens, the war is unlikely to end this year. While most people hope the coming offensive is successful, even a complete failure won't be enough to end Ukraine's military resistance. And barring a complete internal collapse of the Russian military, another route similar to that suffered in the fall of 2022 also won't be enough to end Russian occupation. In preparation for this offensive, Ukraine has pulled an unknown but significant amount of troops from the front lines. This is why for months there has been little movement on the front, as tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers, artillerymen, and tankers were all pulled to the rear areas or sent out of the country to train for the coming offensive. Famously, a month ago, a video was released of British soldiers providing an honor guard for departing Ukrainian soldiers who had just wrapped up months of training. The UK, Poland, and other NATO nations have been hosting Ukrainian crews training for the coming offensive. Accelerated training on the Leopard 2 tank has been a priority, but training on new 155mm howitzers, multiple launch rocket systems, and Patriot air defense systems have all been ongoing for months. A vanguard force of an unknown number has been training under NATO instruction for months, with the UK, Finland, New Zealand, Canada, the US, the Netherlands, Denmark, and the Baltic countries all sending instructors to help prepare the troops for the task to come. 
Ukraine has opted to fight a defensive war through the winter of 2022 into the spring of this year, making almost no new gains and simply holding what it took back in the fall. But this was a big gamble, with tens of thousands of troops pulled off their front lines for specialist training. Ukraine has invested big into the coming offensive, and luckily for it, its frontline troops have largely held their positions against the Russian onslaught. The Battle of Bakhmut, which has now been raging for 10 months, has been a strategic boondoggle for the Russians and absolute godsend to the Ukrainians. Many have criticized Ukraine for holding a strategically worthless city, even as they criticized the Russians for expending as many as 100,000 men attempting to take it over the better part of a year. News reports ran stories for months of U.S. generals advising the Ukrainians to pull out and of President and Zelensky refusing to. However, it's only now that we've learned just how devastating a toll Ukraine has exacted on Russia for a completely strategically worthless village, with an estimated 100,000 dead and wounded in this one battle alone. Ukraine has suffered as well, though its estimates are far lower given that they were on the defense, with about 15,000 to 20,000 killed, and all has not gone according to plan. Through intense pressure and the sacrifice of thousands of Wagner prisoner recruits used in human wave attacks, Russia has managed to close the vice around Bakhmut while taking a huge toll on Ukrainian forces. The situation was so dire that Ukraine was forced to pull some of its elite special forces training for the coming offensive to reinforce Bakhmut and beat back a Russian flanking attack. These were forces that Ukraine was hoping to keep fresh and fighting fit to be used when it came time to attack, and it was forced instead to dedicate them to Bakhmut or suffer an encirclement. But Bakhmut has served to focus Russian efforts across the east, allowing Ukraine to concentrate defenses there and freeing up its best forces to undergo months of training. While it's been a meat grinder for both sides, history will almost certainly prove Ukraine the winner, if simply because it managed to completely exhaust Russian forces over months of fighting. And even now, reports from Bakhmut are coming in, which might hint at what's to come. Early in May, Wagner Group's Prigozhin warned that due to the Russian Ministry of Defense cutting off his troops from supplies, he was going to pull out of his positions. For months now, the Russian MOD has played a cat and mouse game with Prigozhin, with neither side having much love for the other. It all comes down to a rivalry between Prigozhin and his private military company and the Minister of Defense Sergei Shoigu and the Russian military he oversees. Putin has kept both jostling for his favor at each other's throats, the way any good good dictator sows chaos amongst his subordinates to prevent them from banding together against him. But the personal drama has led to open firefights between the two groups and now a supply embargo, leaving Wagner forces without ammunition or shells needed to keep fighting. There's a strong possibility that Shoigu had purposely cut Wagner off right before the PMC took the whole of Bakhmut, as now Ukraine is hanging on to only the very western outskirts of it. Perhaps Shoigu wishes to take Bakhmut with a regular Russian military in order to deny Prigozhin the prize he's been fighting over for nearly a year. This would not be unheard of, given that the Russian MOD took credit for the capture of Soledar earlier this year, despite it having been Wagner who did most of the fighting. The move drew a litany of protests from Prigozhin, who began to openly criticize the MOD and Shoigu himself via social media in what would be tantamount to sedition in any other government. Indeed, the Russian army, which holds the flanks around Bakhmut, have been making slow gains in an attempted encirclement. If they were to succeed and close the pincer around Bakhmut, the army could claim victory and once more leave Prigozhin out in the cold. Prigozhin might have seen this coming, as he's now announced that he was considering pulling Wagner out of the war completely multiple times, with the most recent threat to drawing condemnation from Russian generals who said that Wagner abandoning his positions would be punishable as treason. Prigozhin warned that on May 10th he would leave his positions unless his forces were immediately resupplied. Taking the threat seriously, the Russian army opened up its stockpiles, then promptly shut them back up again, prompting a new round of protests on May 9th. This infighting may be what decides how the war plays out next. Russian regular forces may be attempting to close the vice on Bakhmut, but on May 8th the news broke that the Russians were in retreat across parts of the southern sector as Ukraine forces counterattacked. While since there's been no sign that this was the promised theater-wide counterattack, it's speculated that Russian forces might have feared it was. They've known for months that Ukraine was massing for a counterattack, and remember the massive rout suffered in the north and the fall of Kherson. Western influence and psyops have also been targeting Russians both at home and on the front, and there's speculation that at least some Russian troops may have been breaking and running from fear of being caught up in a massive attack powered by Western tanks and infantry fighting vehicles. The gains have been small, but they have effectively stopped any attempt to surround Bakhmut and brought the few thousand Ukrainians still defending the city a bit more breathing room. However, the breaking and running of Russian troops could be emblematic of just how poorly Russian forces are prepared for the coming offensive.
Ukraine has not been the only one preparing for a coming attack. Russia too has been doing what it could to prepare to defend what it's taken. Miles upon miles of trenches, dragon's teeth, and minefields have been laid out to stop or slow Ukrainian attacks. Leaked intelligence shows the Russians have also been organizing special task forces to take on Western tanks when they make their appearance. And this might be the smartest thing Russia has done all war, which is setting a pretty low bar. The world is waiting with bated breath to see Ukraine attack Russian forces with Western Leopard 2s, Bradley IFVs, and eventually Abrams main battle tanks. Much has been made about the capabilities of these vehicles versus their Russian counterparts, and for the most part the assessments are true. This has created a sort of global hype though, and Ukraine won't just be fighting for its territory when it throws Western tanks into the battle, it'll be fighting for public support. Russia knows many Westerners oppose the sending of tanks and heavy IFVs, and they have expended great efforts to scare the West into ceasing armed supplies to Ukraine via threats of nukes and other fantastical terror scenarios. If Russia can use special task forces to destroy Ukrainian-operated Western tanks, it could prove to many in the West that it's fruitless to continue sending large amounts of very expensive equipment. Likewise, Russia also knows that its own troops are scared shitless of the capabilities of Western equipment, and destroying dozens of Leopard 2s could do miracles for the ever-dwindling Russian morale. Likewise, runaway success for Ukraine on the backs of American Bradleys and German Leopard 2s could turn Russia's significant morale problem into a full-blown crisis. There's few Russians who don't remember the performance of Western hardware against the same Soviet equipment they're now operating in Desert Storm. Russia's military is simply too large to be defeated in a single, even wildly successful counterattack. But a morale crisis could spell the doom of Russia's war efforts. It's happened before, with massive mutinies rocking the Russian imperial military in World War I and leading to revolution. Putin's special Western tank killer forces might not be fighting for the future of the war, but for Putin's personal future as well. Ukraine has been well equipped for the coming battle, including American M58 Mikliks for handling Russian minefields. These mine-clearing charges shoot out a line of explosives a few hundred meters long, then detonate to create a clear lane for tanks to advance. Ukraine has also been provided with the engineering vehicles necessary to clear paths for heavy vehicles through thick Russian minefields and destroy Dragon's Teeth and other anti-tank fortifications. America's most senior generals have commented that they are satisfied that Ukraine has all it needs for the coming offensive. In all likelihood, the offensive will take place near Zaporizhia, as Ukraine's best move would be to punch through the middle of Russian lines in order to reach Mariupol and sever Russia's southern forces from resupply. However, recently Ukraine has been fighting small skirmishes along islands on the Dnipro, pushing Russian forces off of them. A nationwide call for life vests and small boats has led to many speculating that Ukraine might surprise everyone and launch an offensive directly across the Dnipro. However, it's incredibly unlikely Ukraine would opt to do this as it would be very difficult to move heavy equipment across the river. Russian sources have speculated that Ukraine may attack in the north and into Russia itself, taking Belgorod prompting a small panic in the Russian border region. However, this is incredibly unlikely, as President Zelensky has repeatedly stated he has no plan to take even an inch of Russian territory. This is also unlikely because doing so would seriously anger Ukraine's NATO partners, who don't want to give Russia any reason to escalate the war to the nuclear threshold. It would also sour the opinion of some in the West, and public opinion is all important to the continued resupply of Ukrainian forces. And resupply is the name of the game, because barring a miracle, Ukraine's coming offensive won't end the war. Instead, it'll eat up massive amounts of equipment, which will all need to be replaced by Western nations. And this is Ukraine's major advantage over Russia. Russia has the manpower, but it has very little metal. Ukraine, meanwhile, has been building large amounts of metal via donated Western vehicles. But it isn't enough, and what has been pledged needs to be immediately resupplied, because no matter how good Leopard 2s and Abrams are, they will be lost in combat. Russia still retains the air advantage, and tanks are notoriously allergic to air attack. If Ukraine fatigue sets in, the nation could see the supply of Western equipment drying up, and there is no doubt that despite the heroism and ingenuity of Ukraine's defenders, they would have been defeated long ago without Western weapons, financial support, and intelligence. At this moment, it's a race between Ukraine and Russia. One side is building a massive manpower pool, and the other is trying to equip a far smaller pool with far more advanced weapons. Without the West and the support of its populations, Ukraine will lose this race and the war. Luckily, the current U.S. President Joe Biden has reaffirmed his long-term support for Ukraine, with yet another $1.2 billion aid package being recently announced. And this package is a spicy one. Amongst the announced aid is much more 155mm artillery rounds, which U.S. factories have been expanding their capability to produce at breakneck speeds. Also included are more air defense systems, though the exact nature of which are unannounced so as to deny Russia critical intelligence. However, educated guesses point to more Patriot and NASAMS batteries 
batteries as well as stinger systems for foot soldiers. Also included are more and new radars and missiles, but perhaps most importantly is funds dedicated to figuring out how to integrate Ukraine's Soviet-era kit with modern American weapons. Ukraine has a lot of Soviet kit, and there's simply no ammo for it. American agents have been scouring the world for every available S-300 missile they could get to feed Ukraine's air defense batteries, but inevitably they've been coming up short as global stocks from friendly nations dwindle out. Yet the S-300 systems remain fully operational, they just have nothing to shoot. This is where a US-led effort to integrate these systems with modern US munitions comes in. Because if a workaround can be found to integrate missiles such as Patriot interceptors or SM-3s or SM-6s with Ukraine's Soviet kit, then that's significantly cheaper than having to provide entire air defense systems and it would dramatically improve Ukraine's capabilities. There's some precedent for success with some very clever American engineers figuring out how to jerry-rig US harm missiles into Ukrainian MiGs, however it wasn't possible to make the two systems fully compatible, limiting the effectiveness of the American-made anti-radiation missiles. Something is better than nothing, though, and Ukraine put its harm missiles to fantastic use even in their limited capacity, seriously degrading Russian air defense radar coverage and artillery counter-battery radar. What's got everyone talking, though, is an unspecified amount of quote, classified aid. This has set the rumor mill ablaze, because there's a lot of very fancy US kit that Ukraine could put to great use liberating Russians from their lives. Some have predicted that this would end up being the attackums missiles that Ukraine's been asking for, but that's unlikely as President Biden has been stubbornly refusing to provide that weapon. This hasn't stopped the UK, who is seeking a way to crowdsource with other nations the cost of purchasing Storm Shadow long-range attack missiles for Ukraine. With a range of up to 300 kilometers, Storm Shadow missiles can be fired from Ukrainian jets with no problem and would put targets that Ukrainian HIMARS can't reach at risk, leveling the playing field significantly. There is speculation that part of the classified aid could be the American El Rassams, its latest generation of long-range anti-ship missiles. These stealthy missiles take a dramatically different approach to the new generation of Russian and Chinese anti-ship missiles. Instead of flying incredibly fast, they fly at subsonic speeds with an internal jet engine. But where they have the advantage is in their stealthy design and advanced artificial intelligence. The actual detection range of an El Rassam is classified, but they have the capability of significantly reducing engagement time for surface ships dramatically improving the odds of a hit. El Rassams can be fired from either planes, ships, or even ground canisters. It's unlikely that they're compatible with Ukrainian jets, but with a range in excess of 300 nautical miles, El Rassams launched from Odessa would reach Russian ships almost anywhere in the Black Sea, and sinking the Russian Black Sea fleet is a priority for Ukraine, as it's those same ships Russia's been using to launch volleys of cruise missiles against civilians. While the Russian Navy is too terrified to leave port, their ships still make great launch platforms for long-range missiles. Sinking these ships would severely limit Russia's ability to launch cruise missile strikes, but it would also inflict devastating financial cost to Russia. NATO is keenly interested in seeing the Russian Black Sea fleet turn into the Russian Black Sea Marine Preserve, as it would end Russia's days as a naval power in the region. Thus, while remote, the possibility of El Rassams being provided to Ukraine is not zero, but one weapon could define the war to come even more than Western tanks, F-16s. Ukraine's been asking for Western F-16s since the war began, and the West has been reluctant to provide them. The issue is complicated. As Russian air defenses remain formidable across the front, the F-16s would have a tough time operating with such dense air defenses. For its part, Ukraine wants a way of knocking Russian bombers and fighters out of the sky, and help to keep its troops safe from air attack. Without some significant development on the battlefield, though, it's unlikely F-16s are the best option at the moment, and thus the US has been reluctant to provide them. The US has sent nearly $30 billion worth of aid to Ukraine, with a significant chunk of that being military equipment. The equipment has directly supported the nation's stunning counterattack, with US equipment taking center stage and shaping the battle before it was even launched. Russia is now finding out why the US doesn't have free healthcare. But what equipment has the US sent, and why does it seem like Russia is helpless against it? Javelin a week after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there was one name the Russian army and the rest of the world had become very familiar with, Javelin. This premier American anti-tank system first entered service in 1996 when it replaced the M47 Dragon and has proven absolutely lethal against Russian armor. This is the weapon US infantry would have used themselves in a war with Russia, and its effectiveness is nothing short of terrifying. The weapon consists of two components, the launch tube assembly and the reusable command launch unit. The clue is the brains of the system, and features four times magnification at both day and night with its thermal sight. This system allows US infantry to no longer be reliant on supporting heavy vehicles for target identification, 
and the clue can be used by itself even when no more missiles are available to provide infantry with a portable and very capable thermal sight. A 12 times magnification narrow field of view option allows gunners to effectively zoom in on a target and properly identify it. When the gunner is ready to fire, he switches to a seeker FOV mode at 9 times magnification. This is effectively now being fed into the missile guidance unit. With target selected, the gunner squeezes a second button and the missile is on its way to deliver 19 pounds of supersonic tandem charge high explosive American Freedom to its target. In order to defeat modern reactive armor, the Javelin missile features two warheads that detonate in rapid succession. The first is a smaller charge, which is meant to blow away explosive reactive armor panels being fired up at the missile in an attempt to disrupt it. The second shaped charge creates a narrow stream of molten metal that penetrates through tank armor to deliver an extremely emotional event to the crew inside. When targeting armored vehicles, the Javelin switches to top attack mode in which the missile fires straight up into the air and then comes down directly on the tank's thinner top armor. You've probably seen pictures of Russian tanks with what were termed cope cages. These metal cages were being welded onto Russian tanks at the start of the invasion to protect from anti-tank missiles, and in some cases could actually be effective. However, against modern anti-tank weapons, the cages were simply wasted labor, and as St. Javelin took a horrible toll on Russian tanks, the Russian Ministry of Defense quickly sought out a new solution. Nowadays, you're probably not seeing many of these cages on Russian tanks because A, most Russian tanks are now Ukrainian tanks, and B, they didn't work. So why are Javelins so effective against Russian armor? The truth is that modern anti-tank missiles of the quality being supplied to Ukraine are frankly terrifyingly effective. Even Western tanks would be hard put to defend themselves against them, which is why the US is gradually adding the trophy protection system to its own tanks. This anti-anti-tank missile system fires explosive charges at incoming missiles that are more effective at disrupting the weapon than explosive reactive armor panels. However, the real reason why Javelins are pounding Russian armor into scrap metal is that Russia has very poor military doctrine and uses its tanks improperly. Tanks are not meant to operate on their own, but are rather meant to be directly supported by infantry. Supporting infantry forces are responsible for keeping enemy hunter-killer teams at bay. Yet, the Russian military has routinely shown that it does not operate armor and infantry together well at all. Often, Russian armor is simply left to fend for itself with predictable results. Kamikaze Drones Odds are you've now become familiar with the names Phoenix, Ghost, or Switchblade. Russian infantry is not only aware of the names but actively fears them. The Phoenix Ghost drone is a loitering munition developed under the US military's big safari weapons program. This acquisitions program is meant to rapidly deliver new weapons to meet unexpected or evolving threats, allowing the US military to quickly counter enemy capabilities using pre-existing technology rather than going through a whole development and testing cycle of new tech. To date, the US has sent around 700 of these weapons to Ukraine, with a significant impact on the battlefield. The loitering munitions can hover over an area for six hours and conduct surveillance at both night and day thanks to its infrared sensors. Once a target has been detected, the drone kamikazes down onto its head with an explosive finale. The drone is great for taking out entrenched infantry or even lightly armored vehicles such as trucks. The Switchblade is the name most people are familiar with and has sort of stolen the Phoenix Ghost's thunder. The weapon was conceived by the US Air Force Special Operations Command as a way of rapidly giving infantry a way to provide their own air support in Afghanistan. Traditional air support may not always be available or take time to respond. Plus, it can cause serious collateral damage. The Switchblade 300, however, can be carried by individual soldiers and used for both reconnaissance and attack, dropping down from above directly on an enemy's head. When the weapon was first sent to Afghanistan, it was on a test case basis and in limited numbers. In 2012, US soldiers received 75 Switchblades to try them out in real-world conditions. The result of that test remains classified, but very shortly afterwards, the US Army made a request that the weapon be immediately made available in far greater numbers. Insurgents soon feared it and US soldiers loved it. Soon after its debut in Afghanistan, the Switchblade was tested from the open bay of an Osprey transport, successfully tracking and impacting its target. This paved the way for a new development between Switchblade manufacturer Aerovironment and Kratos Defense and Security Solutions for a high-speed, long-range, unmanned combat air vehicle that could act as a mothership to a host of Switchblade drones. The UCV would be designed to rapidly deploy an overwhelming number of Switchblades in order to overcome enemy defenses. The US has provided over a thousand of both the anti-personnel and anti-armor version of the Switchblade drone. 
which Ukraine has used to devastating effectiveness. In response to the overwhelming success of the Switchblade, Russia has announced development of its own loitering munition, the LAOP-500, which it boasts twice as powerful as the Switchblade. Given the fact that Russia is bringing T-62s out of museums to fight in Ukraine, take that boast with a grain of salt. So why can't Russia stop these American drones? The easiest answer is that Russia simply wasn't prepared for modern warfare. Despite its many pre-invasion boasts of being able to take on even the military forces of the US, Russia has proven it simply has no idea how to fight a modern war. It has failed to conduct large-scale combined arms operations and displayed time and again a complete disregard for electronic and signal security. The devastation delivered by Western-provided smart munitions proves that it fundamentally was unprepared for the consequences of a smart battlefield. The hard answer, however, is that nobody is really prepared for the loitering munition threat posed by modern drones. There is simply no way of providing adequate protection to infantry forces from loitering munitions, though the US has been working on the problem for a few years now. Electronic warfare capabilities meant to disrupt drone signals or even shoot them down with electromagnetic pulse weapons are now being seen as integral to the very structure of the traditional American infantry platoon. So, the next time big, tough US infantrymen go to war, expect to see Geek Squad fighting right alongside them, because without electronic warfare support, infantry is too vulnerable in future conflicts. Stinger At the start of the war, Russian air forces operated in large numbers across the country. By now, Russian rotary aviation is conspicuously absent from the front lines. The reason is the US-made FIM-92 Stinger and similar platforms provided by other Western countries. Russian aviation is having traumatic flashbacks to the Afghanistan war, when its helicopters were mauled by US-supplied Stingers. Today the weapon system has been updated, but remains relatively the same as it was when liberating communist aviators from their earthly troubles in 1985. The Stinger is a shoulder-fired man-portable air defense weapon, or MANPAD, that can engage targets up to 3,800 meters away, making it perfect for taking out low-flying aircraft such as helicopters. Its smart seeker head can differentiate between the exhaust plume of an enemy aircraft and its engines, helping it home in for a successful kill. To fire the weapon, a battery coolant unit, or BCU, is inserted into the grip stock. This delivers a supply of high-pressure argon gas, which cryogenically cools the seeker to operating temperature. This causes the seeker to be very sensitive to heat sources, thus allowing it to lock on to enemy vehicles with great precision. Once fired, a small ejection motor pops the missile clear of the operator and to a safe range, where the main rocket motor is activated, sending the missile on its way. The warhead is relatively small, only about 2.26 pounds of HTA-3 explosive, a mix of HMX, TNT, and aluminum powder. However, the weapon is designed to directly impact the vehicle's engines, which can be easily damaged or destroyed even with a small amount of explosives. So why is the Stinger once more violently reuniting Russian aircraft with the ground? Once more it comes down to doctrine. Russian forces are doing a poor job of integrating air power with ground forces, leaving low-flying Russian aircraft at great threat from man-portable weapons. However, the real culprit is Russia's basic lack of precision targeting. Most of its ground attack aircraft lack targeting pods meaning they have to come in low for any attack to have a large degree of precision. This puts them directly under the threat of the Stinger. High Mars We couldn't possibly do an episode on US weapons Russia's having a very bad day with and not mention the vaunted High Mars system. This thing is not very impressive on paper. The High Mobility Artillery Rocket System is, at first glance, underpowered rocket artillery. Unlike its more capable cousin, the M270 MLRS, the HIMARS system has half the number of munitions available to it, six GMLRS rockets. It's basically just a truck with a single pot of missiles on its back, so why in the world has this weapon single-handedly changed the face of the Ukrainian war? In the early 1990s, the US Army was retooling itself from fighting World War III against the Soviet Union and its allies to the expected Bush Wars of the future, which would feature low-intensity conflict. This meant the Army needed to slim down and start providing weapons that were mobile and flexible something traditional rocket artillery is not. HIMARS was developed to meet the need of a light footprint force such as US paratroopers or a small contingent of overseas troops fighting a conflict requiring precision rather than overwhelming firepower. Mounted on a truck, the system has far greater mobility and speed than any of its tracked cousins. And this was a huge draw for a future low-intensity conflict. However, it was exactly this capability that would make HIMARS so valuable to Ukrainian forces. Faced with overwhelming numbers, Ukraine needed a platform that could rapidly deliver a fire mission and then flee before enemy counter-battery fire or air support could respond. Traditional tube artillery would be based around areas in Ukraine 
could enact some form of air defense which protected them but made them very inflexible weapons. HIMARS, however, could quickly drive to a launch site, pop off its missiles, and drive away in minutes, allowing the weapon system to be anywhere it needed to be with short notice. But it's HIMARS's precision and range that makes it truly deadly. Each of the six GLMRS rockets have a range of 57 miles and are armed with precision warheads. This gives Ukraine the ability to punch behind enemy lines at targets out of range of traditional tube artillery, which has a range of around a dozen or so miles. But it's the precision that really matters, because each rocket can be programmed to hit a specific target or to double up and defeat enemy fortifications, striking exactly at their weakest point. The error radius of HIMARS is classified but believed to be no more than a few meters at most, and is likely far, far less than that given the history of US smart weapons. With just a dozen of these weapons at the start of summer, Ukraine began to batter Russian command posts and logistics nodes, leading to an immediate effect on the battlefield as Russian forces were slowed to a crawl as they contended with the chaos being wreaked behind their lines. Russia quickly moved to neutralize the weapon, dedicating large amounts of air power and special operations forces to locating and destroying these mobile rocket launchers. Within weeks of the deployment of HIMARS to Ukraine, Russia claimed it had destroyed all of them, yet the US confirmed that not a single HIMARS had been lost in combat. Was Russia lying? Normally, the answer to that question would be yes, but in this case, they actually might have been telling the truth, at least from their own point of view. Because the weapon is mounted on a generic heavy-duty truck frame, Ukraine created multiple HIMARS decoys using trucks painted green. Other decoys were mere mock-ups made of wood, and it's confirmed that Russia has destroyed at least 10 of these decoys with caliber cruise missiles. Russia took the bait and expended significant effort and resources better used elsewhere to find and destroy these fake HIMARS, leaving the real HIMARS safe from attack. The US quickly agreed to supply Ukraine with more HIMARS, and the nation now has just under two dozen of these platforms with plans for more to be delivered. As of September 8th, Ukraine has struck 400 Russian targets with the weapons, making it the hardest working weapon in the Ukraine war, and one that has forced Russia to radically rethink how it deploys its forces. No longer safe behind the front lines, Russian command and control nodes and logistics hubs have been forced out of HIMARS range, which means the rate of the offensive has slowed to a crawl as units have to wait even longer for resupply. Russia has threatened to retaliate against the United States for further deliveries of the weapon system, but given that it can't handle 16 of these and the US Army is equipped with over 400, it seems Russia's mouth is cashing checks its military can't cash. The invasion of Ukraine will go down as one of the greatest military boondoggles in modern history. Already the lessons learned are being taught in military academies around the world. But how did Vladimir Putin end up grossly miscalculating his chance to win the war? The war has been raging for one year and three months as of the writing of this script. Estimates vary wildly, and neither side has any interest in letting real figures out. But moderate estimates for casualties place the war at a total of 70,000 killed and 310,000 wounded. Of those, Russia is believed to have suffered 50,000 dead and 180,000 wounded, giving it the lion's share of the death count. Given Russia's extreme artillery advantage, though, Ukrainian wounded are only about 50,000 behind Russian wounded, despite having less than half the dead. This is because artillery is extremely good at wounding, but not so good at killing entrenched troops. Russia has already suffered nearly as many confirmed KIA as the US did during the entire duration of the Vietnam War, 20 years of direct involvement. In terms of gains, Russia has at best temporarily secured large parts of the separatist East but has failed to fully consolidate the breakaway republics, which are now, at least according to Russian law, officially part of Russia. The international community, however, does not recognize the illegal annexation of Ukraine's east. In exchange for tenuous control over the Ukrainian breakaway regions, Russia has lost immeasurably more. Over 1,000 Western companies have either fully or at least partially pulled out of Russia, taking a significant amount of investment capital with them, dealing significant damage to the Russian economy. Prices on many goods have doubled or more, though the Russian economy remains relatively stable thanks to a significant war chest Putin had built up over the years for exactly this scenario. The bad news is about half of that $600 billion reserve was frozen at the onset of the war, and the remaining has been steadily draining away as Russia attempts to keep the Russian economy afloat. Exact economic data can be difficult to find, as Russia no longer allows for independent verification of its market figures. Instead, Russian officials have been feeding organizations like the IMF their own data, which, much to their discredit, the IMF has happily published without an ounce of skepticism. However, independent analysis of the Russian economy by multiple American and British groups have found an economy in serious trouble. 
only kept afloat by significant government spending, but its deficit hit a record of $1.8 trillion at the start of this year, with revenues falling by about a third and spending growing by 58%. Russian GDP dropped by between 2.2% or up to 3.9% depending on who you ask, and none who you could ask have been granted access to internal Russian financial data. The true GDP loss could be significantly higher than that, and only expected to continue. Revenues from the export of energy have fallen significantly thanks to a painful European embargo and the imposing of price caps on Russian oil by the EU. This means that nobody using European ships, infrastructure or any ships or infrastructure insured by a European agency is allowed to purchase oil at a higher price than the $100 a barrel for products that trade at a premium to crude, and $45 for products traded at a discount, such as fuel oil and naphtha. The price cap was not meant to destroy the Russian energy sector though, and criticism about its ineffectiveness is completely missing the point. Europe wants Russia to continue selling oil, it just doesn't want it making a profit on it. Given the increased distances to ship certain products out of the EU and to foreign markets, as well as the inefficiency of Russian equipment, cost of setting up new trade routes, and infrastructure, Russia is estimated to be at a break-even point on oil revenue. This means it's earning just about as much as it spends on extracting, refining, and shipping, which prompted Russia to begin to tax its oil companies at the price of Brent crude, rather than what its own oil is actually earning. This is obviously unsustainable and will cripple the Russian oil sector for decades as it sucks out funds for expansion, exploration, and basic maintenance, while nations like India and China are greatly benefiting from the deeply discounted oil and thus earning some amount of international ire. A complete boycott would be the exact opposite of what the EU wants. If Russian oil disappeared overnight, it would drive the cost of other oil supplies through the roof, hence why the EU wants Russia to continue selling its energy supplies. Things are still getting worse for Russia, though. The Ukrainian counteroffensive has already begun as of the writing of this script, with shaping operations utilizing HIMARS and Storm Shadow missiles deep behind enemy lines. Ukraine's preparing the battlefield for the coming offensive, and part of that preparation includes helping the Freedom of Russia Legion and Russian Volunteer Corps launch attacks inside of Russia. Multiple times now, both groups have crossed the border from Ukraine into Russia, with their most high-profile attack into Belgorod, seeing them occupy multiple villages for two days before pulling back. The ongoing raids across the border are brazen and are helping fuel panic amongst the Russian population. A subsequent drone swarm attack against Moscow at the end of May fed even more fuel to the fire, as Vladimir Putin was left looking incompetent and incapable of defending his own capital from a drone attack. While the drones weren't armed with high explosives, at least three buildings were struck in the wealthy Moscow suburbs, injuring two and causing minor damage. The real point of the attack was to erode Russian support for Putin and to incite public anger against the wealthy elite who have leached off Russian society for decades. When the attacks were announced, the Russians around the country celebrated the fact that they had struck inside the same communities where government and business elite live. Putin is a president up a creek without a paddle. So, how'd he get here? It all began with a botched intelligence assessment of the situation inside of Ukraine before the invasion was launched. Vladimir Putin entrusted his plans to only a few advisors. Fearing leaks and a Western rush to supply Ukraine with arms meant to discourage an invasion, the plan to attack Ukraine was kept secret and only within a very small, tight circle. However, this meant that nobody in the military was prepared. Neither was Russia's intelligence apparatus. As Putin was preparing his invasion, he decided to take the temperature of Ukraine by tasking the FSB to do the job of infiltrating Ukraine and gauging how a Russian invasion would be met. Details remain incredibly murky, but by all accounts, Russian intelligence did not believe Putin would be brazen enough to actually invade. Given the extreme state of the corruption inside of Russia, the intelligence agents assigned this delicate task apparently fabricated their reports, pocketing the millions of rubles assigned to them instead of spending them on their mission. Thus, as Putin reviewed plans to invade Ukraine, he was assured the Ukrainians would meet the Russians as liberators. Famously, the Ukrainians did not, in fact, meet the Russians as liberators. Shockingly, though, Russia's intelligence failure was so bad that even in Ukraine's east, which is the most pro-Russian part of the nation, Putin's forces were met with violence rather than jubilation. The expected collapse of the Ukrainian military did not occur, and while a handful of senior military officers and political officials did cooperate, it was not the flood of insider support that Putin had expected. The approaches to Mariupol had been demined, but the people of Mariupol resisted nonetheless. 
Russia's second intelligence failure was in properly assessing the state of the Ukrainian military. Many Americans have had some experience training alongside the Ukrainians as part of multiple ongoing missions after the end of the Cold War. One soldier we spoke with described Ukraine's military in the early 2010s as, quote, a complete joke. Discipline was low, facilities were terrible, training was worse, and the soldiers received so little respect that civilian contractors regularly bullied them, even running through a guard post they had erected to serve as a traffic checkpoint. Nobody respected the military because Ukraine's military in the early 2010s still resembled the Russian military of that same era, a husk of its former self from the Soviet days, with corruption rampant and every soldier out for themselves. What Russia's intelligence failed to take note of, though, was that it did not remain that way. After the 2014 invasion of Crimea, NATO stepped up its support for Ukraine, fearing a wider Russian invasion. Along with the support came sweeping reforms, and while today the Ukrainian military continues to struggle with its Soviet roots, thanks to many older officers and NCOs who had their start in the Soviet system, the Ukrainian armed forces are now a capable and competent force. Things aren't perfect, there's still some corruption and the UAF's military doctrine is lacking in large areas, but Ukraine has proven its military is adaptable and a very quick study of the Western way of war. Russia, however, missed what was taking place right under its own border. It failed to see the restructuring of the Ukrainian military and the professionalism that began to grow in the wake of the 2014 invasion when UAF forces largely cut and run at the sight of Russian tanks. It failed to take note of the battle-hardened veterans it had created through ongoing fighting in the east of the country against Russian-backed separatists, and it failed to note the influx of manned portable anti-tank and air defense weapons along with Western training instructors. When Russia crossed that border into Ukraine, it faced a military that had radically evolved in the last eight years. In large part, though, Russia's invasion of Crimea helped Putin disastrously miscalculate how the West would respond. As Russian forces poured into Crimea, the West did little to stop Putin. Sanctions were enacted, but these were weak and anemic, with most of Europe leery of angering their number one energy supplier over a piece of a former Soviet republic. Sanctions would eventually be strengthened, and we would just see how effective sanctions targeting dual-use technology would be as Russia entered into Ukraine with a critical shortage of drones. However, overall, the West's response was tepid at best, even as Moscow fueled an ongoing violent civil war in Ukraine's east. Convinced that the West would respond similarly, Putin was emboldened to invade again, only this time to not take just a piece of the pie, but the whole thing. To be fair, he had a good reason to believe the West would once more let him get away with the invasion. America was and continues to be divided politically, in no small part thanks to Russian influence operations. These same influence operations have been ongoing in Europe since the late 2000s and helped fuel Brexit while funneling money to right-wing parties and individuals. Russia's been sowing xenophobia and nationalism in its bid to splinter the EU and the NATO alliance, or at least weaken it and distract it from his schemes in Eastern Europe. This has largely worked, but nobody could predict that rather than fall apart, the US and Europe would come together. Despite continued political division in the US, the nation largely remains united behind support for Ukraine. Europe likewise has been strongly supporting Ukraine, with nations like Poland practically declaring war on Russia on their own as they push every available piece of hardware across the border as quickly as they can. Westerners have grown fat and lazy, too concerned with their own good lives to shoulder any sacrifice, is the thinking of many Chinese political scientists, who believe that the West would crumble if its comfortable way of life was threatened. Putin too believed the same thing, and nobody could have predicted the astonishing speed and severity of sanctions that followed Russia's invasion. Europe, who had been warned by the US to not deepen its energy ties with Russia as it provided Putin leverage, took on the incredibly painful task of severing its energy dependence on Russia, something which would have been unthinkable at the dawn of 2022. Inevitably, though, Putin made the mistake of invading, and very quickly discovered that he had been drinking his own Kool-Aid. Just two months before the invasion, major Western publications were publishing articles warning about Russia's quote, modern and proficient combined arms military. Nobody questioned that Russia had the world's second strongest military, and the thoughts of Russia's combined arms armies crossing the border into the Baltics terrified NATO military planners. We ourselves were drinking that same Kool-Aid alongside the vast majority of analysts and think tanks in the world, publishing a video on how formidable Russia's military had become months before the invasion of Ukraine. 
In a way, the world can't really be blamed too much for falling for this illusion. Information is tightly controlled inside Russia, and the nation had put on a series of large-scale exercises showing off its combined arms prowess. After the Zaphad 2016 exercise, the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency noted that, quote, Russia's forces are becoming more mobile, more balanced, and capable of conducting the full range of modern warfare. What the world missed, however, was that these exercises were highly choreographed, and Russian troops would find that real military operations are a lot harder when someone's actively trying to kill you. Putin, however, also fell for that little lie that the Russian military was a modern and capable force simply because it looked good in an exercise field or on parade. And here he's both at fault but also not to blame. The Russian military is thoroughly corrupt, the depth and scale of which has been kept secret until the invasion of Ukraine. Shortly after crossing the border, the Russian military revealed its rotten core to the world, and it is this systemic corruption that helped fuel Putin's miscalculation. Corruption exists at every level of the military. Young enlisted troops, either volunteers or conscripts, prey on brand new troops, beating and abusing them while stealing everything they can from them, sometimes even forcing them to ask family for more money just so they can steal it. Few NCOs exist because not many conscripts choose to remain to serve as professional soldiers, and NCO training is non-existent in the form known in the West, where new NCOs attend specialized training. What NCOs do exist, though, prey on their underlings as they themselves are preyed upon by their officers. At nearly all levels, though, it is wanton and blatant theft. Troops steal the copper wiring from their own vehicles so they can sell it, and officers steal funds meant for training or equipment upkeep. A common practice in the Russian military is what's known as photo reports. Rather than file a detailed report on unit training goals, status, and results, Russian officers simply take photos of their troops' training and send it up the chain. Naturally, this leads to incidents such as an officer taking his troops out to the firing range, having everyone fire a few rounds while he takes a photo or a short video, and then immediately terminating the training. The officer can then pocket all the money not spent on training, while the unit fails to maintain their proficiency or build even basic soldiering skills. Further up the chain, unit commanders falsify records to show their units have more men than they actually have. This is because soldiers' pay is given directly to their unit commander, whose job it is to divvy it among the men. Naturally, the more men in a unit, the more pay that unit will receive, with the commander pocketing the pay of every phantom soldier he lied about in his paperwork. However, most will also skim some right off the top anyway, shorting their own troops. At even higher levels, scams run rampant. One Russian senior officer was imprisoned shortly after the invasion when it was discovered that he had sold hundreds of gallons of fuel meant for his armored vehicles to local villagers. These fuel scams are very common, as well as outright theft of military property such as weapons, ammunition, or ordnance, which can be sold on the black market. At the acquisitions level, corruption is so common, the cost of it is baked into the cost of acquiring new weapons. Russia finds it cheaper to buy Iranian drones, for example, because the built-in cost of bribes and kickbacks make Russian-built drones too expensive to build and buy. This all adds up to a military with a thoroughly rotten core and very little proficiency. Putin, who surrounded himself by yes-men that he can control, was aware of some corruption. Such is the way in Russia, but he had no idea just how poorly prepared his troops were for real combat operations. This is where he is both at fault and not at fault, because while he couldn't have known, it is also his fault that the Russian military is as corrupt as it is. Having perpetuated the same culture of corruption that brought him to power, he should have hardly found it surprising that everyone up the entire chain of command was also enthusiastically engaging in it as well, hollowing out his military forces. Putin believed that he'd be able to take Kyiv in three days after seeing the brutal speed of American combined arms operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. However, Putin had miscalculated just how poorly prepared the Russian military was, both in terms of basic competency and logistics. It doesn't help that Putin appears to remain largely blind to the troubled state of his own military, as defectors with close access to the dictator have confirmed that he watches no media except Russian state media, and he doesn't even browse the internet. This means we won't be getting a very special subscriber from the heart of the Kremlin, but on the other hand, that might be a good thing because the bigger Putin's miscalculations, the faster he ushers in the defeat of the Russian military and his own downfall. After over a year of asking, Ukraine is finally getting the Army Tactical Missile System, more famously known as the Attackums, and it's going to absolutely ruin Russia's plan to take over Ukraine. Ukraine's been asking for Attackums since the start of the fighting, but the West unfortunately fell for Putin's fear trap. 
Quoting fears of escalation, President Joe Biden declined Ukraine's requests for the long-range precision missile, and these same fears of an imaginary escalation unfortunately delayed the delivery of badly needed weapon systems like the Leopard 2 and the Abrams tanks, Bradley and other IFVs, and the F-16s. We're not going to make any bones about this. While the West was browning its pants over making Putin and his ineffectual army angry, Ukrainians were dying. A lot of those dead Ukrainian civilians and soldiers both would still be alive if the West had provided heavy equipment much faster than it did. Of course, there is two sides to every coin, and after navigating the deadly intrigue of the Cold War, it's hard to blame the West for fears of an escalatory war on Europe's doorstep, especially when Russia still has more nukes than any other power on Earth. Even if most of those nukes are probably filled with potatoes, because corrupt generals sold the warheads and fuel off at the local flea markets for vodka. However, even Russia isn't completely suicidal. Sure, they'll happily send their soldiers off to certain slaughter, and defeating the enemy by hurling hundreds of conscripts at them until they ran out of ammo is a time-honored strategy taught in the finest of Russian military academies. But the Russian state still frowns on the idea of all-out nuclear annihilation for both itself and the world at large. If the world's blown up, where are the oligarchs going to sail their mega yachts to? And if it became clear that the Russian military was an ineffectual bunch of clown shoes, there was little reason except an unhealthy abundance of caution for not providing Ukraine with heavy weapons. Ironically, the nations who would be threatened if the war expanded to a hilariously one-sided conflict with NATO were exactly the ones who were sending their heavy equipment to Ukraine and calling on the West to follow suit. Poland practically drove its own tanks straight to the Kremlin and would likely need very little provocation to do so even today. Gradually, policy has shifted, but one major taboo remained – precision long-range weapons. The US has stated multiple times it would not provide Ukraine with those weapons out of fear that it would use them to strike inside Russia, and it even made sure the rockets it provided for HIMARS have a limited range. This, however, is grossly unfair to the Ukrainian people. As Russia is free to launch attacks from its military facilities on its own soil against Ukraine without the risk of being struck back, Russia's complacency fueled by confidence Ukraine wouldn't anger the West by attacking it directly even led to the multiple humiliation invasions of Belgorod by Russian volunteer fighters such as the Freedom of Russia Legion and the Russian Volunteer Corps. These long-range weapons, though, are critical for Ukraine's military success, because without it, its forces are perpetually on their back foot. Even equipped with superior Western vehicles, Ukraine is finding it difficult to advance in the face of Russia's air cover and long-range artillery. With Russia's air force playing a reinvigorated role in the war and taking a serious toll on Ukraine's counterattacking forces at the moment, Russia also has the manpower advantage, and for now at least, the supply advantage. In a tit-for-tat exchange, Ukraine can never hope to win no matter how many fancy tanks the West gives it, which is why the ability to strike deep behind the front lines is so critical for its success. Yet the West has been hesitant to give Ukraine the tools it really needs until early in May, when Britain said, hold my tea and lingering colonial holdings, and went ahead and gave Ukraine dozens of Storm Shadow cruise missiles. Once more leading the way in breaking international taboos, Britain did what it did with tanks and told the world to ante up as it donated the weapon Ukraine needed to strike deep behind the front lines. Now we have confirmation that the United States is at least following suit with the attackums. Revealed as a line item for future funding for Ukraine, the US is setting aside about $80 million for attackums missiles to be delivered to Ukraine. This will net Ukraine about 50 or so missiles, though nobody would be surprised when it gets a hell of a lot more than that as the West so far has kept many of its surprise weapons deliveries and their quantities close to its collective chest. To see just how much of a game changer they'll be, we only have to look at the effectiveness of the Storm Shadow so far. Nobody is quite sure which variant of the Storm Shadow Britain gave to Ukraine, but many have theorized it's the shorter range export model. What we do know is that Russian targets as far as the Sea of Azov have picked up a nasty habit of suddenly exploding. With a range of 500 kilometers or 1,795,200 subway meatball marinara footlongs for our fellow Americans, Storm Shadow missiles can strike pretty much anywhere in occupied territory and significantly outside of it if need be. In a typical Russian Ministry of Defense fashion, they've claimed to have shot down every single Storm Shadow delivered to Ukraine, as well as every Storm Shadow in the British inventory itself. However, recently a Russian colonel admitted in a public interview that Storm Shadow missiles were giving them significant trouble. According to the anonymous colonel, while Russian air defenses have gotten better at handling American HIMARS rockets, Storm Shadow was proving difficult to intercept. He estimated only a 50% intercept rate and blamed it on Storm Shadow's ability to maneuver and fly at low heights on its way to the target. 
The intelligent missile will frequently switch up its flight path, forcing an air defense unit to recalculate an intercept point for the incoming missiles. Soon, Storm Shadow will be joined by Attackums, but what is this weapon exactly, and why does Russia fear it? Attackums traces its heritage back to the late Cold War, as the US and its allies shifted to a brand new warfighting doctrine, Air Land Battle. This doctrine sought to achieve victory over the much larger in number Soviet bloc forces by attacking them with smaller, more maneuverable units, while launching strikes in the deep area with aircraft and missiles. Unlike their western counterparts, Soviet bloc forces fielded large formations with strict top-down command structures that disincentivized individual initiative. Thus, the US sought to sever their command and control links either by attacks on the communication infrastructure or enemy command posts, or both, throwing entire formations into disarray. Attacks with smaller, more mobile ground forces from multiple directions would overwhelm local command and control as troops sought direction from above rather than act on their own initiative. Maneuver warfare would thus win the day against much larger forces thrown into disarray. Airland battle would achieve greater success than anyone ever envisioned when the US and its allies faced off against Saddam Hussein in Desert Storm. At the time, Iraq had one of the largest armies and air forces in the world, and many feared that this would be the start of a new world war. Instead, much more agile American forces routed large Iraqi formations, while aircraft and deep strike missiles disrupted Iraq's ability to command its troops or resupply them. However, during the Cold War, the US didn't have a tactical ballistic missile. In the late 70s, the West rejected the necessity of using tactical nuclear weapons to fight the Soviets in Europe, and thus the US began investing in the development of a long-range tactical ballistic missile with a conventional warhead. At the time, precision weapons were in their infancy and a long way away from lobbing bombs down air shafts like in Desert Storm. US Army Missile Command sponsored the Simplified Inertial Guidance Demonstrator Program with the intent of fielding a conventional missile that could strike deep behind the front and at enemy reserves. Advancements in inertial guidance systems allowed for the creation of missiles that could have incredible accuracy, and DARPA began experimenting with this technology for a program it called Assault Breaker. This secret program attempted to develop a conventional missile with extremely high precision that could be used to engage mobile targets such as tanks and armored vehicle formations using cluster warheads. DARPA's Assault Breaker and the US Air Force's conventional standoff weapons programs would be merged in 1981, leading to the creation of the Joint Tactical Missile System. However, in 1984, the Air Force balked at the idea of an air-launched ballistic missile, opting to develop cruise missiles instead. Thus, JTACMS was renamed Army Tactical Missile Systems. ATACMS would prove its worth during Desert Storm in 1991, with 32 of them fired from M270 MLRS batteries. A decade later, 450 ATACMS would be fired during Operation Iraqi Freedom, with a total of 560 ATACMS fired in anger over the missile's life. However, despite being a successful and battle-proven weapon, in 2007 the US Army decided to terminate the entire program due to the cost of upkeep and procurement. At the time, the US was focused on asymmetrical threats like terrorists and made the foolish mistake of believing that no nation in the future would ever wage war again, resolving their conflicts instead with friendly games of Twister. Rather than trash their stockpile though, the Army began a service life extension program to keep the missiles ready for use. Propulsion and navigation systems were replaced, and cluster munition warheads were upgraded to have a blast fragmentation warhead equipped with a proximity fuse to achieve a similar effect. With international war back on the menu thanks to China and Russia, the Army realized it needed a replacement for the Attackums, prompting the development of a brand new missile system. The aging of the US Attackums stockpile, as well as the cost of life extension programs, is likely one big reason why they're suddenly being donated to Ukraine. The British are doing the exact same thing with their Storm Shadow missiles, donating its older stock as it works to acquire a new and more modern missile to replace its own inventory. With Attackums replacement in the pipeline, the US faces two choices, trash them or let Ukraine drop them on invading Russian heads. However, there is another valid reason why the US may have waited this long to provide Attackums to Ukraine. Unlike Storm Shadow, Attackums is a ballistic missile reaching a height of up to 50 kilometers or 4885.5 AR-15s for our fellow Americans before plummeting down at Mach 3 on its target. While speed is good, having a ballistic trajectory is very easy to predict. This is the reason why Russia's Kinzhal hypersonic weapons have failed the test in Ukraine, as American Patriot batteries swat them out of the sky with ease. This means Russian air defenses should have a relatively easy time knocking these missiles out of the sky, at least when their own missiles aren't defecting to the Ukrainian side and blowing up their own troops.
This is where timing matters, because as the war has progressed, Russia's stockpile of air defense missiles has dwindled. Ukraine has famously warned the West about a shortage of its own missiles, prompting an overly sensationalist media to sound the alarm bell that Ukraine would be out of missiles in weeks, back in April. However, its missile shortage is real, which is why the US has dispatched engineers to try to figure out how to make Ukraine's Soviet S-300 batteries fire American air defense missiles. Russia's been tight-lipped about its own stockpile, but we do know that it's not producing many new missiles thanks to sanctions. Famously, shortly after the start of the war, one plant manufacturing missiles for S-300 and S-400 batteries was forced to close down, with its workers given the option of taking a long-term unpaid vacation or signing a contract to fight on the front. The culprit was a critical shortage of microchips due to Western sanctions. While microchips are smuggled into the country, and China has been secretly supplying them, the huge markup and limited quantities make mass production of missiles impossible. With air defenses significantly attrited or simply low on interceptors, now is the time for big, fat Attackums missiles to have a better chance of hitting their targets. In fact, it's hard not to see the current donation of Storm Shadow missiles before Attackums arrives early next year as a coordinated event. With a 50% intercept rate, Russia will have to expend many more missiles than normal to protect vital infrastructure, eating up inventory and helping clear the skies for the more vulnerable Attackums. Once they arrive in the country, Russian forces all across the occupied areas will be in serious trouble. Storm Shadow features a significant warhead of 450 kilograms, or about 99.2 bald eagles for our American brothers and sisters. Attackums, however, can fit a warhead of 600 kilograms, or 66.14 Thanksgiving turkeys for our fellow Freedom Fries loving Americans. Being a rather hefty boy, though, Attackums has a much shorter range, only about 300 kilometers or about 50,641 Ford F-150 supercabs for everyone who's ever landed on the moon. However, this range is more than enough to service most Russian targets in occupied territories. Further complicating the Russian situation is the fact that the Attackums has an ace up its sleeve that its more nimble, tea-drinking Storm Shadow cousin doesn't. While Storm Shadow must be fired from either stationary ground stations, limiting its range, or aircraft for maximum range, Attackums can be fired from M270 MLRS batteries already provided to Ukraine, or every Russian's favorite Uncle HIMARS. This makes Attackums a highly mobile missile system that can strike when you least expect it and penetrate deep, while its operators drive away before they can be destroyed. This mobility is such a threat to Russia that it's dedicated significant effort to locating and destroying Ukrainian HIMARS vehicles, claiming to have destroyed every single one at least three times over. However, the US has confirmed that Ukraine has not lost a single HIMARS system since they made their debut last summer. Though it would be hard to blame the Russians on this one, since Ukraine has built dozens of plywood decoys, which Russia has definitely blown to splinters. So what can Russia do to counter Attackums when it arrives? The first thing is try to get it to never enter Ukraine in the first place. Expect more empty threats and nuclear saber rattling from Putin as the new year approaches as he attempts to scare the West into not supporting further aid to Ukraine. This is why it's important to educate yourself and others. Russia cannot militarily escalate this conflict without resorting to nuclear weapons, and that's a losing proposition for everyone on the planet, but probably more for Russia, because again, their nukes are probably full of potatoes after conscripts stole the warheads and the wiring for cigarette money. A conventional escalation is simply impossible. With the Russian armed forces now officially being the second best military inside of Russia after the Wagner PMC. The second thing Russia can do to counter Attackums is, well, nothing. Its inability to intercept and destroy HIMARS batteries means it'll likewise be unable to destroy Attackums as well when loaded onto their launchers, or while in transit or in storage. This is because Russia is not very good at intelligence and reconnaissance, and even worse at rapidly servicing targets of opportunity. All capabilities the US military has invested absolutely criminal amounts of money into. We may not be able to afford healthcare, but we can detect short-range Houthi rebel missile launches from orbit, and then put a missile of our own through their front window in return if we wanted to. Russia's ability to conduct even basic damage assessments is so bad that it can take up to a day or more to determine if an air or missile strike was successful before deciding to attack that same target again. This leaves it with no hope of interdicting Attackums before they're launched. Though, if it can replenish its air defense batteries, it's got a good chance of intercepting them after they're launched, at least when its air defenses aren't trying to kill their own side. Oh 
It's 3 a.m. somewhere in the Pacific, and an American carrier strike group is under attack. Enemy attack submarines have penetrated the outermost defensive layer, but aren't within striking range yet. The group's two accompanying attack subs and the carrier's anti-submarine warfare aircraft are busy pinpointing and destroying the small fleet of enemy subs. It's easy work. The Chinese subs are loud and not nearly as sophisticated as the Americans, but there's a lot of them. And to make matters worse, they're carrying a brand new type of weapon. The Chinese subs finally get within weapons range and with a loud rush of bubbles, discharge several surface attack missiles, each from their torpedo tubes. The noise alerts the Americans to their precise location, but that doesn't matter anymore, as the Chinese subs quickly cut and run after launching their deadly payloads. Moments later, the torpedo tube launched surface attack missiles pop to the surface where their rocket motors fire, sending them screaming up into the sky. In seconds, they're already hitting several thousand feet in altitude. Inside the combat information center of the two defensive American Aegis cruisers, the tactical action officer Air calls out the missile attack. Eighteen Vipers are in the air and headed for the battle group. The battle link that electronically connects the entire battle group together works to immediately train all available air defenses on the incoming missiles. The Chinese missiles have risen to about 10,000 feet, then activated their onboard radars to locate the American fleet. Aligning themselves with the battle group, the missiles immediately dive down to just 50 feet of the breaking waves. Now they fired their engines in full burn, hitting an incredible 11,000 miles per hour, or Mach 14.5. Over a hundred miles away, the incoming Vipers will reach the battle group in less than 10 seconds. The Aegis battle system sends out powerful pulses of radar to track each incoming Viper, then activates a second, higher precision radar to provide fine-tuned precision guidance to a salvo of interceptors. Acquisition and firing takes up to five seconds, leaving only four seconds to intercept each incoming missile. But there's a problem. The Chinese missiles are so fast that they're building up a layer of superheated plasma around the front of the missile body, scrambling incoming radar waves. The American Aegis system can't get an accurate lock, and the intercepting missiles are largely ineffective. Out of 18 incoming Vipers, 16 of them survive, and there's no time for a second intercept. The battle group's Sea Whiz weapons have already been trained on the incoming threat and begun firing tungsten rounds at thousands of rounds a second, but the radar-mounted guns are having the same problem that the Aegis system had. The plasma around each missile is making it almost impossible to get an accurate radar lock. Two more missiles are destroyed, 14 remain. In the blink of an eye, the carrier receives a direct hit from five Chinese missiles, blowing giant holes in the side of the ship and setting off secondary explosions from jet fuel and munitions. The submarine-launched missiles are too small to sink the mighty carrier, but it'll be forced to limp back to the US for repairs, and several hundred sailors are dead. The carrier and its entire air wing are effectively out of the water. An accompanying destroyer and the two attending Aegis cruisers aren't so lucky, and two of them suffer enough catastrophic damage that they begin to sink. For the first time in half a century, the American Navy has lost a ship in combat against a foreign adversary. The battle group is severely damaged by the attack and the loss of just three Chinese submarines. The entire carrier strike group has just been rendered combat ineffective, and most of the men, ships, and weapons that make up one of the greatest concentrations of firepower on Earth have all been put out of the war indefinitely. The previous scenario is clearly fiction, and yet it's very soon to be a reality for the United States Navy. The new arms race is overcoming the world, and for the first time in modern history, the United States is coming at dead last. Hypersonic missiles are missiles that travel above Mach 5 and can reach speeds as high as Mach 15 or even 20, and they're currently a threat that no military in the world can defend from. Thought of as indefensible, hypersonic missiles have the potential to render the United States' greatest asset, its carrier battle groups, completely obsolete. And the worst part is, the US has none of its own right now to retaliate with. Weapons have been going hypersonic for a long time. Ballistic missiles, after all, typically clear the atmosphere, and on the way down to their target will go hypersonic. The Chinese and Russians both have been threatening American carrier groups for decades with ballistic missiles. So what's the big deal with new hypersonic weapons, and how are they becoming a game changer? Well, traditional ballistic missiles do indeed move very fast, but they also are not very maneuverable in their hypersonic phase. Simple material science has prevented ballistic missiles from being able to maneuver very well as they descend on their target at thousands of miles an hour. After all, attempting to do so on such a big structure would immediately destroy it from the stress placed on the body of the missile by the extreme speed and wind resistance. The wind resistance also heats the skin of the missile up to incredible temperatures, necessitating the use of a heat shield on any missile that wants to survive to hit its target. 
it's not very efficient to coat the entire body of a missile with a heat shield, so if a ballistic missile were to turn in flight and expose part of its unprotected body to the superheated air, it would immediately disintegrate. Because they can't maneuver very much, ballistic missiles are extremely predictable and easy to defend against. But new hypersonic weapons are overcoming the problem of maneuverability with new materials and engines. This means that modern weapons can now perform evasive maneuvers to throw off incoming interceptors, or to simply swing around a target and attack from an unexpected angle. Speed is another way of protecting hypersonic missiles from interceptors, as the missiles simply move too fast to be effectively engaged by traditional anti-missile systems. An Aegis system, for example, can track a conventional missile, attack at hundreds of miles away, and give at minimum a 30-second window for engagement. In those 30 seconds, Aegis can launch as many as three waves of interceptors against conventional missiles. Against hypersonic missiles that move at Mach 5 or above, Aegis can only get as many as two attempts to engage. If the missiles hit the mind-boggling speed of Mach 14 like in our opening scenario, Aegis will get one single chance to intercept. At those speeds, even SeaWiz or close-in weapon systems won't get more than a second or two to engage. Speed, however, creates another problem for defensive systems. The incredible speeds can build up a layer of superheated plasma around the missile, which can scatter incoming radar waves. As every anti-missile system in operation uses very high-frequency radar for terminal guidance on interceptors, this could confuse that radar or render it completely ineffective. While the United States was focusing its efforts on Iraq and Afghanistan, Russia and China both began development on hypersonic weapons programs. Both nations have a vested interest in the technology, as both nations have one big problem – the United States Navy. Unless the US Navy and especially its carriers can be neutralized, then Russia and China are largely helpless to launch any kind of military offensive anywhere in the world. As American naval officer Alfred Thayer Mahan famously said, he who rules the waves rules the world. For a long time, Russia and China both relied on traditional ballistic missiles and large, extremely long-range cruise missiles to attempt to threaten American carrier battle groups. In response, the United States developed the world's most sophisticated ship-borne anti-missile system, Aegis. And America's confidence in its ability to protect its carriers was so great that in Cold War plans against the Soviet Union, American carriers played a key role in coastal operations against the Soviet Union directly. In the modern age, not much has changed, and the US remains confident that it can operate carriers in the South China Sea directly under the threat of Chinese ballistic missile submarines and land-based missile forces. To overcome American missile defenses, work began in the mid-2000s on hypersonic weapons that were simply too fast and too maneuverable for missile defense systems to effectively defeat. With the US's attention focused on the war on terror, both Russia and China made significant strides in this area of research, and in the early 2010s, Russian testing of hypersonic weapons shocked the American defense industry. President Barack Obama immediately ordered a start on hypersonic weapons programs, along with a concurrent hypersonic missile defense program that would explore how to protect from these weapons. While the US has made serious strides in catching up in this vital area of future warfighting, it still remains behind. To make matters worse, Russia now has a hypersonic ballistic missile of its own that's allegedly fully operational, the Avangard missile. The missile boosts into space like a regular missile but then detaches a glide vehicle that's extremely maneuverable and can reach hypersonic speeds on its descent to Earth. Currently, no defense system can protect from it. Advances in scramjet technology are also leading to the development of ship, plane, and even submarine-launched hypersonic anti-ship missiles to be used in the Russian and Chinese fleets. These weapons don't have the benefit of using the Earth's gravity to boost to hypersonic speeds as they plunge from space, so they use a conventional rocket motor to reach Mach 3 and then activate a scramjet to push through the hypersonic barrier. While the development of large numbers of these weapons is still a ways away, the Russians already have a plane-mounted hypersonic missile that could theoretically be used against American ships today. All, however, may not be lost for the American Navy. They say necessity is the mother of invention, and the US desperately needs a way to protect its critical surface ships, especially carriers, from hypersonic attack. For a few years now, the US Navy has been developing a way to protect its ship from hypersonic missiles, and it believes it may have found an answer. The Regional Glide Phase Weapon System, or RGPWS, is set to be loaded onto Arleigh Burke-class destroyers and makes use of the MK-41 vertical launch tubes already equipped on those vessels. That means once operational, RGPWS will very quickly be proliferated across the US fleet, ensuring protection against hypersonic weapons for US ships. 
But what exactly is RGPWS? Well, nobody's really sure, and the Department of Defense is keeping an extremely tight lid on the program. All anyone knows is that it's supposed to be able to protect from hypersonic ballistic missiles over a regional area, or several thousand square miles. But it'll likely not be of much use against atmospheric anti-ship missiles. Hypersonic missiles are changing the way that America's thinking about its own warfighting future, with many congressmen and women already calling for a rethink of the US's traditional strategy of investing heavily into massive supercarriers to maintain naval dominance. If a multi-billion dollar carrier can be destroyed by a multi-million dollar weapon, it would spell financial and military disaster for the US military. While no feasible defenses are yet on the table, the US is at least rapidly catching up to China and Russia in the development of hypersonic offensive weapons. Currently, the Navy is expecting to have offensive hypersonic missiles on its ship by 2023 and on its submarines by 2024. The Air Force is looking to have an air-launched variant by 2022, and the Army wants a mobile ground platform by 2023. How hypersonic weapons will affect the future of war exactly is unclear. What is clear is that this is one arms race the US can't afford to lose. There's a facility in Maryland, mostly used for housing military members and civilian workers, but in the past it was a testing ground, as people were exposed to some of the deadliest substances around. And the test subjects? American soldiers. It was the late 1940s and the United States and its allies were still sorting through the rubble after their victory in the Second World War. The two world wars had introduced a terrifying new element to warfare chemical weapons that could incapacitate, disable, or even kill soldiers simply by releasing a spray or gas into the battlefield. While the use of these weapons had decreased in the Second World War due to treaties, the Nazis had continued developing the deadly tools of war, and the United States wanted to understand them and how to stop them. The government obtained the formulas for a trio of nerve gases developed by the Nazis, deadly chemical agents that could interrupt the flow of signals between the brain and the body. These could have long-term debilitating effects and were more dangerous than many other chemical weapons, which were primarily irritants or caused respiratory distress. The gases, named Taboon, Soman, and the soon-to-be notorious Sarin, all had the potential to be fatal. At the Edgewood Chemical Biological Center, at the Aberdeen Proving Ground, the government started doing tests on the gases and how to prevent and treat their effects. But there would soon be a shocking twist to these early tests. It was only 1948 when the government first started involving human test subjects in their experiments. While it doesn't seem any test subjects were exposed deliberately to these deadly gases, technicians were exposed to trace amounts, and the government learned a lot from these accidents. While the amounts the employees were exposed to wasn't enough to be fatal, it was more than enough to cause psychological distress, and that gave the government a potentially risky idea. What if the weapons could be refined into something less deadly, but still powerful? Luther Wilson Green, the technical director of a specialized division at Edgewood, published a classified report in 1949 about the possibility of psychochemical weapons. Based partially on the experiments that showed the psychoactive effects of the nerve gases in small doses, Green argued that this weapon could change war forever. What if instead of creating deadlier weapons that would leave carnage in their wake, the US developed chemical weapons that could cause mental incapacitation and end battles without a shot being fired? It wouldn't be long before the experiments took on new importance. Harvard anesthesiologist Henry K. Beecher was soon recruited to work on experiments at Camp King in Germany, working with many illegal drugs that could earn someone a hefty prison sentence for civilian use. Could LSD and mescaline have military implications? The government also interviewed former Nazi physicians to learn everything they could about these tools, and many in the military brass thought that these weapons could actually be more humane than bombs and other traditional weapons. But to find out, the government needed test subjects. It was 1948 when the government first authorized what would be known as the Edgewood Arsenal Human Experiments, a series of tests of chemical substances on human volunteers at their Aberdeen facilities. In total, they would experiment on around 8,000 people over close to three decades and test over 250 chemicals. Most would be mid-spectrum incapacitants, or drugs that cause a mental effect without much in the way of long-term physical consequences. For airborne gases, the government would use a wind tunnel to deliver the compound in a way similar to how it would be blown by the wind on the battlefield. Now the government just needed to get volunteers. While the use of human subjects in experiments on potential chemical weapons was controversial, the government tried to stay above board with how they conducted it. No enlisted men were ordered by their commanding officers to be parts of these experiments. Instead, the government conducted a series of recruitments at army installations. The soldiers would be shown a short film and given some handouts to explain the experiment, and those who showed interest were given a medical and psychological screening. 
The Army wanted men who were healthy and able to withstand the effects of the compounds, but they also needed to be in the right frame of mind and know their limits. Men who were too enthusiastic and wanted to see how much they could handle were usually rejected, but those with an interest in science were prime recruits. It was surprisingly easy to get the men they needed. By the time the military had gone through 10 Army bases, they would often be given 4 to 600 applications. They would be winnowed down to no more than 100, and these soldiers would be brought to Edgewood, where they would serve one to two months as a test subject. There were perks for volunteering, a small allowance, free weekends, and only light duty while volunteering. But it still wasn't for the faint of heart, because these test subjects would be spending some very unpleasant hours being exposed to substances that could cause chaos in large amounts. So what substances were tested? The government was particularly interested in the effects of popular drugs and if they could be weaponized. LSD, a psychoactive drug notorious for causing intense hallucinations and altered thoughts, was thought to be a potential way to send an opposing army into a panic. THC, one of the key components in marijuana, had no known lethal dose and was seen as a possible tool for slowing down enemy soldiers and reducing their aggression levels. The same goes for benzodiazepines, which lower brain activity and are commonly used to treat anxiety and insomnia. Making an entire army fall asleep would certainly be an effective tool in a war. But there was one drug that was considered of particular interest. BZ, also known as triquinylclidinol benzylate, is an odorless and stable powder that can survive a lot, even being spread by hot munitions. It can dissolve in most subjects and has powerful effects, including a state of delirium. Subjects exposed became confused, started to hallucinate, and found it challenging to perform even basic tasks. It could also cause some uncomfortable and distracting physical effects, including temporary blindness, a high heart rate, overheating, dry mouth, and skin disorders. But can it kill? Unlike many other chemical weapons, it has a very high lethal dose, with people needing to ingest around 450 milligrams to die from it. Although testing is inconclusive, this makes it very different from other powerful chemical weapons which could wipe out an army or kill a scientist with a minor spill. BZ had the potential to change the face of warfare letting armies win battles by rendering the opposite side mad as a hatter, red as a beet, dry as a bone, and blind as a bat, as a famous mnemonic put it. But this wasn't a drug invented for combat. BZ had actually been developed by a Swiss pharmaceutical company as an attempt to treat gastrointestinal ailments and ulcers, but it was repeatedly ruled out due to its severe host of non-lethal but highly unpleasant side effects. While it was quickly dropped as a drug, it was soon picked up by the US military for potential weaponization was extensively tested on the Edgewood subjects. It even became the first chemical authorized for military use and was weaponized to be released by cluster bombs. But these plans would never be realized as the bombs were destroyed in 1989 when the government downsized the program. But BZ wouldn't be the only substance that the government would test on the Edgewood volunteers. Not all documents relating to the experiments are public, but the government did keep a detailed list of the time the volunteers spent on different subjects. Almost a third of volunteer hours were spent on incapacitating compounds but another 14% were spent on riot control techniques. This likely became much more prominent in the 1960s as protests swept the nation. Sometimes typical crowd control methods didn't work, but the government didn't want to resort to lethal force. They needed to find compounds like pepper spray and tear gas that were non-lethal in most cases but can cause pain and discomfort, and usually send large groups running for cover and a place to wash their eyes out. Not all experiments involved direct exposure to chemicals. Sometimes the goal was to see how to avoid exposure. Some volunteers tried out new protective equipment and clothing. Others were subject to sleep deprivation to determine how well they could function under different circumstances. Some of these tests may have been combined, as the government was likely interested to see how the presence of drugs like BZ could impact mental performance on tests. The government even tested alcohol and caffeine's effects on soldiers. But for 14.5% of the hours at Edgewood, the tests took on a darker note. The roster is simply listed as lethal compounds, but it's believed that this involved some of the deadliest weapons ever created for war. This includes some of the deadly nerve agents like sarin that created the project, as well as the notorious mustard gas that burned the soldiers of the First World War. Industrial strength pesticides were also tested, but the US had no apparent intention of reintroducing any of them to the battlefield. So why did they introduce them in testing? Many of the tests involved nerve agent antidotes and reactivators, indicating that the US Army may have been trying to figure out how to best prepare for these substances if they were introduced in combat by an enemy. By testing them in small amounts and seeing how to bring soldiers back from the brink if they were poisoned, the government could equip its soldiers to survive a sudden chemical attack. But the government's secret testing ground would eventually come to an end. 
It was the 1970s when the government began investigating the program after more reports of long-term side effects of exposure began to surface. In 1975, the program was terminated and all the current volunteers were removed. The founder of the program, Dr. Van Murray Sim, had the run of the place for decades, but soon he had been hauled before Congress to testify before lawmakers, enraged that the government had been experimenting on soldiers. The army defended themselves, claiming that there were no serious injuries or deaths associated with the program. However, top brass did admit that their recruitment process may have taken advantage of the soldiers. But future investigations of the program's documents would tell a different story. Once all the documents were unsealed, the government took action to help the soldiers who had been exposed. Many had not even been told what substance they were being exposed to during the tests, simply being placed in a wind tunnel as a substance was blown toward them. It would have been difficult, if not impossible, for them to address any side effects they had from the chemical agents in the years after their testing. But for the first time, they had information and could seek help. While most of the tests were of irritant agents only, without side effects, the percentage who had been exposed to nerve agents or other lethal compounds were given extra attention. But for some, it might have been too late. The government would continue to investigate the experiments through 2004 and uncover the classified secrets. In the 1993 report, it was authorized to grant restitution to the families of test subjects who may have died of causes related to the experiments. But while over 7,000 test subjects were identified, the full number may never be known. And with decades passed since the tests, there's no way to investigate those who had died since for links to the experiments. But debates continue over the program's legacy. In the 90s, lawsuits were filed over the program by veterans' rights organizations, but they were initially dismissed. In 2013, a judge ordered the government to provide to test subjects with all information related to their well-being, but denied other claims of liability against the government. Psychiatrist Colonel James Ketchup, who worked with many of the subjects, denied most of the claims against the government saying that any who died during the test periods likely died of unrelated causes. Ketchum claimed that Edgewood was probably the safest military location in the world to spend two months. But for the soldiers staring into the wind tunnel as the unknown and potentially deadly came toward them, they might have had a different perspective. The villain stares up at the plans for the powerful weapon. This is no ordinary gun or rocket. When complete, it'll harness the power of the sun itself and rain fire and death down on his enemies. A mad scientist looking for revenge on a superhero? No, the villain was Nazi leader Adolf Hitler, and this weapon and many others were really built or planned by his scientists. What was the Wunderwaffe? The secret German program of wonder weapons? It was 1942 and the Nazi war machine was flagging. The United States had entered the war. The United Kingdom was stubbornly refusing to fall, and Hitler had the brilliant idea of invading Russia, which meant the German army now had to fight a war on two fronts. The morale of the military was fading. Hitler was devoting more and more resources toward targeting German citizens, and even many of his own generals were starting to whisper. Was the Fuhrer losing his marbles? Did Germany need a change in leadership? Naturally, that meant there was only one thing to do – turn up the propaganda. Led by Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda ministry started putting out news that would help turn the tide of the war. Because Germany's scientists were on the case and they were designing a whole new crop of Wunderwaffe, or wonder weapons, that the world had never seen before. These weapons, straight out of science fiction in some cases, were said to pack a power the world has never seen. Three years before the first atomic bombs were perfected, these secret weapons were said to turn the tide of any war and send the enemy running. So, was there any truth to these announcements? As usual, the answer is yes and no. The Germans did in fact have a top secret weapons program and it was led by some of the world's best scientists. Men like Werner von Braun, the aerospace engineer who was later taken out of Germany by the United States and became one of the heads of the space program, regularly presented Hitler with blueprints for wildly ambitious weapons. The only thing standing between Germany and unleashing these beasts on the battlefield was a lack of time and money, and Hitler was more than willing to give both of these to the Wunderwaffe program. And the results were impressive, at least on paper. The Wunderwaffe program went for quantity over quality in many cases, and they delivered designs and prototypes for countless new weapons. Some delivered the foundation of future weapons and innovations that swept the world. Others were created but didn't live up to the initial hype. Still others were designed on paper, but the German army ran out of time before they became a reality, and yet others turned into complete and total disasters that we still marvel at today. Let's crack open the secret files of the Wunderwaffe and see which of these
these innovations succeeded and which terrified even Hitler. Germany had an impressive navy, but they were far behind the Allied powers in one area, aircraft carriers. Hitler wanted to expand Germany's naval power far beyond Europe, and to do that, they needed much more capacity. So they commissioned the Graf Zeppelin, a massive carrier that could have carried over 40 fighter planes and dive bombers. And it was one of the earliest Wunderwaffe projects, beginning construction in 1936, and it was still under construction in 1945. With Germany's defeat imminent, the ship was deliberately sunk to avoid it falling into enemy hands. It was later salvaged and used for weapons tests by the Soviets, a far cry from the powerhouse it was intended to be. But it wasn't the most impressive aircraft carrier in the Nazis' plans. The German ocean liner Europa was an impressive ship, one of the largest of the era. After losing a key battleship in 1941, the German Navy needed an aircraft carrier they could use quickly. So they came up with the idea, why not turn the cruise ship into a carrier? The largest of the vessels was chosen for conversion, the Europa was redesigned to the German aircraft carrier 1, and big plans were developed to convert it. And that's all they became, plans. Soon after the process began, it became clear there were serious structural weaknesses and the ship wasn't meant to carry airplanes. It wound up carrying troops after it was seized by the United States. If there was one thing the Wunderwaffe program loved, it was large ships. It was called Plan Z, the plan to expand and enhance the German Navy starting in 1939. The plans were always ambitious, but never quite panned out, and that included the H-Class battleships. Never heard of the H-Class battleships? That's because they were designed to be by far the largest the German Navy had ever seen, with six ships loaded with massive guns and reinforced deck armor. Ironically, what spelled their end was the very thing they were designed for, World War II. The Navy's focus went to retrofitting existing ships and the H-Class battleships faded off into the seas of fantasy. But one section of the German Navy got much more attention. The U-boat was the terror of the seas, as the German submarines sank countless Allied ships, but Hitler wanted them to be faster, stronger, and deadlier. Countless new models were proposed starting with the rocket U-boat. Most U-boats used standard torpedoes, but these blueprints intended to replace that with higher-powered rockets and missiles. This would allow the Germans to not only sink enemy ships more effectively, but potentially launch attacks on Britain and even the United States from the sea. The first tests were promising, but the lack of a guidance system made them ineffective. Ultimately, the rocket U-boat wasn't ready for combat by the time the war ended, but the scientists continued to refine them for other countries. There was a constant quest to upgrade the U-boat, and some got closer than others. The biggest challenge of using submarines in combat was that they weren't meant to stay underwater at length. They had to coast along the surface and could only submerge for short periods at a time. The Type 21 submarines aimed to change that, being the first ships to operate primarily underwater and only need to resurface for charging. The prototypes worked and they were put into production in a hurry. Over a hundred were were completed and two were put into service, but at that point the sea war of the European front was all but over. Neither ship saw combat, but the design was impressive enough that both the US and USSR built on it in the future. But the designs that were meant for the surface were no less ambitious or strange. The Kugelblitz might sound like a falling rain of noodle puddings, but the World War II reality was much different. A planned anti-aircraft weapon, it was a self-propelled gun that would be attached to tanks and had the ability to shoot down enemy planes from the ground. It was the first model to have an enclosed rotating turret that would give it far greater maneuverability. The plans were approved to move it to the prototype phase, but that's where the project concluded as the war ended and only a few test vehicles had been completed. The only surviving turret stands on display at a German army museum. But to take down tanks, the German army would need some bigger guns. Literally. A rare example of a Wunderwaffe weapon that actually saw combat, the Sturer Emil anti-tank gun was an impressive beast. A lengthy run mounted on the hull of an armored tank, it could carry 15 rounds and move enough to aim effectively. The tank design was adjusted from standard heavy tanks to balance the huge barrel, and two models were completed and sent into the field. Named after Max and Moritz, a pair of German storybook characters, they both fell in combat, with Max being destroyed and Moritz being captured by the Soviets and placed on display in the Kubinka tank museum. And to carry a heavy gun, you need a heavy tank. The German heavy tank programs cranked out powerful weapons, but they wanted to go bigger. The largest tank at the time, the Panzer VII Maus, was under 200 tons. However, the planned land cruiser Rata was going to weigh a whopping 1,000 tons. Its armor would be almost 10 inches thick and covered with anti-aircraft guns along with a gun turret harvested from a battleship. Hitler was impressed with the wild ambition of the project and greenlit it, always being a fan of showy weapons. However, Minister of Armaments Albert Albert Speer saw it for what it was, a massive money pit, and canceled the project in 1943 before it was built. Other tanks were less ambitious, but no more effective. 
Although the Land Cruiser Rata was never completed, its smaller cousin, the famous Panzer VIII Mouse, was. The behemoth of a tank still holds the record for the heaviest fully enclosed armored vehicle ever created. Over 30 feet long and almost 12 feet high, weighing in at just under 200 metric tons, it's armed with a powerful anti-tank gun. The problem was, at that size and weight, it took a lot of power to run. It could reach a top speed of up to 14 miles per hour, but it was too heavy to even cross most bridges. The tank had to ford the river using a snorkel. It was designed for power and spectacle, not maneuverability, which no doubt led to its eventual capture by the Soviet forces. But it wasn't the most bizarre tank in the Nazis' plans. You've probably seen a tumbleweed rolling down the plains. What if that tumbleweed was made of metal instead? The Nazis designed a bizarre rolling tank known as the Kugelpanzer as part of the Wunderwaffe program, but the incomplete model recovered from the field left more questions than it answered. It didn't have any weapons attached and it seemed to be more of a mobile bunker than a tank. While it didn't seem to have much combat use, it certainly became a star exhibit in the Kubinka Tank Museum. And their plans for the air were no less ambitious. Military gliders were one of the most important parts of warfare, getting troops and supplies to where they were needed most. The Junkers Ju-332 Mammut was the largest glider the Germans tried to build. And there was a hitch to the plan. It was supposed to be built out of non-strategic material to aid the war effort, so the German Luftwaffe tried to build the entire thing out of wood. It was planned to carry up to 4,400 pounds of cargo. Early tests showed the vehicle was incredibly unstable. It landed well before its planned destination and had to be towed back, its eventual fate being cut up for fuel. One area of the German weapons program got more attention than any other. It was a constant frustration for Hitler. For all the German army's strength, he was sorely lacking in air power. Germany hadn't been involved in long-range wars before the last few decades, and their air force was dwarfed by those of the United States and Japan. They were engaged in aerial combat against Great Britain, but their planes weren't capable of striking further off targets or getting involved in the Pacific Theater. The Wunderwaffe program was designed to change that, and their program had an in-your-face name, America Bomber. Doesn't leave much doubt what this thing was intended to do, does it? Germany wanted a long-range bomber that would be capable of delivering a Pearl Harbor-like attack against the East Coast American cities, especially New York, which Hitler fantasized about destroying. The German Air Ministry gathered several of the country's best aircraft designers to submit their own candidates for the plane that could deliver a shocking punch to the U.S. on their home front. The results were mixed. Ultimately, two designs stood out from the crowd and were destined for production. The first, the Messerschmitt Me-264, was a long-range strategic bomber for the Luftwaffe. It was an all metal heavy bomber similar in design to the B-52 and had relatively little in the way of armor and guns so it could carry more bombs. Three prototypes were built and overall impressed the brass, but Messerschmitt was already under a lot of demand for their fighter planes and so the project was abandoned and the competitor was chosen. And that competitor packed its own impressive payload. Junkers might have had a flop with its massive wooden glider, but their other models were anything but. The Junkers Ju-390 was the model ultimately chosen for the America Bomber project for one main reason. It could be adapted from some of their existing planes. Extra inner wing segments were added to the classic Junkers Ju-90 and 290 models, and they quickly went into testing. But how successful they were is a subject of ongoing debate. Some say the test plane made secret flights to South Africa, Japan, and even New York, but there is no concrete proof of this. What's clear is that work on them continued into 1944 until their contracts were canceled, and the planes were eventually stripped for parts and destroyed. But the Nazis might have been more interested in one specific device. The future of Warcraft was rockets powerful devices that could provide fast launches from the ground and deliver massive payloads, or even take a man to the moon one day. Werner von Braun was known as the master of rockets, and many of his innovations were rocket-powered. Hundreds of designs were built for jet fighters, rocket-powered planes, bombers, ramming interceptors, and tactical bombers, but the jet fuel needed to power rockets was expensive, and the technology was new, and most of the Nazi rocket projects wound up as little more than expensive proof-of-concept displays for von Braun's future career. Although Hitler liked rockets, one thing's for sure, he liked heavy artillery more, and the Wunderwaffe program was happy to deliver. Why launch a hundred mortars when you can launch one with ten times the power? That was what Karl Gerat tried to answer. The massive siege mortar fired the largest self-propelled ammunition ever deployed, and six of the massive guns were built. The destination? The Eastern Front, where Russia had a massive terrain and manpower advantage over the invading Germans. The gun was even powerful enough to destroy bridges when deployed, but they were slow-moving and expensive to build. They delivered a powerful punch, but ultimately all but one were destroyed, and the remainder found its final destination at, you guessed it, the Kobinka Tank Museum. 
But bigger isn't always better. The Schwerer Gustav was one of the most impressive guns ever built, weighing in almost 1,500 short tons and able to fire shells close to 30 miles. It was less a gun than a massive tank-like railway weapon that turned out to be the largest gun ever fired in combat. The problem is, massive guns don't just wind up where you'd like them to be without help. Getting the Schwerer Gustav to where it was supposed to be took a lot of time and manpower, which gave the enemy a lot of time to surround the German position and attack. It was a powerful weapon, but not a practical one, and was eventually destroyed to keep it from falling into enemy hands. But there was one gun that would have been even more powerful. Many of the Wunderwaffe projects never left the drawing board due to a lack of money or time, and that was the case for the Land Cruiser P-1500 Monster, a super heavy self-propelled gun that would have roamed the battlefield on a pair of treads, weighing around 1500 tons, it would allow a massive gun like the Gustav to travel without being assembled by a team of soldiers. The problem was, well, Nazis' tank development wasn't exactly going well. Vehicles like the Maus turned out to be a disaster, so rolling a giant gun around on two of those wasn't likely to go smoothly. It would also be an inviting target for air attacks. The monster was cancelled before it even got off the ground, and little documentation of it exists. Some Wunderwaffe projects were a little more practical. It was the early days of air warfare, and planes were expensive to make, so why not make them harder to shoot down. That was the goal of the Jagdfaust, an experimental anti-bomber rifle that would be equipped for German rocket planes. The Comet, the Luftwaffe's fastest plane, moved so fast that it made typical cannon rounds much harder, making accuracy a real problem for its pilots. The Jagdfaust eliminated that problem by eliminating the recoil and allowing it to be fired much faster. And unlike many German engineering projects, it worked. The gun got its first kill in April 1945, too little, too late, as the war came to an end. The only thing more valuable than a new weapon was preserving existing ones. Losing expensive hardware was a common problem, especially when it was tanks, which the Nazis were constantly trying to upgrade. The massive weapons were especially vulnerable at night when they could be ambushed from the dark, which was why the German optics company Carl Zeiss AG developed a surprising project for the military in 1941. The FG-1250 was one of the first night vision devices ever built, working through infrared and designed to be mounted on tanks. It was one of the more effective devices, maybe proving that larger isn't always better. For many weapons, the key wasn't going bigger but smarter. It was the precursor in many ways to modern drone warfare, a weapon that wouldn't need to be aimed directly at the target but could be guided to it. The Fritz X was a powerful bomb designed to take out heavily armed targets, but what made it unique was that it was the first precision-guided weapon ever used in combat. The bomb would be guided by a radio-controlled link that affected movable parts in the tail fins and was intended to sink ships. It successfully achieved that goal in 1943, but it wouldn't be long before the Allies developed countermeasures that could interfere with the delicate radio link. Some Wunderwaffe projects, though, were distinctly closer to science fiction. It was 1929 when German physicist Hermann Oberth came up with a mad proposal, a massive space station that would use a concave mirror to concentrate sunlight and refract it back at a specific point of the Earth with devastating results. Germany was not at war at this point, so maybe he just wanted to be a supervillain. But during the Second World War, German scientists began to build on the concept. They wanted to design a massive sun gun that would generate an immense amount of energy, enough to destroy a city with a single blast. The only problem was Germany didn't have a space program. No one did. When asked how long it would take to build their sun gun, they estimated between 50 and 100 years, which, when you consider Hitler's plans for a thousand-year Reich, might have been reasonable. But how bizarre were the projects of the Wunderwaffe truly? What was Die Glocke? The mysterious bell-shaped superweapon was one of the most mysterious supposed projects of the Wunderwaffe. It was exposed by Polish journalist Igor Witkowski in the year 2000, as he claimed he had uncovered a secret device that never saw the light of day. Some claimed the glowing contraption was an anti-gravity device, with some even saying it could be related to time travel. But in reality, all evidence is that Die Glocke was nothing. There's no evidence that Witkowski was exposing a true project instead of creating a clever tale. Other devices never got close to reality. The Wunderwaffe teams repeatedly came back to the idea of a directed energy weapon. Who wouldn't like a gun that never ran out of ammo, just needing to be recharged? That technology for Star Trek phasers wasn't there yet, but that didn't stop them from trying. The first attempt was a sonic cannon that could kill via high-intensity vibrations. It worked, but was too expensive and vulnerable to enemy fire to become a mainstay of combat. Undeterred, Hitler's mad scientists explored X-ray beams that could take down aircraft, but the electron accelerator they built 
as a test was eventually captured by the Americans. But one question has puzzled people for decades. How close did the Wunderwaffe get to the ultimate weapon? Nuclear fission was discovered in 1938, and only four months later Hitler already had scientists working on a short-lived nuclear bomb project. While it was shut down shortly before the Nazi invasion of Poland, a new project would soon begin as the Nazis started producing nuclear reactors, uranium, and heavy water in earnest. The project continued to be funded until the very end of the war, but contrary to popular belief, it was not a tight race for which side got to the finish line first. While the Manhattan Project was full steam ahead, the German nuclear bomb project was understaffed, and many of the scientists left to pursue more short-term war projects. It didn't help that many of Germany's top scientists had fled the Nazi regime. In the end, the Nazi nuclear bomb project met the fate of many other superweapons, being harvested for parts by the Allies as they took over after the war. So what went wrong with the Wunderwaffe? Why did a project that created so many fantastical weapons ultimately deliver so many duds and completely fail to help the country win the war? For one thing, the scientists involved had to split their focus between so many projects that few got the opportunity to develop and be refined. Many were scrapped after one failed test. Torn between Hitler's mad ambition and Albert Speer's penny-pinching, the scientists were often between a rock and a hard place. While many did change the future of warfare, few were around long enough to deliver in combat, and those that were were often rolled out right before the close of the war. But one place is no doubt thankful for the Wunderwaffe, the Kubinka Tank Museum, which thanks them for many of their top exhibits. We don't know what it looks like, how fast it is, what it can do, or even who built it. But we do know one thing for sure. The US Air Force has secretly built and flown a new fighter jet shocking the world and setting records in the process. The world's superpowers are currently embroiled in a heated race for total air dominance. Fighter jets have use around the world today like the US's F-22 and F-35, China's J-20, and Russia's Su-57 are currently the top of the line in fighter jet technology. But these fifth-gen fighter jets are aging rapidly, and the race is on to be the first to develop a brand new, state-of-the-art, sixth-generation fighter jet and be the country to claim the top spot in air supremacy. With this recent announcement, has the US secretly won the race and achieved dominance in the skies? On September 15, 2020, Dr. Will Roper, the head of acquisition for the US Air Force, shocked the world when he made a startling announcement during a video presentation at the Air Force Association's Virtual Air, Space, and Cyber Conference. Roper revealed to a stunned audience that the Air Force's Next Generation Air Dominance, or NGAD program, has successfully designed, tested, and even flown a brand new fighter jet. NGAT has come so far, he said, that the full-scale flight demonstrator has already flown in the physical world. It's broken a lot of records in the doing. Most shockingly of all, the entire process from design to test flight was completed in just one year. Despite making the shocking announcement and confirming the existence of a new fully functioning fighter jet, Roper declined to provide any details whatsoever about the craft, leaving the public in suspense and keeping the specifics of the craft a mystery. This isn't totally surprising, as the Air Force doesn't want to give away its secrets to other nations, but it hasn't stopped the world from speculating about what this new jet looks like and what it's capable of. Since this new plane is widely considered to be the US's first sixth-generation fighter jet, experts have guessed that it was largely designed to kill other fifth-generation fighter jets in air-to-air -air combat. Since we don't yet have any details about the new plane's specs and capabilities, we have to look to its predecessor for clues. The F-35 is the US Air Force's current state-of-the-art multi-role fighter jet with some truly impressive features, and it was designed by aerospace giant Lockheed Martin in 2006. The jet, which is 51 feet long with a 35-foot wingspan, is capable of reaching Mach 1.5 speeds, just about 1,200 miles per hour. It can withstand 9G forces and has a maximum ceiling of over 50,000 feet. Its powerful engine produces 43,000 pounds of thrust, and it can carry 18,000 pounds of payload, all while employing the latest in stealth technology. The jet is manned by a single crew member and was designed to provide the pilot with unsurpassed situational awareness through an impressive advanced sensor package. The craft gathers, fuses, and distributes more info than any other fighter jet in history, until now at least, and it feeds this information directly to the pilot via a helmet-mounted display system, giving operators a distinct advantage over adversaries. Given what we know about the F-35's advanced features and the fact that this new 6th gen fighter will aim to go head-to-head -head with the F-35 and its cohorts, we can expect all of this and more from the new secret fighter jet. Improvements might include even more advanced stealth technology to reduce radar detection, 
further improvements to data collection and analysis, and even potentially the capability for unmanned flight given the recent rise in the popularity of drones for military applications. We'll have to wait for more information from the Air Force to know for sure what this new jet will be capable of, but it's likely to be quite impressive. One thing is pretty certain, the new plane might not even be a traditional fighter at all, with zero capability to dogfight. Currently, the US has a pressing need for aircraft that can operate deep in the Pacific in a potential fight against China, with US carriers at risk from China's sizable ballistic missile forces. A 6th gen fighter may have more in common with the iconic B-2 stealth bomber than what we typically think of as a fighter. The size of the aircraft would be pushing the capability of carrier-based launch systems, and a wide, flat delta wing body would allow it to carry large amounts of fuel and thus keep vulnerable carriers far from Chinese shores. In order to maximize stealth, a 6th generation fighter will almost certainly not have a tail, making dogfight maneuvers impossible. Instead, the craft will likely operate as a missile tug of sorts, firing on targets from extreme distance. Even more likely, the new fighter will instead leave the fighting to swarms of unmanned drones that it controls remotely, leaving the human pilot hundreds of miles out of the fight. As far as what this new fighter jet looks like, Roper was also mum about the details. But some astute observers suspect that the Air Force has given us hints about what to expect from this new craft. Just days after Roper's shocking announcement, the Air Force released a graphic celebrating the 73rd anniversary of the service, which prominently featured images of an as-yet-unseen aircraft, prompting many to suspect that this is a subtle nod to the new secret fighter jet. If it's true, the new jet is a departure from plans we've seen from companies like Lockheed Martin and Boeing for their version of a 6th gen fighter. The graphic features a plane with a unique triangular shape from nose to tail with no obvious tail planes, which could mean the craft is based on the flying wing design which aims to reduce radar detectability. The plane in the graphic also features two engines located near the dorsal fin and a cockpit which points to a craft that can at least be optionally manned if it does indeed have remote capabilities. Of course, the aircraft in the anniversary graphic could be entirely fictional, but it does look eerily similar to a mysterious craft that was photographed in flight over the US in 2014. Only time will tell exactly what the new craft will really look like, but we might be in for an entirely new futuristic design. Roper even refused to disclose which company built this new fighter jet. In recent decades, the US fighter jets have been exclusively designed and built by aerospace giants like Lockheed Martin and Boeing. But Roper did allude to the fact that the field might be opening up to new competitors. This is thanks in large part to advancements in digital technology that has helped shorten the development timeline for advanced fighter jets and will revolutionize the aerospace industry. Roper sees these technological advancements as a return to the good old days of aircraft assembly in the 70s. This may seem like a bit of an oxymoron, but what he means is that decades ago it wasn't uncommon to have dozens of bidders on military contracts, whereas more recently we typically see the same two or three companies bidding time after time. With today's advances in technology, firms no longer need to have huge state-of-the-art facilities and unlimited budgets to compete in this space. Now smaller companies with simpler facilities, advanced technology, and small but impressive teams of engineers and mechanics are back in the game, and Roper sees this return to form as a positive, expecting it to boost innovation as well as slash development costs. In his announcement, Roper pointed out that we haven't seen such rapid development since World War II. The F-35, the US's current leading-edge fifth-generation fighter jet, took more than a decade to get from the initial design to a fully functioning flying prototype. For this new jet, the entire process was completed in just one year. This astonishing feat was made possible thanks to modern technology that's already in use in the automobile industry and even Formula One cars, which allowed designers and engineers to fully build, test, and tweak the plane virtually before ever having to build a single physical piece of the jet. Of course, using computer-aided design technology to design and model new planes is nothing new. It's been the standard first step in any design process for decades. What is new is a concept called digital twinning, which lets designers collect and analyze mountains of data and accurately test a vehicle under real-world conditions in a digital environment. Digital twinning involves equipping a real physical object like a car or a plane with hundreds of tiny sensors and then using technology to build a digital model or a twin that mirrors the real thing. In this case, the F-35 was used as the real-world physical model and sensors on the F-35 fed computers with real-world data that allowed them to modify the plane's design and test its reactions to real-world forces under realistic mission settings. While it might seem strange that the Air Force made this stunning announcement without releasing any details about their newest jet, Roper explains the reasoning behind the decision. They declined to release any details because the project is, of course, highly top secret. 
and the Air Force isn't ready to let their competitors know exactly what they're up against. Instead, the whole point of the announcement was to prove to naysayers that this new digital technology is not only viable, but it is the way of the future. Roper talked about how he's had to withstand months of comments from his colleagues about how this technology, however great it is, could never be used to create full-scale warfighting systems when all he could do was just smile and nod, while knowing full well that his team was in the process of doing just that. My hope is to create greater credibility in the process, at least within my own team, he said during the release. They will know to get smart on this technology because we're going to train on it. We're going to drill on it until it's the way we do business. What can we expect for the future of air dominance? Well, of course, we can look forward to more details about this new fighter jet in the near future. But in the longer term, we can expect this recent announcement to shake up the entire aerospace industry. Thanks to digital advances, the industry will no longer be dominated by two or three giants, and more competition can lead to further innovation in this space. And it's not just fighter jets. Roper expects digital twinning technology to be used for everything from satellites to intercontinental ballistic missiles. With significant reductions in the time and cost required to design, test, and build new craft, we can probably expect many more of these shocking secret announcements in the future. Even though we don't know what it looks like, how fast it is, what it can do, or even who built it, now that we know that the US Air Force has secretly built and flown a new fighter jet in under a year, the world will be watching closely for details for the first sixth generation fighter. It's too soon to say whether this new fighter jet will secure the US's spot as the leader in air combat and help them achieve total air dominance, but it's safe to say that the world of air combat will never be the same again. It's 1966, the height of the Vietnam War, when Lance Corporal Richard Pittman and the rest of his platoon stumble into a living hell. It's an ambush. Nobody could have seen this attack coming, and with no way to plan for it, it's quickly turning from a fight to a massacre. Pittman and his fellow surviving troops are hopelessly pinned down, with no avenue for escape. The radios squawk with desperate requests for reinforcements, but it seems like those prayers are falling on deaf ears. Then something heavy lands in front of the Lance Corporal, dropped by one of his fallen comrades. It's easily over 20 pounds, much heavier than that rifle in his hands that feels like a flimsy cap gun by comparison. Pittman hurls his current firearm to the ground, making a mad dash forward to grab the bulkier weapon, an act that completely shirks his own safety in favor of the remnants of his platoon. He hoists the bulky weapon off the ground with all of his strength and squeezes the trigger. Bullets spew from the barrel at a rate fast enough to send over 500 rounds toward a target in a single minute. As he feels the immense kick of the recoil, sending the weapon stock shuddering back, connecting with his own body, Pittman realizes why the rest of the boys took to calling it the pig. Mere minutes and a hail of bullets later, two of the enemy's machine gun posts had been destroyed single-handedly by Pittman and the pig he was now carrying. No time for celebrations, however, as before long the explosions of mortar fire rock the area around him, and the Lance Corporal is forced to haul all 23 pounds of the weapon in his hands as he makes a break for cover. Nearby, some of his fellow Marines are wounded, and he races over to them only to be met with an oncoming attack of around 40 enemy soldiers charging at their position. Taking up the pig again, Pittman opens fire. The machine gun chews through the belt that feeds bullets into it, raining empty casings as it sprays wave after wave of oncoming attackers. But before long, the pig is running on empty, and Lance Corporal Pittman is forced to drop the heavy weapon. Grabbing a firearm from one of his comrades and clearing the area with a grenade, Lance Corporal Pittman kept up the fight while dragging the wounded troops to a position with better cover. Pittman near single-handedly thwarted an enemy attack that day and was awarded the Medal of Honor for saving the lives of his platoon. But he didn't exactly do it alone. Lance Corporal Pittman had a little helping hand from a weapon that seen plenty of action over the previous 66 years. Nicknamed for its bulky size and appetite for eating up ammunition, this not-so-little piggy has served with almost every branch of the United States military, and to this day, it's still used by the armed forces of multiple countries around the world. Say hello to the M60 machine gun. The M60 may have started to see action when it was first deployed in 1957, but it actually began its life much earlier in the late 1940s, in the wake of the Second World War and a victory for the Allied forces over Nazi Germany. The US Army was looking for ways to incorporate weapons that were similar to certain weapons that the German Army had used during World War II. Many of these offered troops flexibility in how their weapons were used on the battlefield, and it was this that the Allies, especially the US, sought to incorporate into their own new weapons most notably the FG-42 automatic rifle and the MG-42 general-purpose machine gun were two pre-existing German weapons that directly influenced the design of the M60. Although the use of light machine guns on the battlefield hadn't been a recent innovation, 
Having been used since the introduction of the Danish Madsen in the early 1900s, the M60 was intended to be a crew-served weapon. That means that it and other weapon systems like it would be operated by a crew of two or more individual soldiers. Each member of the crew would perform tasks that enabled the weapon itself to run at maximum operational efficiency. In the case of the M60, the crew operating it would consist of three members. First and foremost, there would be the gunner, as you can imagine the person responsible for aiming and firing the weapon. They would also be responsible for carrying the M60 and, depending on their level of stamina, between 200 and 1,000 rounds of ammo. Alongside them would be the assistant gunner, whose job it was to carry spare ammunition and a spare barrel. The M60's barrel could be quickly changed out in the event of a jam or overheating. The assistant would also reload the M60 once it ran empty and spot targets for the gunner. Then thirdly, the remaining member of the crew was to be the ammunition bearer. They would also be responsible for bringing additional ammo of their own, along with a tripod, should the M60 need to be mounted for stability. However, one of the key elements of the M60's design was that it was also intended to be fired accurately from the shoulder, at least at a short range. This was a feature that during the weapon's development was carried over from the pre-existing M1918 Browning Automatic Rifle, or BAR. Given the size, weight, and bulk of the M60, it could also be fitted with an integral bipod, which are two legs at the front of the weapon that can fold under the barrel and, when extended, can bear some of the weight to help stabilize the machine gun. Now, the question you might be pondering is if the US Army had access to existing weapons that their M60 was derived from, why go to all the trouble to manufacture their own version in the first place? Well, it largely came from a requirement all the way from the United States Congress. This gave preference to weapon designs that came from American arms manufacturers, primarily so the US couldn't incur licensing fees for the use of foreign designed and manufactured arms, like the aforementioned MG42. Additionally, Congress also wanted their military to be seen supporting US firms, so the decision to develop and adopt the M60 largely came about due to it being an all-American light machine gun. The M60 was first introduced and deployed in 1957 and incorporated various features of the earlier weapons that inspired its design. Perhaps its most distinctive feature was that it was a belt-fed machine gun that incorporated disintegrating links. Now, don't worry if those words all sound a bit too confusingly technical, we'll explain what we mean. A belt-fed weapon, or one that uses an ammunition belt, is any firearm that's fed ammo cartridges that are strung together. This is typically seen in a lot of rapid-firing automatic weapons, with the ammunition belt either feeding into the weapon freely or packed into a belt container that allows for more portability. The reason this is done, as was the case with the M60, is to minimize the impact that the weight of the ammunition had on the operational efficiency of the weapon. After all, carrying around one of these is hard work especially without the other two members of the crew present. No soldier armed with an M60 wants to be weighed down by the bullets. The belt-fed ammunition of the M60 also allowed the machine gun to have a higher rate of continuous fire without the need to frequently change magazines. The specific ammunition fired by the M60 was the 7.62 by 51 mm NATO cartridge, bullets that were commonly used in larger rifles. These cartridges would be strung together in a belt of what were known as M13 links. This is a designation given to a particular type of ammunition belt, sometimes referred to by the US military as disintegrating links. These were specifically designed to bind 7.62 by 51 mm NATO cartridges together, and so the M60 was designed with this in mind. Whereas some older designs of links were connecting cartridges to each other at the neck, the links holding the M60's ammunition were intended to disintegrate after firing each shot. Well, not literally turn to dust, but come apart in a way that meant there was no excess weight of an empty ammo belt to carry. Each round fed into the M60 would be contained in one of those links. A semicircular loop holds the main body of the cartridge casing, while two small arms connect to similar loops that hold the next round in the belt. As the trigger of an M60 is pulled and the weapon is fired, the cartridge is pushed out of the links as the bolt of the machine gun goes forward. Within the internal mechanism of the M60 is what's known as a feeding pawl, which pulls the belt to the right, bringing the next round into place ready to be fired. Meanwhile, the expended bullet casing is ejected out of the right side of the weapon. Thanks to the design of the disintegrating belt, the now loose link that held the previous round comes apart and is also ejected along with the empty casing. By the time the M60 saw its first ever deployments, the United States was already well into the second year of the Vietnam War. Many of their units were issued M60 machine guns, and these new weapons would often play decisive roles in the fighting. Before long, M60s were mounted on vehicles of every kind. The whole US military arsenal had been kitted out with these shiny belt-fed killing machines. Everything from choppers to tanks, trucks, and even boats 
had an M60 fitted on it. As the light machine gun was used in every conceivable way it could be, M60s were set up on tripods and fortifications to defend areas from attack, while US troops wore belts of its ammunition draped over their shoulders in order to carry the heavy ammo and keep their hands free to use and operate the weapon. Soldiers came to appreciate how well the M60 handled, along with the mechanical simplicity of its design, which made it easy to maintain and repair in case of damage. The newly deployed machine gun saw its widest ever use among the US infantry during the Vietnam War. However, it was far from a game changer for the US, whose forces would ultimately be forced to evacuate from Vietnam in 1973. Despite the effectiveness of the weapon in combat, the M60, along with a lot of other American weapons, wasn't well suited for the tropical climate and the harsh conditions of Vietnam. The Pig, as its nickname partially suggests, was a heavy beast, combined having to carry a combined nearly 30 pounds of weaponry and ammo while in the blistering jungle heat and intense humidity, and you're looking at a back-breaking task for even the toughest soldier. The environment of Vietnam also caused a lot of M60 machine guns to break. The weapon itself being designed to be carried by a single soldier meant that it had to be relatively lightweight, at least when compared to heavier artillery. But this lightweight construction meant the M60 was prone to malfunction, as critical parts like the bolt and the operating rod could wear away with continued use or become damaged in the kind of minor accidents you're likely to see in an active war zone. Jams were not uncommon too, especially when the M60s got dirty, and if spent bullet cartridges or the disintegrating links of the ammunition belt ever failed to eject from the chamber, then soldiers would require extra time to fix it and feed the belt back into their M60, which wasn't exactly the most ideal situation to be in if an enemy soldier was running at you. The M60 also featured a swinging lever that jutted out of its main body, and if this ever snagged the soldier's gear, it could detach the barrel and cause that crucial component to come away. It was for many of these reasons that Marine units didn't initially use the M60, instead preferring to stick to their older bars instead. However, the US Navy SEALs, the renowned Special Operations Force, were known to have a certain fondness for the machine gun. During the Vietnam War, they even utilized their own custom versions of the M60 machine gun, which sported shorter barrels and belts that fed into the weapons from backpacks full of ammunition, allowing for hundreds of rounds worth of uninterrupted fire without the need to reload. These weren't the only variants of the M60 to exist either. One of the first variants that was developed and issued to troops was the M60E1. This differed slightly from the original M60 when it came to placement of the bipod. The two legs could be utilized to stabilize the weapon during continuous fire. On the M60, the bipod was located beneath the barrel, which could provide the necessary support but also ran the risk of getting in the way when the weapon's barrel needed changing. The M60 operator's manual recommended that soldiers perform a barrel change every 10 minutes, and during an engagement, a few seconds where that action is interrupted by the bipod being in the way could have made a crucial difference. So the M60E1's bipod was moved to the gun's gas tube, making these quick changes slightly easier. Later versions included the M60E3, which instead had its bipod mounted on the weapon's receiver, and it came with an ambidextrous safety switch and was overall 5 pounds lighter than previous iterations of the M60. However, this lighter frame and the M60E3's skinnier barrel meant this version was more prone to overheating and breaking. Eventually, while there's still some continued use of them today, the M60 would come to be replaced in the US Army by a pair of newer light machine guns. One of these is the M240 machine gun first introduced in the 1970s. Comparably, this weapon was heavier than its predecessor, however, thanks to its improved design, it was considerably more reliable. The other was the M249 Squad Automatic Weapon, or SAW, which was much lighter. The M249 SAW combined the high rate of fire of weapons like the M60 with the lightweight portability and accuracy of a rifle. However, while most of the US Army and the Marine Corps started using these newer weapons, the M60's day wasn't quite done. The Navy SEALs had embraced the M60 since the Vietnam War, and the weapon's final iteration, the M60E4, saw a lot of usage among their ranks, becoming the most reliable model of the machine gun. This was in part due to the improvements that the M60E4 had over the original, including a selection of long and short barrel options for different ranged encounters. The M60E4 was also much lighter than both the M60 and the newer M240 machine guns, with an overall weight of around 21 pounds. Add that to the fact that the gun's barrels were lined with stellite, which improved the weapon's resistance to overheating and stopped it from wearing out as easily, and it also came with rails for attaching optics, as well as being lighter and smaller than the M240s. It was also reported to work more reliably in salt water, perfect for the SEALs who are known to conduct amphibious operations. 
Given that they're often sent on raiding missions and missions where it's essential for them to travel as light as possible, that makes the M60E4 far better suited for the type of operations the Navy SEALs are deployed on. Although, for the most part, the pig has been put back in the barn by a lot of the US military, surpassed by more improved modern weaponry, the M60 is still seeing some use amongst the Coast Guard, the Navy, and in particular the SEALs, over 60 years after it was first deployed during the Vietnam War. Not bad for a 60-year-old machine gun, right? War. It never changes. Except now it officially has. Right this very moment as you watch this video, yes, you, the viewer, are on the front lines of a new world war. It's an undeclared conflict with no rules, no standing armies, and no clear-cut objectives other than to do as much harm to the other side as possible. Even the identity of the combatants is often murky, as are the sources of the individual attacks. But in many of these operations, you are either an unwitting participant or a victim. Whether you realize it or not, you are on the front lines of the greatest war the world has ever known. The internet has brought us many things and brought the world closer together than ever. The internet economy now makes up a small but significant percentage of the world GDP and generates trillions of dollars in economic activity. Many people spend their entire lives connected, their jobs are online as are their social lives and even their entertainment. In today's interconnected world, the internet is the bedrock of our modern civilization. Yet for all the wonderful things the internet has done for us, it's also created a new region for conflict between nations. This new battle space is murky, and nations can hide their attacks or even disguise them as originating from an innocent third party. Where once war was a pretty clear-cut and straightforward concept, cyber war is ambiguous and full of mystery, and even just understanding who attacked you can be a difficult and confusing affair. The major players in this global cyber war are already known to most of the world. China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran are internationally recognized as being the worst offenders and most cyber belligerent nations in the world. This should come as no surprise, as all of these nations face a real world geopolitical situation where they're mostly isolated internationally with few, if any, friends. China may be a hugely important part of the world economy, but it has no friends on the world stage, save those it has temporarily bought for itself with predatory loans in Africa. Its bullying actions against its neighbors has actually worked against its own self-interests and brought neighbors such as Vietnam closer to the US in a bid to resist Chinese hostility. On the same note, Russia has for a long time isolated itself from the international community. Though Boris Yeltsin requested to join NATO back in 1991, at the time the scars of the Cold War were too fresh within the European community, and Russia's intentions were mistrusted. When Vladimir Putin requested again in 2000 and then made an overture for a unified Europe in 2003, his requests were again dismissed by NATO allies not ready to trust Russia and its intentions. Given the poor record of Russia's democracy, which is today largely a sham, and its belligerent attitude towards its Baltic neighbors, it's hardly surprising that NATO wasn't quite ready to accept an olive branch. Perhaps though, there could have been a relational restart if Russia had joined NATO, although most NATO members are unwilling to take the risk, especially as Russia specifically wanted the US to play a much lesser role in the alliance. Sadly, Russia's, and before that the Soviet Union's past behavior, had painted it as a wolf in sheep's clothing, and NATO members felt more comfortable with the status quo. Presently, Russia is seeking to restore its influence around the world, but specifically in the Baltic states region. For Russia, restoring the Baltic nations to client nation states is a critical security concern as the vast European plain makes an invasion from the west into Russia extremely easy should NATO ever go to war with Russia. On the far east side of the plain, Russia is currently forced to defend a very wide border region against a potential invader. But if it could push its influence westwards, it would be able to stage forces on the narrower western part of the European plain and in turn bottleneck any invaders attempting to attack it. While for most westerners the thought of an invasion of Russia is laughable, we have to consider that Russia throughout the 19th and 20th centuries suffered terribly at the hands of European invaders. From Germany in both world wars to France during the Napoleonic Wars, Russia has for two centuries been a massive victim of European aggression. Thus it's understandable that it wishes to restore a security buffer between itself and NATO. Iran and North Korea both 
share similar goals and interests, namely causing as much economic harm to their international foe, the United States, as possible, through any means necessary. For both nations, though, the use of cyber weapons is similar in strategic thought to the potential use of nuclear weapons. Both nations want to make it clear that they can hurt the United States bad enough to deter an invasion. All of these nations are declared cyber actors against the United States, and have on numerous occasions been discovered as the perpetrators of various attacks against America. This is going to come as a surprise to some of our viewers, but yes, Russia did indeed hack the 2016 election. This is a fact verified by numerous military and federal authorities. Robert Mueller's investigation also confirmed this fact, though it did not find evidence of direct collaboration between the Trump campaign and Russia. Russia interference and possible collaboration between an American presidential campaign are two separate issues, and one of them has been decidedly proven. The Russian attacks against the Democratic Party in the US, as well as the massive disinformation campaign that Russia undertook on social media to support the Republican campaign, all fall directly in line with previous Russian asymmetrical attacks against other NATO countries, though until 2016 it never dared to interfere in American elections. Back in 2004, Putin ordered a new age of Russian foreign policy that included the manipulation of its geopolitical rivals, being hopelessly outgunned by NATO allies, and unable to defeat the West militarily, Putin instead sought to slowly work to dissolve the bonds that held NATO together, as well as to sway national elections toward candidates friendly toward Russian interests, especially in the Baltics. One high-profile example of Russian meddling was its interference in Ukrainian politics between 2010 and 2014. Ukraine had been on a path to NATO membership, but due to the influence of pro-Russian politicians, this was halted and instead Ukraine declared itself a neutral European power. Unfortunately for Putin, his election meddling backfired, and in 2016 Ukraine made joining NATO a national policy goal, and hopes to become a member in the next 25 or so years. Yet this is hardly the only example of election meddling by Russia. In the French 2017 election, Russia had Emmanuel Macron's personal email and released a trove of private emails, while running a digital disinformation campaign aimed at promoting their preferred far-right candidate, Marina Le Pen. In Austria, the far-right Freedom Party gained several important political positions, and immediately after the election, Putin's government and these far-right members struck several key diplomatic agreements. In Germany, Russia launched the same style of digital disinformation campaign that it had used in the US to great success. Though the robustness of the German political system saw this tactic fail, and the results of the election which kept Angela Merkel in power, a fierce opponent of Putin, remained largely unaffected. In the UK though, Russian support for far-right politicians met with what might have been its greatest success. Further digital disinformation campaigns helped fuel the fire that saw the British vote to leave the European Union, a move which will not only weaken Britain, but the Union as well. In every nation attacked, Russia uses the same tactics. It supports far-right politicians and stokes up the flames of national relying on naive patriotism to blind voters to its interference. Nationalistic candidates also further help Russia achieve its goals of dismantling the system of alliances that has kept NATO strong for decades, as nationalistic politicians distrust and dislike international institutions and often engage in protectionist policies that isolate their nation from the world. Another key goal of Russian election interference, however, is to work to sow mistrust and confusion amongst the voters of a democratic system, so as to further weaken the democratic democratic institution themselves. Sadly, Putin has been extremely capable of doing this in his own country, and this explains how he's remained in power for so long. If Putin can make his neighbors mistrust their democracies, though, it will make it easier to bring them back into the Russian fold politically and restore Putin's stated goal of a new Warsaw Pact. If Putin is able to cause the citizens of America, France, Britain, and other nations to also question their own democratic institutions or help elect nationalistic far-right candidates, then he knows these nations will be too internal distracted to oppose him on the world stage, or they simply won't care. So far, his plans have worked like a charm. China, on the other hand, has a much different goal in its constant cyber war against the United States. While China has also attempted to influence American elections, mostly through laundered money given to political super PACs in the US, it's mostly focused on waging a war of industrial and economic espionage against America. China for a long time has had a serious internal problem. While it consumed many of the world's leading technologies, it produced very few technological breakthroughs of its own. This is especially true in the defense sector, where China simply 
it does not produce any significant military technology developments of its own. As one American general put it, China steals a lot of tech but innovates very little of its own. And China does steal a lot of tech. It's widely believed that today China is the single largest actor in the global cyber war and has stolen or attempted to steal more data than any number of other nations combined. American defense companies are very often the targets of Chinese attacks, and to date, China's greatest success was its penetration of the American F-35 program. While it was unable to steal enough data to create a pure competitor aircraft to the F-35, it did manage to steal enough data to leapfrog decades of its own research and development into stealth aircraft, and managed to produce the poor man's version of a modern stealth fighter, the J-31. Skeptics of Chinese theft of F-35 technology need only look at a J-31 and immediately see that the aircraft is almost a carbon copy of the F-35. Recently, China attempted to penetrate the servers of General Dynamics in a bid to steal top-secret US plans for advanced submarine prototypes, but were only successful in stealing restricted but not classified information of no actual value. Targeting the US military, Chinese cyber attacks have also attempted and at times been extremely successful in penetrating American military networks. Other Chinese targets in America include software firms and big aerospace developers such as Boeing and SpaceX, who face almost daily cyber attacks, many originating from China. The US, however, is not completely helpless in these attacks, although it should be noted that for a long time the United States was grossly deficient in its ability to protect its cyber assets. The theft of the F-35 secrets was a huge wake-up call to the American government, and since then it's taken significant steps to protect itself. Yet as one American cyber warfare leader noted on a congressional testimony before the Armed Services Committee, the cyber domain is the only war fighting domain that the US does not have an overwhelming advantage in. Here, the United States is operating on a level playing field and has none of the significant advantages that it enjoys in every other war fighting realm. From time to time, though, the US does flex its cyber muscles, although a variety of factors make it difficult for it to do so. In response to the hack of Sony Pictures by North Korea, who wished to damage the company for releasing the interview, a film that makes fun of Kim Jong-un, the United States warned North Korea by shutting down the internet across the entire nation for 10 hours. While this retaliatory attack was never publicly declared, many cybersecurity experts point out that it was far too much of a coincidence for it to have been an accident. The problem with US capabilities in the cyber domain is not a lack of technical expertise, though. It's a problem with policy. Unlike authoritarian nations such as China and Russia, the cooperation between the US government and the commercial sector in the cyber realm is not as strong. This is due to a general mistrust by the American private sector of government interference, and a strong emphasis on privacy by American culture. In China and Russia, this is not nearly as large a concern, and close cooperation between digital companies and the government is par for the course. American companies, however, are reluctant to share the inner workings of their software with the American government, and this makes it more difficult to cooperate in the case of an attack, or to help predict vulnerabilities to future attacks. In the end, cyber warfare is only going to escalate between nations, especially as these other nations fail to be able to challenge the US militarily or economically. Thanks to the internet, though, they may never need to, and an aggressive cyber warfare campaign can accomplish many of the same deterrent effects that traditional firepower has in the past. The real question, though, is when does a cyber attack step over the line and necessitate a military response. How many hacks of American industrial secrets by the Chinese, or how much interference in American politics by Russia is enough to warrant a physical response? After all, if either of these nations launched even a small physical attack against the US, you can be sure that the American military would respond. For now, the best defense against foreign attacks here in the US and in other nations is to keep yourself informed. Whether you agree to be a part of this war or not, you are officially on the front lines of it, and every time you log into Facebook, or Twitter, or even Instagram, you're part of this fight. Fake news stories are created by the thousands in disinformation campaigns generated by hostile overseas power. So the best way to defend your democracy may be what's always been the best way from looking stupid in public. Fact check everything you read and don't believe anything that happens to sound too perfectly outrageous.